dear guests, please uh, get ready soon. We will be starting the forum in a few minutes. Get seated as soon as you can. We'll be starting the forum in two minutes. Please给我们一些时间，好吗？请大家尽快入座，我们的峰会即将开始。如果你还没有领取同传设备，麻烦你在右后方翻译室旁边领取同传设备，以获得中英文效果。Get seated as soon as you can, please. Please get seated. We will be starting any moment now. Thank you. Thank you. Please get seated. There are some seats over here if anybody needs them. Ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to welcome all of you here for the Forum for World Education. Hello to those who are joining us online as well. My name is Angel Wei, I'm the host today for you, and I'm the young leader at Forum for World Education and founder of SAA Media. And I'm the co-host Helen Chen from HKUST Business School. Good morning. Today we're here to focus on conversations, insights, and possibilities surrounding education in a global scale. Indeed, 
four years ago, we were in Paris, and then a couple years of webinar we had because of COVID. And last year, we gathered together in Thailand. And today, we gather here in this international city of Hong Kong. We travel around the world because we firmly believe that education is an essential tool in our interconnected world. And it's not just about cultivating individual talents and skills, but also about fostering understandings, empathy, and global unity. So we've gathered today here with our leading scholars, educators, policymakers, and innovators from all over the world. Our goal is to listen, learn, collaborate, and push the boundaries of what education can achieve. Today's event is divided into several insightful sessions, starting with the keynote speeches from distinguished leaders in education who will share their unique perspectives on pressing educational issues. First of all, please allow us to welcome the Honorable Warner Chuck, GBS JP Deputy Chief Secretary for Administration of Hong Kong SAR. And please join me to also welcome the Honorable Christine Choi, who is the Secretary of Education of Hong Kong SAR. Thank you for your support at FWE. We would also like to recognize Dr. Chang Davis, co-founder and president of FWE, Ms. Edith Shi, chair, FWE steering committee member, also executive director of CK Hutchison Holdings Limited, Dr. Susan Scafani, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Education, Steering Committee member of FWE, and Ms. Ani Karajian, Senior Portfolio Director, Executive Education at Harvard Business School, also Steering Committee member of FWE. Thank you for all your contributions to FWE. Thank you very much. And we would also like to our thanks to our media partners right there to be here with us today. And we would also like to recognize an important component of FWE, which is our young leaders who are representing our future possibilities. Please stand up and wave to us our future possibilities. Indeed, FWE is more than just a conference. As Dr. Chen always emphasizes to us, he, she considers that education acts as diplomacy, and F, FWE does encourage the understanding of diversity and celebration of the potential of education. And it is also a reaffirmation of our shared commitment to providing quality education for all, regardless of background or circumstances. We understand that education is about more than just textbook and tests. It's about sparkling curiosity, instilling love of learning, and equipping our youth with the tools they need to navigate the complex and dynamic world. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Forum for World Education. Let the conversations, learnings, and innovations begin. Now, please welcome Ms. Edith Shi. Chair, FWE Steering Committee member, for her welcoming remarks. The Honorable Mr. Warner Chuck, GBS JP, Deputy Chief Secretary for Administrations of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Dr. The Honorable Christine Choi JP, Secretary of Education of the HJSAR. The Honorable Mr. Rock Chan, SBS JP, member of the Legislative Council of the HKSAR. Forum for World Education President, Dr. Chang Davis. Esteemed leaders from academia, business, and industry, ladies and gentlemen, it is with tremendous pleasure that I warmly welcome everyone to the Forum for World Education Hong Kong Regional Conference today. 
For those unfamiliar with the Forum for World Education, please allow me to provide a brief introduction. Established in 2018, so we're only five years old, the FWE is a non-profit organization committed to transforming education in response to the ever-changing skills and knowledge demands of our global society. We focus on economic growth, societal progress, and sustainability. As an international platform, FWE fosters in-depth conversations amongst thought leaders and business professionals about the future of education and the workforce, while playing a catalytic role in modernizing education systems to better prepare future generations for a rapidly changing world. Furthermore, FWE serves as a global conduit for young leaders, entrepreneurs, and educators, offering them opportunities to exchange insights and experiences, as well as to interact with distinguished educators and business leaders. This conference not only delivers an invaluable learning experience for our young attendees, but also establishes an unparalleled networking forum for them. The theme of this FWE Hong Kong conference is the transformative power of international education for a better world. Over these two days, we will hear from esteemed speakers and young leaders alike, locally and online, on how education, especially international education, that transcends both physical and intangible barriers is revolutionizing our lives. We will explore groundbreaking developments in technology, such as ChatGPT and various forms of AI that are increasingly influential. Incidentally, these opening remarks are written by a human, myself, reviewed and fine-tuned by ChatGPT, but finally signed off by the human. Earlier this month, when Jeffrey Hinton resigned as vice president from Google, he warned the world as to possible adverse consequences of further accelerating the development of AI which Elon Musk, as well as Steve Wozniak, and other renowned leaders in the technology space agreed. By mastering and controlling these powerful tools, rather than becoming subservient to them, we hope to build a better, more sustainable, and continuously regenerative world for ourselves and future generations to come. Today, we will begin with a keynote message from the Hong Kong SAR government on the theme of the conference. We will then hear from university leaders on how education institutions are fostering a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship to produce marketable talents that meet the needs of our businesses and industries. This, in turn, will help sustain the status of Hong Kong as an international education and financial hub. Following the academic session, business leaders will share their perspectives on how large corporations are adapting to and leveraging educational transformations and emerging AI tools for the betterment of their organization and society as a whole. Then, we will hear from deans of renowned business schools about how their curricula are structured to meet the challenges of the changing global economy and the development of innovative technology. They will also discuss how business schools prepare their students to be effective, ethical, and sustainable amidst diverse multicultural societies. Concurrent with sessions two and three in Wangpua Conference Room One, 
there will be a session in Putonghua on perspectives of business leaders regarding education as a catalyst for economic development. After lunch, and lunch will be served on the ground floor in the promenade as well as the harbour grill, our, our afternoon begins with the keynote address by Dr. The Honourable Christine Choi, our Secretary of Education, who will speak about the tremendous efforts of the HAR government is extending on continuing vocational training for our workforce, as well as life planning education for our students, including partnership with businesses and professional training for teachers. Following the address of the Secretary of Education, in session four, we will hear from educators and industry leaders about their collaboration in identifying specific skill sets and requisite knowledge base in demand in our society today. They will discuss how this collaboration drives innovation and enhances competitiveness of the industry particularly in the face of accelerating AI applications, including through internships and practicum training. Session five showcases exchanges between various young entrepreneurs regarding their views on how their schooling has prepared them as leaders amidst a complex world, but abound with geopolitical tensions, economic disparities, and environmental challenges. We will conclude the day with practical insights from young business leaders on their journey from school to work and how their international education has fostered their development as a positive change-making person, upholding values of inclusivity and diversity. While I won't attempt to cover the proceedings for tomorrow, I must mention that tomorrow morning we will be presented with the findings of the OECD research on global competency. And we expect interesting debates over the global competency gap and much more. And I don't want you to miss it. I hope you will find this two-day conference engaging and thought-provoking inspiring meaningful discussions and collaboration. The conference may provide participants with answers to some of our questions, and yet perhaps generate further questions seeking answers. But isn't that what continuous learning and development is all about, be it academic, vocational, or professional? It is through harnessing the transformations of today that we build a better world for tomorrow. I close with a note of thanks to our speakers, our moderators and panelists for their participation and sharing, to the President Cheng, my Vice Chair Jack, steering committee members, and my team members who worked ever so tirelessly over the past two months nonstop to bring this conference to fruition. And we must not forget our sponsors for their generous support, the hotel team for their facilitation and hard work, and the very last, but definitely not the least, our eloquent, beautiful, and intelligent MCs who will usher us into each session of the conference. Once again, thank you for joining us and we wish you a meaningful and enjoyable time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edith, for your continuous contribution and tremendous support so that we get to have this conference today in Hong Kong. We highly appreciate support like that. Now we're going to welcome our next speaker. I'm going to welcome Ms. Pan Jun. Yes, Ms. Pan is the Vice President and CEO of Fang Zheng Group, also Chairperson of Beijing Royal Ch Charity Foundation and Board Member of FWE. She'll be giving us an opening speech on the keynote remarks. Thank you. Let's give her a round of applause.
，尊敬的卓永兴副司长，尊敬的蔡若莲局长，陈仲尼议员，尊敬的严正主席、伊迪斯女士，以及各位嘉宾、各位媒体朋友们、女士们、先生们，大家上午好。夏朝永湘江，风动紫金乡。很荣幸能与来自世界各地的政界、商界和教育界人士相聚在港岛，共同出席世界教育论坛2023香港峰会，并在国际教育的变革力量、让世界更美好的主题引领下，为变局之下的国际教育重塑与创新。贡献智慧。随着粤港澳大湾区战略持续深入，香港在巩固国际金融中心地位的同时，还在努力成为国际创新科技中心。再加上国际人才的竞争日趋激烈，极具人才智力中心的香港承载了全新的使命。本次峰会选择在香港举办，意义不言而喻。二零二二年九月，联合国教育变革峰会在纽约举行。峰会倡议在日趋日益加剧的全球性危机下，将教育置于全球政治议程的中心，倡导促使教师成为全球教育变革的推动者，提升所有学习者应对未来变革的能力。为全球危机下教育变革以及全球教育治理提供了有价值的参考。面对充满诸多不确定的世界，经济复苏的紧迫需求与就业环境依然严峻的反差，为教育推动经济发展提出了新挑战和新要求。因此 ，FWE 及其倡导的以教育可持续发展。为经济发展服务的理念，在当下显得尤为重要。那刚才伊迪斯女士也介绍了一下 FWE， 那么我也在这边回顾一下 FWE 从成立到现在的历程。那作为一家非盈利性全球组织，世界教育论坛成立在美国，但是却诞生在中国北京。在二零一八年，以严正教授。Paul k e l l 先生、李宁先生和王广发先生为代表的教育家和商业领袖，秉承着对教育的热忱，提出了以汇聚全球商业和教育生态系统中的企业家、政策制定者和研究专家，致力于提供一个世界级开放包容的环境，推动世界对话与合作。促进教育变革与发展的共同愿景，以及打造教育达沃斯的远大目标，世界教育论坛应运而生。从2019年在巴黎 OECD 举办的第一届论坛“教育的未来新起点”，共议未来教育的发展方向，以全球智慧共同探索未来教育发展之路，到2022年在泰国。举办我们如何塑造教育的未来，以适应全球经济形势，亦或是疫情期间持续进行线上论坛二十余场，再到今天香港大会，以国际教育的变革力量让世界更美好。可以说，教育推动经济发展的命题始终贯穿 FWE 历届大会，并不断延续和深化。为了鼓励青年人才成长 ，FWE 也在努力建立一个世界青年领袖平台，为年轻的创业者、学者提供学习、交流和合作的机会，并为社会和经济的发展带来全新动力。呼吁青年实现从教育变革对象向教育变革主体的角色转变，让他们。作为积极推动者，在长期的教育变革中发挥关键作用。下面我以法政集团为例，来分享一下商业和教育的结合的实践。那么，法政集团
，作为教育事业的投资者和国际教育的先行者，坚持以培养具有家国情怀和国际视野的世界公民为目标，以探索教育改革和课程融合为己任，领跑国际教育创新发展。自1996年创立北京王府学校至今，已在中国北京、大连、成都、三亚以及美国的波士顿、New Hampshire 开设了分校及海外的学校二十余所，建立了涵盖从幼儿园、小学、初高中、大学预科、高等教育为一体的完整办学体系，形成及教育教学、课题研究、考试测评。教师培训等全覆盖的闭环生态圈，法政集团始终坚持承担社会责任，发起成立了王府公益基金会，把发展国际理解、促进教育公平、推动性别平等、开展移动学习作为优先发展议题。二零一七年，基金会发起了国内首个以国际理解教育为主旨的公益项目。未来外交官青年领袖项目，培养具有国际视野、通晓国际规则、能够参与国际事务和国际竞争的全球公民，探索以公益化为平台，联合政府、智库、学校、企业，共同推动的创新性国际人才培养模式。希望通过对中国国际理解教育的研究。总结中国实践，分享中国经验，提供中国方案。在积极参与社会化办学过程中，法政集团不断在商业和教育之间探索新路径，实现新突破。既是 FWE 的发起者、实践者，又是创新者。文明因交流而多彩，文明因互鉴而丰富。教育是文明进步和世界和平发展的重要动力。文化有差异，教育无国界。随着时代发展，教育、文化、交流、民间外交日益成为稳定国家关系、传播人民友谊、促进务实合作、开展交流对话的重要渠道和舞台，是构建人类命运共同体的必然要求。在今年四月，马克龙总统成功访华之后，受法国前总理拉法兰先生的邀请，我也特别荣幸出席了今年五月八日在巴黎举行的和平领袖基金年会，出席了在爱丽舍宫举行的总统府招待会。马克龙总统接见了与会代表，并表示，俄乌冲突尚未完结，国际关系持续紧张。在当今复杂的国际形势下，和平显得尤为珍贵。由拉法兰先生创建的和平领袖基金会，旨在为维护全球稳定与世界和平做出贡献。未来将和王府公益基金会携手，通过全球移动和平学校，开展和平教育，传播和平愿景，培养青少年成为和平使者。同时，我也代表 FWE 邀请了拉法兰先生出席今年九月在纽约召开的第四届世界教育论坛。世界之变、时代之变、历史之变，正以前所未有的方式展开。人类社会面临前所未有的挑战。世界影响着教育，教育也改变着世界。我用严正主席。在第一届论坛上的讲话，教育是国家发展的利器，它既可能成为战争的罪魁祸首，也可以成为和平的天使。路虽远，行则将至。最后，我也代表王广发先生感谢严正主席领衔的世界教育论坛，在推动教育变革和可持续发展方面做出的不懈努力。感谢伊迪斯女士和她的团队对本次大会的全力支持，预祝本次峰会取得圆满成功，祝愿香港明天更加美好。谢谢。
Thank you so much, Ms. Panjing. I think we couldn't be here today without all the support that we get to have today from sponsors and supporters and, you know, just like people who are so passionate about education that brought us here today to make this possible. So now we're going to um, go to our next step, which is to appreciate also the support of today's host, our Hong Kong SAR. Now, please, everyone, join me and welcome the Honorable Warner Chuck, the Deputy Chief Secretary for Administrations of Hong Kong SAR. Let's give him a round of applause for his opening speech. Welcome. Ms. Chi, Ms. Pan, Professor Davis, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am delighted to join you today at the Forum for World Education's Regional Conference in Hong Kong. My thanks to the Forum for organizing this seminal two-day gathering, for bringing together educators, business leaders, policymakers, and researchers from all over Asia and indeed around the world, here to exchange ideas, insight, and intelligence on the latest education developments and the promising directions. Education is the very foundation of economic, cultural, and social progress. It is accorded top priority in the Hong Kong SAR government's policy commitments. In the next few minutes, Allow me to tell you about what we are doing in ensuring that education remains the centerpiece of government policies. To start with, education gets the lion's share of our spending, accounting for more than 20% of our recurrent expenditure. In the current 2023 to 24 financial year, we estimate that our education expenditure will exceed Hong Kong 104 billion, or US dollar 13 billion. We promote the parallel development of publicly funded and self-financing post-secondary education. Today, more than 50% of our young people have degree-level education opportunities, and some 80% have access to post-secondary education. We are dedicated to growing Hong Kong as a regional education hub. That means attracting acad academic and research talent from around the world. It helps that Hong Kong is blessed with an East Beast West cultural sensibility. That en engenders a singular learning environment, preparing overseas students to meet fast-changing global challenges especially for those interested in tapping the enormous opportunities available in the Greater China region. Thanks to Hong Kong's English-speaking post-secondary institutions and language environment, international students need minimal time and efforts to immerse in Hong Kong's education system. The cosmopolitan nature of campus and city life cultivates students to acquire an international outlook. At the same time, our enviable Chinese language and cultural environment creates unsurpassed opportunities for students aspiring to build their careers in Greater China, particularly in the Greater Bay Area. Quality is another decisive advantage of our post-secondary education. Hong Kong boasts a multitude of world-class institutions, including 22 degree-awarding bodies. Five of our universities were ranked among the top 100 in the 2023 QS World University Rankings, which makes us unique, not only in the country, but also in Asia. Our business administration programs are also among the best in the world. With three of our executive master of business administration offerings ranked among the world's top 25. Among them, the Kellogg Hong Kong University of Science and Technology EMBA program was actually rated the, the world's best in the Financial Times 2022 EMBA ranking. 
We welcome overseas students to study, conduct academic research, and participate in exchange activities in Hong Kong. In the 2021 to 22 academic year, about 20,400 non-local students from over 100 countries and regions took post-secondary programs here. That same year, about 2,200 exchange students took part in publicly funded post-secondary programs. We are working too to augment our talent pool so as to help seize the enormous opportunities there for us under the national 14th five-year plan and in the Greater Bay Area. In the furtherance of this, we are increasing the number of publicly funded research postgraduate students by almost 30% in the coming two academic years. Together with other measures, that will increase the number of research postgraduate students in our universities by up to 50%. We have also implemented measures to attract outstanding non-local students to pursue the studies in Hong Kong. That includes a Belt and Road Scholarship, encouraging brilliant students from Belt and Road economies to enroll on undergraduate and research postgraduate programs in Hong Kong. Let me add that tuition for non-local research postgraduate students is competitively set at just over Hong Kong 42,000, all about US dollar 5,300, a level heavily subsidized by the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region Government. And our long-standing Hong Kong PhD Fellow Scheme attracts top research postgraduate students from around the world. Each awardee receives a stipend worth more than US dollar 43,000 a year for up to three years. Non-local graduates who wish to stay in Hong Kong and develop their careers can, with minimal requirements, take advantage of our immigration arrangement for non-local graduates. Recently, for example, non-local graduates are free to stay in Hong Kong for two full years without the need to first secure a job. That allows them to look for the career opportunity that is best for them. The point, ladies and gentlemen, is clear and compelling. We very much welcome graduates from all over the world to look to Hong Kong for the future. We are, of course, hardly alone on this front. As the world becomes increasingly interconnected, the demand for international education and global talent will only continue to grow. That said, our chances are unique. It helps that we have the full support of the nation and the immense opportunities opened up by the national 14th five-year plan. The plan looks to Hong Kong to enhance our traditional strengths in finance, trade, and transportation, and as an international legal and dispute resolution services center in the Asia Pacific. It also calls on Hong Kong to develop regional or international hub status in four emerging centers, namely aviation, innovation and technology, intellectual property, and as an East Meets West, culture, uh, East Meets West Center for International Cultural Exchange. We are also playing a pivotal role in the Belt and Road Initiative, as well as in the Greater Bay Area. The, the vast and fast emerging cluster city development integrating nine cities in southern China with Hong Kong and Macau. That has a combined GDP of US 1.89 trillion in 2022, placing it tie eight with Italy in the global league of GDP, just behind France and in front of Canada and South Korea. Alongside this wide-ranging business trade and investment prospects and long-term promises. Our world-class universities and creative industries will help Hong Kong attract international talent. In doing so, we will contribute to the region's and the world's knowledge economy. Of that, I am confident. My thanks again go to the Forum for World Education for organizing its regional conference here in Hong Kong. Please enjoy the forum's sessions and the wisdom of the prominent speakers 
in these next two stimulating days. And I wish you all the best of business and education in the coming year. Lastly, let us all wish for the speedy realization of this forum's powerful theme, the transformative power of international education for a better world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, the Honorable Warner Chuck. And it was a really a great endorsement of Hong Kong being an education hub that will influence not only the region but the world. Exactly. And now we're going to have a special session that is coming up for awards to people who have done tremendous contribution to today's conference. Now I'm going to actually give the mic to Ting Ting, who will moderate this special session for us. Please join us. Thank you, Ting Ting. Okay. 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 Thank you so much, Angel and Helen. Ladies and gentlemen, dear esteemed guests, Today we have the honor of acknowledging three exceptional individuals who have shown their tremendous leadership and commitment during the FWE Hong Kong Conference. I am Ting Ting, a proud FWE staff and also a doctoral student of Teachers College, Columbia University. Now, everyone, please join me to welcome FW President Dr. Chen Davis to join us on the stage to present those awards. Let's welcome. So, here's our first awards. Our first awards goes to Miss Edith Shi. Miss Shi is an excellent organizer of today's Hong Kong FW conference, and she's also the, the founder of Avi Ball of Hong Kong, who is also named as the Queen of Avi League, and she has dedicated her exceptional skills to chair this conference, ensuring everything for its success. We're fortunate indeed to have her leadership at our side. Edis, please join on the stage to get this award. goes to Ms. Rachel Lee. Ms. Lee is FWE young leader who has showed her remarkable dedication and innovation. An accomplished graduate from both Penn and Columbia, Rachel took her talents back to China and built a company. We are genuinely grateful for her presence and contribution to this conference, especially for bringing her friends, Mr. Jing Chen Wang, Congratulations, Richard. Finally, we recognize Mr. Jack Jai, Hong Kong Conference Vice Chair, a respected leader among Peking University alumni in Hong Kong. His unwavering support for Hong Kong Conference has been truly inspirational. Jack, your dedication doesn't go unnoticed. Please come to the stage and receive your well-deserved award. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Ms. Rachel Lee, great contributor to our Hong Kong conference, to give us a speech. Thank you so much for your support, Rachel. I am uh, incredibly grateful for this award, and uh, I want to express my deep appreciation to Mr. Wang Jincheng uh, for his indispensable support. Without him, accepting this award would not have been possible. I, want, I also want to thank Dr. Chen Davis, the visionary behind FWE, for her inspiring leadership. I have known her for so many years, and I'm constantly surprised and inspired by her never-ending passion for education. And uh, we are dedicated 
to supporting FWE to the best of our abilities. And uh, thank you all for this incredible honor. Enjoy Hong Kong. Enjoy China. Well, thank you very much. Actually, we're told to capture this special moment. So can we welcome the prize receivers and also uh, our president for FW to come up to the stage to take a photo, a group photo of the reward receivers and the president. Please, let's give them a round of applause to welcome them up to the stage for these wonderful, great photos. And thank you for your tremendous support to uh, FWE. Let's welcome them again, the president of FWE, Dr. Chen Davis, and Ed Xu, the chair for today's Hong Kong conference, and the vice chair for today's Hong Kong conference, Jack Jai, and the young leader, Rachel Jai. Please let the photographers to document this moment of, uh, of how these people made it possible for us today to have this Forum for World Education to happen in Hong Kong. It cannot exist without their tremendous contribution and passion for today's conference and meeting. So let's give them a round of applause and thank you all for your passion and your vision for education. Helen, did you enjoy the keynote speech at the opening? Very, very exciting. I hope you are also enjoying every moment of it. More to come. Exactly. And then now, let's dive into our actually first panel discussion. Building a talent pipeline. How can Hong Kong's tertiary education provide a sustainable pipeline as Asia's financial and educational hub? This panel will be moderated by the Honorable Rock Chen, SBS JP, member of the Legislative Council of Hong Kong SAR, also chairman of Hong Kong Council for Accreditation of Academic and Vocational Qualifications. Also, let's welcome the panelists, Professor Alan Chen, Provost, and J.S. Lee Professor of Chinese Culture, Chinese University of Hong Kong, Professor Yi Ke Guo, Provost, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Professor Paul Lam Kuan Xing, President of the Hong Kong Metropolitan University, and last but not the least, Professor Bin Xiang, from the founding dean of, and also Professor of China Business and Globalization at the Cheng Kong Graduate School of Business. Let's welcome them all on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for traveling around the world to come here. Let's give them an applause to come up to the stage. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining the first panel discussion, the theme of which is building a talent pipeline. 
Well, the Hong Kong SAR government, as articulated by Deputy Chief Secretary, has always been striving to develop and establish Hong Kong as a regional education hub through the internationalization and diversification of the post-secondary education sector. We aim to nurture talents from multiple industries, as well as attracting top outstanding people from around the world. As you all know, Hong Kong is a knowledge-based economy. And so one of our critical success factors is a constant, continuous supply of talents. Therefore, there's always a strong demand for education and training. Hong Kong also enjoys many competitive advantages to serve the role as a regional education hub. And among them, for example, we have a number of world-class universities and education institutions that enjoy institutional autonomy and a robust quality assurance regime. Today, I'm most privileged to be joined on stage by four distinguished education professionals from the tertiary education sector from both Hong Kong and the mainland. They are amongst the most qualified experts to enlighten on the theme, building a talent pipeline. So without further ado, may I start the sharing session and invite Professor Ellen Chen to start first. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you very much, Rock. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm recovering from a flu, so I think I should uh, keep my mask on. But this morning, uh, I'm still COVID negative, so no worries. I think um, the particular theme of building a talent pipeline is an ongoing process. There's really no special tactic or strategy that will yield the kind of, shall we say, magical results that you seek. Rather, it is always about making sure your products, your services, and the environment in which higher education is delivered can serve the interest of our students and faculty members. Let me say a little bit more about each of these. In terms of, well, product may not be a very uh, appropriate term, but students come because they want to study subjects that will lead to a meaningful career when they graduate. Faculty members join us because they feel our universities can provide them with the support they need to flourish in their career. When you talk about talent development, it is important also to think about how skill demands, how the definition of talent itself undergoes changes in the 21st century. So at CHK, for example, we've been trying very hard to come up with new programs that would serve the needs of our students as they face a very uncertain, rapidly changing work culture when they graduate. We introduced, for example, a full-time co-op program where students can actually spend up to eight months taking up a full-time job with full pay and therefore also full responsibilities while they study. That's just one example. Now, I think services also would be important because in many ways, I mean, everybody recognizes Hong Kong to be truly, truly international cosmopolitan society. And yet, and yet, Hong Kong in some ways also has a highly homogenous population. From my experience, getting international students and local students come together, enjoy the learning journey together, does not happen on its own. 
So as UHK also, we are spending a lot of effort trying to promote uh, student cooperation, collaborative projects. And finally, I know I'm already taking too much time, in terms of the environment, in terms of the environment, who would like to come into a university where you don't have sufficient lab space? Who would want to come to a university where there is simply no support for the kind of digital learning that today, <coughs> today's world demands. Hong Kong has already done a lot in that respect, but nonetheless, even at CUHK, we are celebrating our 60th anniversary, and sometimes I walk around campus, and I say, yike, that building is really very old, and we have to do something about it, which is to say, Building a pipeline for talent is an ongoing process and challenge. Sorry, Rob, I'm taking no, so much no, no. time. You're doing great. Thank you, Alan. So how about you, Professor Yiko? <laughs> okay, good morning. Um, I came to Hong Kong. I'm a new Hong Kongese. I come here only three years. After spending 35 years at the Imperial College in London, so London and Hong Kong is pretty comparable. So for me to move to Hong Kong to lead uh, respected universities, also very young university, I'm deeply honored. So I really learned quite a lot during the last six months. I've been provost for six months now. So in my view, and when I was, uh, I feel, we are now in a very rapid changing world. I, myself is an AI expert. I spent 40 years in AI, and I just get the National um, Distinguished Contribution Award for the AI. So when he's talking about uh, ChatGPT, I'm deeply, uh, really, you know, encouraged. So I feel, you know, Hong Kong is a embrace this particular new uh, revolution and which I'm involved quite, uh, quite, a, quite a lot of time. Uh, but that's only one side is technology, but the most important thing is uh, now uh, Hong Kong is a hub, right, between the world and uh, China. So I feel the transform of education in this particular city is uh, really exceptional. And uh, if you're talking about HKUST, you know, I experienced the, the really progressive thinking and also the innovative approach we take. And I feel very much excited about the, the courage as well as the vision of this university. So give you one very good example, people all probably know, we established about Guangzhou campus. This year, it will be their first enrollment of the UG student. And uh, the size is doubled our Clear Water Bay campus. This university, the, this campus is extremely unique in the sense we don't have a department, we don't have a school. And this university is organized is a new concept of hub and the trust. What I mean, it means we focus on multidisciplinary education from day one, from the university education when they enter into the university. So we believe, right, we need a complementary campus where Clearwater Bay can very much focus on in-depth research and a principle-based education <coughs> And the Guangzhou campus focuses on multidisciplinary and mission-driven research, our education. So put two education models into one university at different sites. We really aim to leverage right, the, the rapid development, economic development in China and also the international city, international cultural environment in Hong Kong. So such a 
innovative design, as well as a very forward-looking approach for university education is really impressive. So for me, I feel I can actually work in this university and to drive to practice such uh, innovative thinking, to educate, to actually do the transformation of work for the education is very honored. So I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now it's President Paul Lam's turn. Uh, good morning, colleagues. I just want to make a few points. I received my education mostly in Hong Kong. I went to primary school, secondary school, bachelor, master in Hong Kong, and then did my PhD overseas. I, all my life I worked in UGC funded, that means government funded universities. Just about two years ago, I had the opportunity and I moved to a self-financed university, which is Hong Kong Metropolitan University. I then realized that the opportunities and the challenges are completely different. Even though we, had, uh, we have uh, many world-class government-funded universities in Hong Kong, we should be proud of, private self-financed universities are very important in providing opportunities for a large number of young people in Hong Kong. I remember when I finished my postdoc, I was very stressed because I was looking for a job. At the time, very few jobs, a lot of people, I would dare to say talents, wanting the jobs. Today, it's reversed. The world has changed. When I joined this uh, self-financed university, Hong Kong Metropolitan University, the first thing I decided to do is to recruit because it's just not enough faculty. So I made my goal to recruit 100 more faculty. And in two years' time, I recruited 132. But 100 of them left to other universities, to other countries. So there is a constant need to get people to come to Hong Kong. And that could be part of our discussion later on. And I would like, to the, ultimately, the question is, why would someone, some talents, want to come, work, and stay in Hong Kong? What is their attraction? And they, that is, a, is it to do with family-friendly policies, opportunities for advancement, all of that. I, I don't want to get into deep discussion because we have another opportunity. Before I pass the time to my uh, colleagues, I'd just like to say that here you have all the speakers coming from universities. But for me, if you were to address this theme, building a talent pipeline, we ought to look at basic education as well. That is primary education, secondary education, university education. Without the basic, good basic education, <laughs> we have no hope. I think I'll stop here and pass my microphone to my next colleague. Thank you very much, Paul. And finally, Professor Bing Xiang, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm the only one from Ranan, China. But, uh, the, you know, I mean, the school based in Ranan, China, to be more precise. But uh, the sponsorship coming from Hong Kong. So we have been grateful and privileged to have financial support from Lee Ka Ching Foundation, you know. So in that regard, we're also Hong Kong school. And, and the reason we can do well to recruit student faculty, uh, not only the financial support, but also the rise of China. That's the key factor. So China has generated 38.6% economic growth since 2013 to today. US 18.6%. That's far bigger than the G7. And China has been the largest trading nation since 2010. For RCEP, this is the number. China has been the largest trading nation for Korea for 19 years. 19 years, yeah. Japan, 15 years. I mean, Australia, 14 years, you know. And China has the largest manufacturing nation. Its manufacturing output is bigger than the total of US, Japan, Germany together. So, but at the same time, we have to realize that, yes, China has been number two in nominal GDP since 2010, 
but we have not generated a single managerial concept which can be applied globally. We have to work hard on that. It gives me so much success. I'm very positive. A lot of innovation in China. Some of the concept from China which can be applied globally. So that's one of the reasons why we can attract top faculty from around the globe. This intellectual curiosity, the opportunities are truly unique. And of course, uh, we have to innovate. I always say, view the earth from the moon. Try to be a Google Amazon, not try to follow any models or ranking that matter. Uh, one innovation we did was try to target unserved, even underserved market, like chairman, CEO, and most respected companies, like chairman of Sinopec, Mr. Fu Cheng Yu, and Jack Ma, a founder of Tencent, you know, Chen Yidan, Didi, Pinduoduo. So no business school targeting that particular group. We have been very successful in targeting chairman, CEO, the most respected companies, and iconic entrepreneurs. That's what we did for the past 20 years, 21 years. Since 2015, we moved into new money, unicorns. We're the very first business school to have a program targeting unicorns by working together with Tencent, Baidu, Alibaba, uh, ByteDance, you know. And more recently, we have to push this program to be more global. We worked with Berkeley Engineering last year, February, UAE government in Dubai, few days ago in Singapore, and next module in Korea, and in Milan with Bakona University, and the Stanford Engineering in December. I hope to work with uh, Dean Chan in April next year, have a global unicorn forum module with Columbia University. So uh, our, by 2021, 136 founders and co-founders of Unicorn have participated in our program. That's far bigger than any school globally, any school. So this is innovation, what I call a groundbreaking innovations, serving the old money, top the pyramid, and new money. The new money is important because not only for economic prosperity, but also for social mobility. So we wanted to be a next generation unicorns. Social purpose, global responsibility, and a long-term perspective. Those are my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thank you. Shang. Now, our top you know, panelists just elaborated on some of the key factors and ingredients for attracting top international faculty as well as students to Hong Kong. So when we have these faculty and students, I'm sure you agree that one of the key objectives for universities is to nurture and produce talents for our businesses, professions, and various vocations in Hong Kong. Now, given the rapidly changing you know, global environment, such as digital transformation, chat GBT, artificial intelligence, et cetera, what must universities in Hong Kong do you know, to foster a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship you know, among our students so that they could have the necessary skills and mindset you know, to cope with these innovative changes, et cetera. So perhaps this time, we start from the middle. How about you, Provost uh, Ike Ge? <laughs> you start first. Right. Yes, I can agree with more, right? Uh, we need to recruit the great faculties, but we also need to focus on, you know, educate and cultivate the actual new generation and uh, with entrepreneurship. Uh, with an innovative thinking. I think this is a, you know, uh, really the noble mission of any university now. But I think uh, there's a big challenge, I, I think we go ahead, right? Being uh, innovative uh, and uh, being entrepreneur is not really necessary means, right? That you, you know, transfer knowledge, building company. I mean, you know, encourage your student to do that. But more importantly, is to educate our students to be, be a critical thinker and to be a creative, right? And uh, Mr. Xi, I'm talking about, you know, China is a, have a, a tremendous economic growth. However, 
is not really contribute too much on original knowledge, okay? So in my opinion, right, when we're talking about innovation, we need to first of all think about how to make our new generation to be a great thinker, right, to be a, a really, a, you know, the key point of innovation is that you need to think, you need to have the courage to challenge, and you also have the, the curiosity, right? You also have to think uh, beyond what you be told. So this kind of a style is actually not very traditional to our Chinese systems, but even including Hong Kong, right? But I think we're very important thing here. No, I came from you know UK, so I compare right the British systems on this site and with uh, with uh, with the education system here. I think one thing we know we need to do first is we really have to change the you know teaching <coughs> to be a really a learning. Right? We have to encourage students to learn. Okay, so th this is including you have to change the curriculums. So we have the really, uh, particularly now, we have ChatGPT, for example, right? And uh, HKST probably is the first university and announced to actually uh, totally embrace the, actually the ChatGPT in our education. And yesterday we even now purchased the ChatGPT's license for the campus use. The whole university students and the teacher will use it. Why we do so? It's because people may think about it, you know, such kind of a tool may have the misused, you know, may introduce prejudice or so on, but we think differently, right? We actually, what we need to think about, how to change our education mode, how to change our massive assessment, right? For example, right, we probably will encourage students to actually ask the right question rather than get some answer. So I always say, you know, ChatGPT transfer a generation from a generation of remembrance to a generation of a doubt, right? You, could, you get the GPT output, you may think about, it. okay, you have to doubt it. Is it true or not true? It never happened before. When teacher tell you it's always true, but not anymore. So this is a great opportunity for us. Okay, we transfer completely. And another thing is very, very, very simple, right? And when we go into the, you know, education program, we're always thinking about assessment. We're thinking about, you know, what score you can get. But now we introduce the programs. When we get into the school, we, which call the, we call the new engineering education. And actually the goal is that you solve our problems. The assessment is build a company. So we started to do this practice. And we formed an academy of interdisciplinary study in Clearwater Bay, mirror our, our structure in the Guangzhou campus. So there, when we enter into the university, they form a group. They start with two years, some kind of a, you know, general education, and then immediately form group solving problems. We are we're doing so for the master's degree, but we're also doing so for the undergraduates now in Guangzhou. So all this practice have one goal, so change the student mentality of learning to be more focused on entrepreneur and innovation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Thank you. So, so Paul, your turn. Uh, perhaps I think one important element that we need to consider is the environment. That is that we have the right environment to encourage innovation and new ideas and so on. Sometimes people might call it the ecosystem that we have to have the right ecosystem. Very often we invest a lot of money in attracting top people. Generally top people means top scientists, at least in Hong Kong. Uh, Nobel laureates or top engineers and so on. I think these people are part, are very, very important part of the ecosystem. But they are not the ecosystem. We need all other people. Talents should include social scientists, artists, nurses, doctors, all kinds of people to make up the ecosystem. And, and, and therefore, everybody, including the government, university, and so on, must provide a good environment for people to come. Just, just to uh, add a few points, when we, today when we recruit good people to come to Hong Kong, 
of course, we give them a very attractive salary package. So that's usually not the difficult part. Once they've got the offer, they will start asking, will my wife or my husband get a job in Hong Kong? In, my, in the past, we say, no, no, we only want you. <laughs> no. But now we need to change our mind and be family friendly. And, and then they will ask, where my kid, which school my kids are going to go to? And all of these things, they will start thinking, in my spare time, what, what can I do? Can I, can I go for a walk somewhere? All of these things will make Hong Kong an attractive place. So it's not, it's not so simple just to get uh, 10, 20, 30 top people to come in Hong Kong. We will have an environment for innovation. I think we need a lot more than that, and we have a lot more work to do together. Thank you, Paul. Professor Xiang, please. Oh, uh, you know, we Chinese among the most entrepreneurial globally. We may not be the most innovative yet, but I hope we can do better in the future. You know, China has provided the best environment for being an entrepreneur. To me, China has been the most disruptive economy globally for the past two decades. I'll give you some number. For Fortune Global Company, China had 11, 201. Today, 129, the largest on Earth. So China has generated more newly emerged large-scale company than any other country on Earth. We have generated newly minted billionaire more than any other country on Earth. Unicorn, we're number two, second only to the United States. So we're doing well, we're doing awfully well in terms of entrepreneurship. But in terms of innovations, we have a long way to catch up, you know. And also in terms of global responsibility, we have a way to catch up. As a Chinese company for China, peaceful rise of China, we need to have more innovative manager concept technology coming from China. We need more entrepreneurs who are truly global in responsibility. They need to think way beyond China. Sometimes you need to forget about your Chinese. Solving global issues, global problem. Learn from the United States. That's so essential for the future. So that's the reason why we emphasize so much on global responsibility, global perspective. And we have been trying so hard to search for the elements, let's say the Chinese way, don't call the model, which may have global relevance. One's a unicorn, another one, digital transformation. You know, when Jack Ma completed his study in our school, he hired the only strategy professor I had, Professor Zheng Ming, to be chief strategy officer of Alibaba. Four years later, he hired Professor Chen Long to be chief strategy officer of Ant Financial. So Jack Ma needs to give the school a lot of money in the future, you know, in that regard. And later on, you know, Jiang Liao was hired away to be chief strategy officer of JD.com. Accordingly, I argue we may have a dream team to teach digital transformation globally. I hired Professor Sun Bao Hong from Carnegie Mellon, chair professor there. Last year, I got a Professor Sun Tian Shu, tenured both engineering faculty and a business school in USC. These two persons, together with my team, can provide the top, the perspective of digital transformation for both Chinese company and American company together. So I think we can contribute globally, including top American companies. We did a leadership program for Google, Greater China, Latin America, two days. They love it. That's evidence how good our faculty is. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Yang. And finally, Ellen, please. Thank you, Rock. Um, education was defined in the old days primarily in terms of literacy, wasn't it? And then people realized uh, that the concept of literacy will need to be expanded to include at least quantitative reasoning, numeracy, and now in the 21st century, a digital literacy is recognized to be an essential skill for our students. And for that reason, at CUHK, we have introduced a new core required course for all students, 
on digital literacy and computational thinking. Come to think of it, with the, uh, in fact, with the support of the very generous support of the Jockey Club, we are developed, well, we have developed a project called AI for the Future and taking AI computational thinking into our secondary schools. So the first point I want to make is that education curriculum, of course, these need to evolve depending on the changing conditions of the world. But having said that, having said that, and this is my second point, no matter what global talent report you read, invariably, what employers desire, what they seek, are very strong soft skills. Critical thinking, ability to work with a multicultural, multinational team, the ability to communicate, to manage a multinational workforce. These, I think, mustn't be underestimated, even though high tech, even though technology may drive the future economy, when you have people working together, the importance of having soft skills remains critical. In the final analysis, and this is my final point, what we want to see in our students is to develop a certain intellectual discipline, a certain habit of mind, so that there is a spirit of enterprise, not necessarily always to open, you know, to start a company, but in everything they do, there is this entrepreneurial spirit. In everything they think about, everything they do, there is this idea of you know, being innovative, finding new solutions. How do we embed that into the curriculum? And that is the challenge for all of us. Thank you very much, Ellen. Great. Uh, before we move on to the last question, may I get the permission from Edith to cut short like five minutes of your coffee break so that we have enough time for the last, you know, last part of this session. Okay, I'm sorry, five minutes shorter. <laughs> uh, okay, I think uh, Professor Alan Chen just touched on a very important point about the soft skills of our graduates and our talents. Because, uh, I mean, other than being a legislator, I'm actually from, from the uh, business sector. Uh, sometimes we heard from the business, commercial, and professional sectors saying that, you know, uh, a lot of times our graduates from universities, they are not ready for on-the-job performances. They may have learned a lot in terms of technical knowledge, everything, but they are not quite ready to perform on the jobs, which I think Provost Alan Chen just touched on. Uh, so my last question is, you know, how can universities and our tertiary education institutions work with the business sectors, work with industries to ensure that the skills and the knowledge acquired by our students will prepare them well for their career prospects and also to align with the needs and the requirements of the workforce? And third to that, what kind of roles do, you know, apply degrees and vocational trainings play. Okay, we have actually 10 minutes left, not five, because I just you know, asked for Edith's permission to have 10 minutes left, thank you. So, so let's start with Paul now. You know. <laughs> Would you like to share? Okay. You know? I, I think um, because our, the nature of our university is that we, we want our students to be able to leave the university and get a job, a good job, and develop a career. So we are very mindful of the curriculum and making sure that it is relevant to to the to the sector. So that is you mentioned about applied degree. I wanted to say something about the word apply. Applied, I don't know why whether it's true in other parts of the world. Apply in Hong Kong has a slightly um, lower level meaning. So if you don't ask someone what research you're you're doing, if they say I'm well I'm working on theoretical physics, then, you know, good. But I said, I'm working on applied physics. And he said, what, what, what are you working on? You're working in a factory? So, so there, there is a, there's a, the notion is, is different. 
and the government is pushing for applied degree. And I believe applied degrees have a really, really important role to play in Hong Kong. And perhaps in other parts of the world. One way of doing this, uh, making sure that our graduates are fit for industry, profession, we must first have a very, very genuine and intimate dialogue with the profession, with industry. So uh, sometimes we might in invite them to come to our university and sit on program development committees as advisors and so on. We, we, we've always done that. And I believe that other universities have similar arrangements. But whether they truly get them involved is another business. Are, are they there just to say that we have, we have industry input? I, I'm, I'm even thinking, which is a, a, a bold statement here, that perhaps in future maybe some programs can be jointly offered by professionals together with faculty. Now, I say this uh, running the danger of being heavily criticized by my peers because they will say that academic autonomy is sacred to the university. The Senate is the ultimate body that determines academic awards. This must be true and we must protect that. However, we can open up some of the courses and part of the curriculum and invite professionals in the field and come and help us to teach that. We do the ultimate quality control. We give the, the final award, but get them more involved. Uh, I think that is something that we can try to do in the future. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Bing, please. Well, we, we need uh, so much to catch up. Uh, this is the number. U.S. contributed 59% natural science Nobel laureate since year 2000, 59%. Mainland China got one. We have a long way to go. So curiosity is very important, not just money not just create a wealth, you know. And if you just aim at the money, wealth creation, you're gonna be very myopic. You have no patience for a lot of things. Second, today, most of Chinese companies truly domestic. We're number one in Fortune Global companies. Very few of them can make money globally. Thirdly, our students, compared with India, we're far behind. Look at the rise of India for the past 10, 20 years. They set example for us. We have a lot to catch up. So the globalness, the ability to connect globally, something we really have to work on. So for our school, uh, we always look at what is needed for this next generation entrepreneurs. We don't join any ranking, because ranking can sometimes kill the innovations. Google, Amazon cannot be ranked because they are not exist in the first place. How can you rank them? At least that's our strategy, not in any rank, despite the fact we're doing awfully well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bing. Ellen, anything additional to, to share? Um, I think students in the future will increasingly require continual upskilling and, in many instances, retooling. Increasingly, an undergraduate degree will no longer satisfy the demand of the changing workplace. In traditional systems, of course, then we provide master's degrees, but I'm not sure if that is the best way to deliver what they need. So we have been actively thinking about recognizing micro-credentials, stackable programs, so that students can come in, go out, learn new things, and maybe switch careers. And in this way, I think we can also better engage industry uh, partners, learning directly from them what are the requirements, what are the skills that they are looking for. But one last point I want to make, which I forgot to make earlier, Brock. There is ample evidence to suggest students learn best if they enjoy themselves. So I don't think we should forget about that. Recently, we turned a very old building into uh, something we call uh, an inno port, and basically get all the students, faculty members, alumni, 
uh, business partners to come in and try different things, uh, doing innovations and so on. But the one distinctive feature of that exercise is that students really have fun. Great point. Thank you, Alan. And finally, Yika. Yeah, I agree with all the panelists who said. I just adding one point. Uh, we all talking about the internship, right? Internship is very important to, for students to gain ex industry experiences, but also very important to cultivate them some soft skill you mentioned, right? The team workers, as well as the certain kind of communication skills, as well as the way of industry thinking, discipline, also on what they are not really learned in the classroom. But one thing I think, being in Hong Kong, I quite agree with the Professor Xiang's point. We got to think about the global. And our internship should not really focus on the Hong Kong and, and, uh, and the Great Bay Area. We should really think about China as a whole, as well as global. You know, in, in Imperial, our students' internship is worldwide, right? And here, we are too much emphasized on Hong Kong, but none extend a little bit will be Shenzhen. That's not right, that's not good enough. And I really think from top universities, and I really think you need to really have the total open mind to the whole world. And that will grow our students, right? I, I just add in this point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yika. Ladies and gentlemen, um, as you witnessed in the last 45 minutes, you know, our distinguished panelists have immense wealth of knowledge and experience, as well as ex expertise to share in relation to higher education. I hope that you have tremendous amount of take home value. Certainly I did. We could obviously go on and on, but in the interest of time, I have no choice but to conclude the first panel discussion. I thank you for your time, and let's give a big round of applause to our four panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. What an incredible panel. As we are moving forward, let's acknowledge this immense diversity that is yeah. presented in this forum. And also attendees uh, flying all over around to come here to Hong Kong that to bring us the unique cultural perspectives and invaluable insights into their local education system. And this diversity truly embodies the spirit of global cooperation and understanding. It's powerful testament to our shared belief that education is a universal right and critical pillar of sustainable development. At FWE, our mission is to create a platform for sharing innovative solutions, forming partnerships, and also inspiring transformative policies. Exactly, and to achieve this, we encourage active participation throughout the day and ask questions and share insights and make connections. And most importantly, remember, voice matter. So each one of us has the potential to make a significant impact on global education. So Helen, I think we have a special session now. That's right. Well, we'll have two sessions, just to give you a preview of uh, what's coming up. We'll have two sessions running simultaneously after this. Uh, for English, we will have discussion on globalizing the workforce, and then also innovative curriculum models for global competences in business schools. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's what we have a great group photo. We invite our photographers to come on stage and please, please. Oh, okay. Uh, over there already. <laughs> okay. 请我们的摄影师上台,我们一起拍一张大合影。
Okay. Okay. Thank you Thank everyone you. for your kind participation. Actually, we will come everyone to go outside for a short coffee break. And before that, to, for the coffee break, we are taking another group photo at the stairs. So please, everyone, join outside. There's guidance outside on the stairs. Yes. The, the stair coffee staircase. Break. Thank you. The staircase is outside, and there will be people helping us guiding for the photos. Yes, and please, after your coffee break, come back to this main forum at 11.10, 11.10 a.m. Thank you. And please do come back at 11.10 for the simultaneous panels. Thank you.
喂喂喂，喂喂喂，可以听见吗 ？Could you hear me now?
大家好，我们在在会场也有一个文化的一个会场，在聊教育和变革这个话题。所以，呃，如果大家对那个话题感兴趣，也可以了解，在右边有个分会场，然后我们这里的主会场将会讨论 globalizing the workforce。Welcome, Welcome back. back, and we and hope, we that, hope you that you have, have enjoyed good exchanges and among your peers over the coffee break. And now that we're moving forward to two consecutive sessions now. For session two, we're going to have globalizing the workforce. We would like to welcome the moderator, Dr. Raymond Chen, uh, who will give us a very nice opening for his panel. Okay. Okay. Let me also welcome the panelists who already been sitting uh, before we arrive. So let's uh, start with Ms. Colleen Chen, General Manager, Microsoft Hong Kong and Macau. 
Professor Anthony B. L. Zhang, Advisor, Public Administration, Department of Asian and Policy Studies, the Education University of Hong Kong. And last but not least, Mr. George Hong Choi, Chief Executive Officer, Link Asset Management. He's also the trustee of University of Pennsylvania, as well as adjunct professor of Department of the Real Estate and Construction at the University of Hong Kong. Thank you. Now I'm going to go to give the mic to Dr. Chen. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. We'll plunge right in, in the interest of time. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about global competencies, how to globalize the workforce. So in our view, there are three important competencies and how do we develop and train this kind of competencies in the workplace, in our educational institutions. Okay. And uh, the first competency, generally speaking, is green transition and sustainability. Okay. And the second area of competency, this is to future-proof our workforce, is application of AI. And a third thing is not so much competency, but it's really a culture that is very important, is ethics. Yeah. How important is ethics? So I'm going to hand over to the speakers. They're, they're, they're all very successful people in the workplace and society. And first, I'm going to hand over to Collie. They're going to speak a few minutes each, Anthony, and then George. Yeah. And then we're going to have a free flow of conversation between uh, the three speakers. Then we'll try to save 10 minutes for Q&A if you want to get into the debate. Yeah. So, Kali, I'll hand over to you. Wayman, thanks. Um, you talk about AI. I'm coming from Microsoft. Definitely, I need to talk a bit about it. AI is not new. Indeed, it's already around for quite a couple of years. But beginning from this year, I don't know whether you feel it. Everyone is talking about ChatGPT. It's really hot. And indeed, it's not just for uh, individuals, even company, everyone is talking about it. So at the beginning, I indeed would like to give you more context. What, what happened? Why suddenly, beginning this year, a lot of people have another understanding what AI can do. Because now, when people talk about ChatGPT, we talk about the large language models. In the past, when we talk about AI, we all understand AI, we need to train it. AI will only know what we, what we teach, it. teach it. But, but with, with the large, the large language, language model, model, and people, and people will, 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 feel will feel that, feel that. And no, and no. Indeed, indeed, this AI, this AI is not, is not like, a like a baby. We need to, we train, need to train, from train from the beginning. From the beginning. It's, no, no, indeed, it's, it's already, already like a like a can can encyclopedia. encyclopedia. It's number, it's one. number one. Number two, number two is, is this, this AI, AI indeed, indeed is not it's only not only know what you what teach it. This AI, this AI can, can internalize. It can, it can generate, generate content. content. Text, text, image, image programming, programming code, code, and even and can even have, can a, have human -like a human like conversation with you. With you. It is, it is number, number two, two reason. reason. Number three, number three reason, reason, is, reason is in the past, in the past a lot of people already said, said, ah, ah um, um, we need we to need make, to make um, um, even not even IT, IT people, people can, can use AI. AI. For example, For example we, 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 they can just can just draw some photos. But, but why now, why now with, with this large, this large language, language model, model. Just, just a layman, a layman. We, we use natural, natural language, language can, communicate can communicate with this AI. This is, AI. This is this the reason, reason why, why people see, people see oh, oh, with this, this, this natural, natural language, language processing, processing large, language large language model, model it really it can, make can make AI, AI for, for everyone, everyone, every profession. Every profession. And for, and for Microsoft, you know, every you know, year we have done a workforce work index, index survey. survey. Similar, Similar for this, for this year. year, we have done a research survey, survey uh, which we interviewed in interview, uh, 31,000 uh, 31, people, people in, in 31, 31 um, cities. cities. Hong Kong is, Hong Kong one, is of one of it. And in each city, we interviewed thousands, thousands of people, people which, which cover leaders, leaders as, well as well as employees. employees. Basically, Basically, the theme for this year is what people perspective about, about AI. AI, will they will think they AI, AI really will, will change, change the, the whole, whole um, work, dynamics. work dynamics? 
we do have we some do have interesting, some interesting findings. findings. One finding, One finding is, is we interview, we interview employee. employee. How's their, How's their perspective, perspective about, about AI? AI? You know, you know, among, among 80%, 80 of employees, of employees their, feedback their feedback is they indeed, they indeed would, like would like to use AI. AI. They want they to want use to AI, AI to help to them help for some tedious some work. work. They want they to want use to AI, which can help them to do some administrative work. They would like to use AI, help them to do some sum summary and give them recommendation. And indeed, they also think about, they would like AI help them on some creative work. This is from the employee perspective. Then how about from the employer, from the leader's perspective? Similarly, around 80% of AI should be 78% of the employer, they say that, they indeed would like AI help the employee to increase productivity. They would like AI to help them to have a more inclusive environment. They would like AI to help improve the well-being of employees because, you know, because of COVID, there's a lot of issues saying that employees have burnout issues, all this kind of thing. Huh? From this angle, it seems AI is really the way to go. Of course, in this virtual industry study, we also study, will people worry they will lose job? From the study, it say that um, around 60% of the employees do have that worry, but 80% still say that they want to use AI. And from the employer survey, uh, as I say, 78%, they indeed are positive. They're not thinking about use AI to to replace that, pe hundred percent replace that people. Indeed, only around twenty percent, twenty-two percent say that they will like AI, AI so that so they that can they reduce can their workforce. Work and that means, means what's the takeaway? AI is the way to go. Another data I would like to share, which is from IDC. IDC have a forecast. What will be the size of AI market? It say that by two thousand and twenty-six. The market of AI will grow to 46.6 billion US dollar, which is 126% growth compared to 2022. And China market include Hong Kong. The AI market is talking about, uh, the Asia market is 46.6. The China market is 26.6 billion US dollar. Then that means indeed, AI definitely is very important in the China market, in Hong Kong. Yeah, I think this is some key data point. And the third piece I would like to share is some people may still be skeptical, saying that, uh, is it AI is only for certain industry? Let me give you some data. Now, indeed, it's already happening in Hong Kong. People are thinking, um, I'm not thinking, I already implement have a solution, have a solution because, because say that, say that for, customer for customer service, service basically, basically, which can, which can help, help a customer, a customer service, service department, department uh, to, categorize to categorize the campaign, the campaign they receive, they receive um, um, to help to them help to, to um, draft, draft response, response to the campaign. To the campaign. And, according and according to the data, to the data it say that, that in the past, it takes a, take a customer, customer service officer around, around two weeks to manage this. Right now, within 10 seconds. Try to imagine every company has customer service department. Another, Another example, example I would like to share, like with, to share you. with you. Um, um, HR, HR, all companies company have HR, HR department. department. Right now, right all companies are, company are thinking about, about are they, are they would like hiring like people. people. And then again, we are using AI, basically can help company reduce 98% of the time for them to screen the white candidate. Another angle, um, since women also talk a bit about ESG, we talk about profession, the big four. Um, EY, EY indeed, you know they're using AI every day, help them to monitor 2,000 news channels and categorize them into 400 ESG-related topics so that they can help them to do the ESG-related work. From this perspective, indeed, the message is AI is the way to go and AI is for everyone, every industry, every profession. I think it's the... And from the workforce perspective, it seems it's quite consistent. No matter employee or employer, they indeed are quite positive about AI. They would like to embrace it. But from the study, there's one angle very interesting. Also around 
83% of the employer fail. Uh, they are not, um, they don't have the full capability to use AI. Similarly, 80% of employee also think they don't have the right capability to use AI. Even though I say that it's natural language, very easy to use, but it seems um, there's still some gap. Then maybe I, I leave it share later, and then other speaker talk about it. Then we can check further. And then in the AI world, what kind of skills that we need? Yeah. Thank you, Carly. Uh, Anthony. Uh, right. Uh, Raymond, uh, in your introduction, you mentioned uh, two keywords, uh, green transition yeah. and uh, AI. I think uh, these two keywords probably summarize very well the main challenges uh, to humanity at this juncture. Uh, for green transition, of course, it's related to environmental sustainability, climate change, and uh, so far, we seem, I mean, we meaning the human society, we seem to understand the challenges, the threat. Uh, we have uh, 20 odd and 27 COP conferences of parties. There's a lot of attention, a lot of talk, but li limited walk. In other words, we are good at talking about it, but we couldn't find a collective solution, a, a solution that can induce real action. So that's a real challenge. And if we are not careful, increasingly, we are facing this uh, existential future of humanity. Now, AI, I think uh, Carly has talked a lot about the opportunities, the, 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 the skills that will be needed for AI. But from another angle, the, the, a more philosophical question is, is humanity or human beings, are they still relevant? If technology has grown so rapidly, uh, they could even uh, uh, come up with analytical capacity, a uh, lot of knowledge. So are human beings still relevant? And I think uh, these two uh, catchwords uh, not only summarize uh, the challenges before us, but also the challenge to education, the challenge to the kind of workforce that we would like to groom to face this future. Because this future is quite different from the past, and we cannot just do more of the same. We have to break out from the old mindset. So I think in relation to the general theme of globalizing the workforce, to me, globalization of the workforce is not the same as having a workforce with people from different countries, different backgrounds, different systems. Uh, but that is important because we are in a globalizing world. We are talking about globalizing space, opportunities and of course threats and risks. So we need people from different backgrounds, but more essentially is even if the workforce comes from within a local workforce, for example, they need to embrace a global outlook. An outlook that appreciates and also investigates the complexity of the world around us. AI, well, if AI uh, indicates what I said earlier, that a lot of things can be done by machines. So what is left to human beings? I believe that there are things that machines cannot do. And uh, in the prep talk among the, the four of us before this session, I mentioned the word wisdom. To me, wisdom is not the same as intelligence because wisdom involves making a judgment. A judgment that is not just calculated, but sometimes a judgment that will involve bold decision. And I think many of you in business, you know, it's not mechanical. And sometimes you have to work within the context of opportunities as well as adversity. So sometimes you can uh, uh, be more conservative, sometimes you need to be bolder. Now that kind of judgment, I wonder whether machines can entirely handle because machines work on data of the past, but we are more talking about how to face an uncertain future. And in addition, what determines human society is not just the environment, is not just knowledge, but also our culture, our traditions, our mindset. So culture matters, and Raymond mentioned ethics, right? I mean, that has to do with moral values, and I remember uh, some years ago, uh, uh, a former dean of Harvard College, I think the name is Harry Lewis, 
he wrote a book with the title Excellence Without a Soul. I mean, he was coming up with a critique of some American universities, and he cautioned people, scholars, educationalists, make sure you don't forget about the soul. The soul, of course, uh, to be interpreted in a broader sense, right? and judgment, moral values. Now, these things, can AI uh, uh, replace human beings? I don't know. I, I hope not. So we, we have to, to, to really find out what is not so easily replaceable. So the human added value, whether to production, to education. And we need a workforce, we need people who are able to appreciate. Now this is the fast changing world. You cannot turn the clock back. Now you have to face the future, the, a future that may be uncertain. Remember at the beginning of this century, Thomas Friedman was talking about the, the world is flat as though we are coming to a very uh, stable, pleasant, peaceful world. But then looking back over the last two decades, we have seen a lot of crisis, uh, natural crisis, pandemic, financial crisis, conflicts. We are talking about a new Cold War. Now, all these things are becoming almost like part of a new normal. So is our first uh, workforce ready? Are they prepared to face this new normal? So in education, I, I think we should not be just doing more of the same, but we need to inculcate the kind of capacity to help people, help our younger generation to appreciate diversity, to work within diversity, to appreciate differences. And in Hong Kong, uh, because we are now having this conference in Hong Kong, we are talking about how to cope with uh, the shortage of talent we are trying to grab talent from everywhere. And I think, of course, Hong Kong is an open society, an open city, we welcome people from everywhere. But at the end of the day, we must still make sure that we are able to retain talent. Because whatever talent you get from, from everywhere, talent can leave in this globalizing world. And talent attracts talent. This is what Bill Gates said uh, some years ago, the decision to locate for cutting edge companies is whether or not you have got a cluster of talent, not your tax policy, not tax holiday, but talent. So what kind of talent do we need in this fast changing world? I think that's the main challenge uh, to us and also to educational institutions. Thank you very much. Thank you. George. Well, it's a big topic. Um, I'll start with AI first and I'll, I'll um, talk about a few things and then come back to the other you know, about sustainability and ethics. Uh, for AI, um, because um, you know, it will change how education may, may be um, uh, conducted, etc. cetera. Um, so at University of Pennsylvania, we did have a committee that um, tried to study this and de debate. I don't think we have a conclusion, but there are a few things that is interesting that has come out. One is uh, ChatGPT did pass a Wharton uh, course uh, exam, and everyone sort of say, wow, um, it's so smart. Um, but it's a more technical type exam, right? Um, and then uh, one of the professor at the College of Arts and Sciences used ChatGPT to, to, to write a poem. And the poem actually meets all the mechanical rules uh, for what poem should be like it rhymes. It has di different parts um, that that uh, matches each, each other, each other, each other. But it doesn't, but it have, doesn't have the soul. So, right. So, right. so um, um, when we when then, we then uh, at, uh, work, at work say, say why don't you why come, you up, come with up with a business, a business plan? plan? We ask ChatGPT a business plan for our China strategy, and it looks great. Um, we can almost implement it, um, but then when we look at it. It has all the buzzword. It actually doesn't make any sense. Um, so what does that mean is, at this stage at least, um, and we're talking about the, you know, we, we, for education about the future, but at least at this stage, um, it doesn't beat the expert in the field. So it, it beats the common person, you know, because AI is ahead of the common person in any topic. But, but it doesn't beat the expert in the field. I think when it gets to the stage where it beats the expert, then we start to worry. 
but it, you know, uh, for, for us to look at the answer, and we are not a musician, we're not a poet, then it looks, wow, pretty impressive. So I, I think we still have some room. Um, the, the other thing uh, that I try to encourage our team not to so worry about losing their job is, remember that when you go to primary school, the teacher will still try to encourage our students to learn arithmetic by not using a calculator. And then, normal, normally, we would use a calculator because that is a productivity tool. So I said, don't be so worried about AI. AI will hopefully make us more productive because this is a very powerful tool. And I use that also because I think one of the things that for me and a lot of people who give a lot of speeches, we hate writing the speeches. We always want someone to write it first, and we then mark it up. And so I did that recently. Ask, give ChatGPT a topic I'm going to deliver on, and come out with all of that, and I changed 90% of it. But I like someone to start, and whether that is a, my, my colleague or ChatGPT, it's actually you know, another productivity tool. And so I see it that way, and hopefully it is that way, rather than taking over our world. Um, but what it also does, and this word repeats a lot, is it integrate knowledge. Um, and I want to do a little bit of marketing for, for Penn, because I, I heard Professor Gao talking about the HKUST new campus with no school, no department. Um, and we have schools at, at, at University of Pennsylvania, but we created what we call Professor of Integrated Knowledge, where professors are appointed to be professor of at least two schools and not one. Uh, the reason is there's just so many topics, so many matters that doesn't go into a small pigeonhole. And when we learn something in the past, um, and I see that with my kids, my daughter is, uh, is a business graduate, same as me, and we know nothing about science. Um, so when we, when, when, when we have a flu, we actually don't know or, or when we, uh, uh, the terms that the doctor used. Um, my son and those who come from arts and science uh, doesn't know business. So uh, the other day I was telling him why interest rate goes up, property price will come down. Well, because we don't educate people in an integrated way. Um, and so going to sustainability, I have a, uh, the, the head of our sustainability team uh, was a great uh, um, person came out from HKUST with a PhD in sustainability. After working for us for a few years, he went back to HKUST to get an MBA degree. Mm -hmm. Because sustainability doesn't work if you don't also talk about no dollar and si cents. Um, and again, going back to my earlier point, he did, you know, we didn't provide programs at university that integrate knowledge, that integrate so many different things that are interlinked. So going to ethics is the same thing. When I went, we had a two-hour session on ethics at the start of my MBA program, and that's it. We don't talk about ethics anymore. Now, it is part of the core curriculum. Uh, because it's so important, it touches every decision that business people have to make. Um, so how can we actually make all these topics, like when you bake a cake, you, you put all the ingredients in there and mix it, so you don't just have uh, someone who knows how to make flour but doesn't know how to you know, mix sugar, and etc. cetera. Um, and that is the challenge for education, is don't put students in pigeonhole, try to mix it, and if you can't, because it just within a certain area, it is just so much you need to learn. Then at least expose them to different elements. So one of the things that we have done at the Warren School is... <laughs> ...school will, will do the same to business people. Um, so I think all these topics at the end is... Yeah, everything is, it demands so much of us. How can we put it all together? Uh, yeah, mind? thank you, George. Yeah, okay. Uh, Colleen. I, I indeed would like to respond to what George as well as Anthony say. Yeah. Uh, I indeed, um, 
love and what both of you talk about it because when and George you say about ah you like somebody help you to draft something and and Anton you say about uh, the soul mm. yeah exactly spot on AI is not God uh, we need to have a wide understanding that's why in our workforce index studies it, it say that people do see some gap what are the gap we talk about AI, we talk about big data. Indeed, if I try to categorize to get, basically, it's about CDEF. What is CDEF? Mm -hmm. The first C is about critical thinking. Because AI is not a god, then that means for us, if we use AI, basically, I think it is so important for us, we need to have the um, bias detections and handling. We need to have critical thinking. We need to have the judgment, what's right and wrong. This C, critical thinking, so important. D, delegation. Because AI, AI is, AI is and and it, will it will answer, answer according, to, according what to what you ask. ask. Then, then For us, we indeed need still, um, we need to decide what we can delegate, what cannot. Exactly, exactly. As George, George example. example. You can you delegate, can delegate AI, AI help you, to, you draft. to draft. But at, but the, at end, the end, what, what finally, finally, you are going, you are to, going talk to talk about, about to say to in say your in speech. Your speech. You, cannot you cannot delegate. You are still, you are the, still one the one owning, owning it. it. Yeah. yeah. D, delegate. D, delegate. C, D, e, what e, what e means is, is emotion intelligence. Even though nowadays we all talk about everything can do it remotely. But, but, Emotion, emotion, how you, how you feel, the emotion, feel the emotion, how you, how you sense, sense the need of the people. Of the people. This, type this type of, of capability, capability is, more is more important than, important than, ever. than ever. Because, in, because the in the past, maybe you, maybe have, you have some, have some and knowledge, and knowledge you, learn, you learn, you memorize something, something already, already, already make, make you so bright. So bright. But right but now right with now the AI, AI it's not it's easy not to easy find to information. Find information. But, but how you make how the you judgment, make judgment on the information, on the information how, you how you detect the emotion, the emotion how, you, how you, you feel it, what the people need, need. Emotion, emotion intelligence. intelligence. The last thing is F, what F, F means means flexibility. Because now in new normal and also in the AI world, everything will be very dynamic, very fast. And the velocity is increasing. Let me share with you some data, so interesting. Now they, now everybody, they everybody know, know mobile, phone mobile phone is so powerful. Is so powerful. But, but you know, you know it, take it takes 16 years, years for mobile, for mobile phones, phones to reach 100, 100 million, million users. User. You, know? you know how long, how long it takes it take ChatGPT to, to reach 100, 100, million 100 million user? user. Less, than Less than three months. Three months. Then, that then that means the means velocity is very fast. fast. Everyone, Everyone. Need, need to be to be pair, pair, the thing will the be, thing very, will be dynamic. very dynamic. What what it, it, work, work in, the past, in the past may not may work, not in, the work in the future. Then that means then even though, even though uh, uh, AI, AI learn a lot of knowledge, knowledge from the past, from the past but it may not, it may not means, means it will choose in, in, in the future. And also, and also your, plan your plan may be work, may be work in this six in months, months, there's no guarantee, there's no guarantee you can do to work in work in <laughs> next six, six months. months. Everybody, everybody needs to be very flexible and dynamic. So so this this. CDEF, I think it's some, some of the skill gap, gap, no matter, no matter from, the from the employee perspective, perspective from the, the employee, employee perspective, perspective, they feel they that, that indeed, indeed they, they need, need to have that capability. capability. And, and this, this also gives give some, give some insights, insights what, what we need, need to, to focus, focus in education. education. And when and we are talking about C-critical thinking, one of the key parts of this one indeed is also highly relevant on the topics of soul and ethics. Because try to because imagine. imagine. And also, and also we're going to leave some time, time for Q&A. Oh, 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 okay. oh, oh, oh. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank Thank you, Collie. Thank you, Collie. All right. All right. CDEF, CDEF. Take that to take heart. That to heart. Yeah. Another thing. Another thing. George, you gave, George me, one gave me one <coughs> idea. idea. When I go home, I go this, home afternoon, this afternoon, I'm going to feed gonna all, feed all my old speeches, old speeches to Chad GPT. Chad GPT. <laughs> so, so they'll be, they'll be, become, 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 maybe, maybe they'll, draft they'll draft your speech, your speech better. Better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Anyway, anyway, I promise, I promise the, audience the audience a Q&A &A session. session. If, if, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is. If you can, if allow, you can some allow some leeway, leeway yeah, yeah, and, and uh, a little uh, bit more little time. Bit more time. It is, it is, you have a question? Have a question? 
this whatever, whatever the, 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 the panelists, panelists have said resonates, said resonates so, much. so much. So I really so I do really want do to say want something. To say something. Uh, uh, Carly and I are, are on the HKUSD, HKUSD Council, Council together, together, but we belong, but we belong to two different, two different centuries. centuries. And if you, and if you hear my hear question, my question you'll understand you will understand why. why. Um, um, just a just few comments resonating with George. I started, I started to write my, my uh, opening, uh, remarks opening remarks uh, for, this uh, for this morning. I finished, I finished over, half, over of half of it. The next thing, the next I, said thing I said is, Helen, Helen can, you help, can you help me? me? Uh, well, she's uh, well, from HKUSD, uh, so, so she put it through, through, it through uh, uh, chat, uh, GPT, chat GPT. And, and I compared, I compared the, two, the two, and, and I changed it. Changed it. I didn't change 90%, 90%, but George, you're absolutely, absolutely right. right. From, From now, now on, writing speeches, speeches would be so easy. So easy. Um, the, um, other the other thing is thing about, is about uh, the soul. Uh, the soul. Uh, uh, Professor Poor has gone, but, uh, but uh, he's also he's from the GSD. We, we um, had, um, a had a project of writing, writing the university, the university anthem, anthem after, after, after it's been around, around for 30, for 30 years. years. So we started, so we started with the Putonga version, version, which is the, which base, is the base, and then we, and then we came, came up with a Cantonese, Cantonese version, version with the same, with the same theme, theme and same and elements. elements. The English version was so difficult because Chinese was a few words you have you have, you have to use, use like, like 20, lines 20 lines in English, in to, English say to say it. So, so Ika helped, helped and put it, and put through, it through, put the Chinese, put the Chinese through GPT, uh, 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 chat uh, GPT, uh, and came up with a version. version. We looked at we it, looked at it, it has, it all, has the all the words. But you're right, but you're there's, right, no, there's soul, no, soul, no passion. No passion. And, and we actually, we actually we wrote, it. wrote it. So, so it, that's not. That's uh, not uh, uh, everybody uh, thinks that we thinks use that we uh, AI to do AI it, to but, do it's but it's human. It's human. Um, um, my, my, I like all, I like the, all, the, uh, all the points all the about, points about uh, speed, uh, speed, efficiency. efficiency. I, I fear, fear loss of loss jobs. Of jobs. This, this, I mentioned, I mentioned Jeffrey, Jeffrey Hinton, Hinton when, he, when he, resigned he resigned from Google. From Google. He said he, said he, want he wants the world, the world that, that the development, the development of, AI of AI at this speed, at this speed might, destroy might destroy human beings. Human beings. I am scared. scared. But while, but while I'm, scared, I'm scared, I want to I embrace, embrace new, technology new technology and I want to learn to more, learn about, more it. about it. What do we, what do, we do about, about ethics? ethics? Uh, integrity, uh, integrity and humanity. And humanity. I, want I want the educators, educators as, well as well as the company, as company executives, executives to tell us, to tell us um, um, what are you going to do with your, your students, students as well as, as, well your, as your employees. employees. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, maybe let maybe me, let me offer, some offer some quick uh, uh, comments in comments reaction to what you said. What you said. I think, uh, I think uh, human uh, beings uh, uh, over generations, generations have been worried. Have been worried. I, mean, I mean, they welcome new technology, technology but at the same time, the same time they're worried. They worried. Because, because uh, new, uh, new technology can technology challenge, can challenge a, lot a lot of the modus operandi. operandi. I remember several decades ago, last century, when the TV became popular. And people are so worried about the impact of TV on everyday life. So, so I think, I think uh, uh, this is, this is normal. normal. But the most, but the important, most important thing is when the human beings, human beings are capable, are capable of, reflecting of reflecting on technology, on technology. How, do you how do you interact with technology, with technology? that you are not enslaved by it. By it. You are actually you are able, to able to make sense, make sense make, uh, uh, use, of use of technology. And that comes, and that back, comes back to ethics, values, right and wrong, what we want the world to be. And, uh, and that's uh, why that's critical why thinking, thinking is what, um, what um, uh, Carly, uh, Carly said, uh, said uh, is, important. is important. And we need, and to, we need inculcate to inculcate in the younger generation, the, younger generation the, the, cap the, capacity the capacity to reflect, to think. To think. And to solve problems. Ultimately, it's about solving problems, ultimately ultimately about solving problems, about solving problems that, we that we face on a day-to-day -day uh, basis. Uh, basis. And, uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, in order to master the technology, we need to understand the technology. So that's why, so that's we, why we can't afford can't our afford younger, generation younger generation to be, to be AI, AI illiterate. illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I think I, as I long think as, as this fear factor, factor stay, stay with human, with human being, being, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Um, um, when I was, when in, I was in, in investment banking, banking obviously, obviously, we were very, we were very driven, driven, driven to get to a lot get of a deals, lot of do deals, things that you can cross the line. And I always and I have always one or two people, people on my people team who team just worry, who just about, worry about, about all sorts of things, sorts of things and make sure, that, make sure it that it goes through that, through that two or three two people, or three people so, that, so that, you know, you know we don't we cross, don't the, cross line. the line. Um, um, the question, the question is, how is how you 
do this, do this. Uh, to uh, institutionalize, institutionalize it, which, is, which, is, which means this is something that the government needs to do, and, and obviously and when you talk about government, which government, which government, which government, right? We, right. You know, the world, the world, we don't have a world government, and each one might have a different view about how far you can go. But at the end of the day, if you take out the institution, then really, Ethics, ethics uh, where, uh, where you know, the, the, yeah, ethics, yeah, ethics is so ethics important is so in technology, in technology and, make and make sure that now, now when you when teach, you uh, teach uh, software, engineer, software engineer, you also you teach also them ethics. Them ethics. Just like, just like uh, business, business school now school teaching, now teaching uh, business, uh, business student ethics, student ethics and, and not cross, not the, cross line. the line. Yeah, I, I, I need also who would like to have some response to Edith, your question. Very important question. Um, that's, and why, that's why, um, um, indeed, not, indeed not just now, a couple of years, years ago, at, ago that time, at that time, our CEO Sanatia, indeed, indeed already, already published, published a book, we call it Responsible, Responsible AI, AI, maybe I can share with you guys the e-version. Basically, Basically what, this what this Responsible, Responsible AI, AI means, means, it covers, it covers six, six principles. Principle. This six principles is how I memorize this, fair PT, fair, the first one is fairness. Accountability, accountability, inclusive, inclusive um, um, respons uh, responsibility, responsibility um, um, privacy, privacy and security, and, security and, transparency. and transparency. And, and with, with this, this principle, principle in, mind, in mind, then how, then we, how make we make it happen, it happen. It's, a it's a combination of, of technology, technology and, and people training. People training. Technology, technology, that is, that is when, when of, course of course, Microsoft, Microsoft uh, we, are and we are company provide cloud service, AI service, AI service then, we then we make sure, sure the cloud the platform, platform which, which we provide to our, to our customer, customer, we need we to have, have that capability. For example, right now, because we definitely we have ChatGPT, we have OpenAI, on, on our, our platform. platform. When customers, when customers subscribe, subscribe it, definitely, definitely we'll have a chance have a transparency, transparency knocks knocks for the customer. Make them, Let them understand what AI can, AI can do, what AI, AI cannot, cannot do. do. And from and the security, from the security perspective, perspective, definitely, definitely we, need we need to have different, to have different solutions, solutions to, to make sure, make sure it meets the, meet the security requirement as well as in the cloud platform. We need to conform to the privacy standards of the locations. And at the same time, also needs some sort of of filtering, filtering capabilities, capabilities so that so for that different for enterprise, enterprise, maybe they have different, different things thing they need to filter, filter out. out. This is the, this reason. Is the reason. Of course, of when, course when I think the, I think the open, open, when open when open AI launched launch GPT, GPT to the market, to the market it is for it is consumer, consumer market, market and from, and from for, us, for us and Microsoft, and Microsoft in Hong Kong when we launch, we say that we launched the enterprise version. Basically, it's to provide all this capability. This is indeed also also we hope that on one hand, of course, from the education perspective, we need to we educate, need to educate our, our, our technical, technical people or our, our employees, employee, but on the but technology, on the technology side, side, we need to, we need to ensure, ensure our cloud platform provide this one. one. And at the and same at time, the same indeed, time indeed, from the education, education perspective, a couple of years, years ago, years ago um, um, Microsoft, Microsoft and corporate, corporate, and we launched we launch AI Business School together with Insert School from US and with different curricula. And one of the key curricula is about responsible AI, and we learned this AI business school in Hong Kong. In, indeed, we also have collaboration with different universities in Hong Kong. Of course, we collaborate with Hong Kong UST Business School. And right now, Hong Kong UST Business School already include this AI business school as one of the selective curriculum um, uh, in, uh, in the MBA program. I think this is some, and right now, I think with um, the popularity of AI, if you ask me, I think not just MBA program, Indeed, for educators, can uh, need to consider maybe this is some of the fundamental uh, ethic and mindset we need to cultivate um, uh, the the young children <laughs> when they are when they start their uh, learning. Yeah. Allow me to add, add a point to yeah, to sure. this and, and change the subject a little bit to sustainability. I was in a pan uh, uh, conference once talking about sustainability. And we had Dr. Gr uh, Alan Greenspan say, saying, there is no way um, that we will be able to deal with this because there's no economic model that will support, support us taking care of sustainability. Um, and also, because we are selfish human beings, we care about our children, our grandchildren. Mm -hmm. But our grandchildren, not Anthony's grandchildren, not Raymond's grandchildren, 
Uh, and so at the end of the day, if we all base on that model without thinking beyond that, whether we, we talk about it as ethics or this uh, externality that you know, a government and NGO need to deal with, then you know, we ha can have a negative future. Thank you so much. Excellent panel. If I can borrow a little bit more time, I see a lot of hands raised. Yeah, and uh, so just let us know when we should stop, okay? Otherwise, I'll entertain questions. So I do see hand here, hand here, and then there. Okay, let's start with uh, Dr. Susan Scalfini. Yeah. And FWE is how do we get how do we get people like you talking to the education researchers, the policymakers, so that they understand we've got to stop doing it the way we've always done it, and instead make sure that we're developing from the youngest children all the way through with the ethics and the critical thinking skills that are going to be so critical. But if you're not saying it to them. They won't listen to educators saying we need to do it differently. You've got to be the ones who are making this point, not just in Hong Kong, but around the world. And Microsoft has a great opportunity worldwide to do this, but it's going to be absolutely critical that we get to the educators and change their thinking about what education should be for, you, for our future. Okay, thanks. I think what we'll do is that we let all the questioners give us okay. the questions and then Okay. Three of you. So Yan Lao Shi, and then, yeah. then thank there. You. Okay, yeah. uh, thank you uh, so much, and uh, give us a uh, very inspection, the uh, session. I want to ask uh, Raymond and also the Professor uh, Han Chun, and uh, both of you, University of Pennsylvania trustee, and. Um, our university, I came from University of Pennsylvania, but as a trustee, how do you feel? Today's American university, especially my university, and uh, what is connection you really have to influence our president and uh, to make sure our university connect with the world? So my feeling is we must make a change. We need your leadership. We need the business leaders to go back to our university and to make the really seriously change between the education leaders uh, <laughs> with the business leaders. And because, um, and if we don't do that, our Ivy League school will lose our name. And I really care about that. So, and I would like your advice. What uh, you would like to tell our president? We'll entertain one more question, and then, yeah. The lady, oh, oh okay, fine, go ahead. Cool, uh, thanks for the amazing panel, and uh, I'm Tony, one of the young leaders here. So uh, we do have like uh, more than 600 members and office in six different countries. And uh, I find like uh, this topic is truly important, like mingling the global team are truly hard for us, mainly because of the culture difference. And in the old way, like we shift the workforce, like we, we send in the local talents to oversee factories. Two decades ago, uh, started by Toyota, Fuyao, and now by Apple and TSMC. But we never do good in creating a real global team. So my question for the panelists is, how can enterprises better engage the global, global talents? Thank you. That's it, all right. So. Uh, we have a current pen trustee here, George, and then of course Professor Zheng, mm -hmm. who is really one of Hong Kong's leading educationists and used to be uh, head of universities and all that. Maybe you can handle the questions, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we'll close up. If Kali, you have something to contribute, you always have something to contribute, <laughs> but we're running out of time. So let's go that way, right. yeah. Maybe George. Right. Um, Rather than specifically addressing your question about wh whether you know University of Pennsylvania, since uh, um, President Biden did, did uh, uh, spend a little bit of time with us, um, and then the pre 
present graduate from, from, from our university. Um, but um, I, I think the key is when we educate students, um, that four years, some of us remember the parties. Some of us remembers the books. Um, a lot of us will remember our friends. And it's actually so important that we put the right people together as a group because I think if I look back, I remember my friends from university more than what I studied. Um, and so recruitment, how we put the, 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 the student body together is so critical. Uh, I, we actually just had a, a session yesterday with the, uh, our new deans of admission talking exactly about that. And the diversity of people that we put into that university so that they actually can appreciate different views becomes important because then they continue to have that connection. And so, um, yes, it's very important, the content. Um, I'm sorry to say that uh, you know, now I actually did not remember what my professor teach me anymore. <laughs> Um, but it, it is that you know, circle that you build, that network you build. And, and that's where I think the university make a lot, you know, it's not, not just so someone have the highest uh, GMAT score or, or, or SAT score and you bring them in. It's more than that. And I think, uh, you know, the, um, certainly a lot of the universities spend a lot of effort in the, ed in the interview of, you know, who sh should get in. And I think some, some are less so. So I would encourage um, university to spend more time about how to put a class together. Thanks. George, we're out of time, but we let the educator have the last one. <laughs> I'll try to, to be very brief. I think uh, it's important that universities uh, start a process of reflection because uh, sometimes, uh, because of rapid uh, change, advancement in technology, and right now, I mean, even in uh, high schools, primary schools, we are talking about STEM education, but there, there should be a context for STEM education, and that context cannot be detached from the humanities, philosophy, ideas, creativity. So we, we need to rebalance education. I remember just maybe two years ago, uh, or less than that, UNESCO published a report about reimagining the future of education. And the message is that we should try to reform education more extensively so that we, we, we try to repair past injustices, try to contribute to human progress. Because in as much as we are having rapid advancement in technology, at the same time we feel at, at every now and then that somehow we are getting backward. Right? So I think we need really to have uh, a more uh, fundamental we think. And regarding uh, globalizing the workforce, as I said earlier in my presentation, it's not just about the ratio, the cosmopolitan composition of the workforce. It's also about the mindset. I mean, when we say well, you are local, that doesn't mean that local cannot have a global outlook, a global mindset. And then it comes to the, the key question of what is meant by global? And in my view, we are not in a one world global. We are in a multi-world global, global north, global south, east and west, developing and develop. I mean, there's so many dimensions to look at the global. And I think for, whether for business or for society to, to operate, it's essential that our citizens, our younger generation, they appreciate that kind of diversity. Mm -hmm. Diversity may bring about conflict. Mm. So how to handle conflict tension is also a very important uh, quality of the workforce. Thank you very much. Brilliant panel. And yes. uh, I guess remember Socrates and Confucius. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you guys very much. What a great and insightful panel. Yeah. So let's welcome moderator for our next session, which is session three, Innovative Curriculum Models for the Global Competency in Business Schools. So uh, let's welcome the panelists, uh, starting with Ms. Arnie Karajian, oh. the senior prof. Just before that, 
our moderator, apologies, the Dr. Victor Lee, former chief executive of Hong Kong Management Association. Apologies. <laughs> Please, Not a ahead. problem. So, Ms. Arnie Karajia, may I welcome you again to the stage. Uh, she's the Senior Portfolio Director and Executive Education at Harvard Business School. Uh, and she's also the Steering Committee Member of FWE. And now let's welcome Professor Stephen Xu, who is the Associate Dean of Business and Management MBA programs of Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And also who will be joining us online is Professor Sergio Natasian, the Senior Vice Dean of, for Innovation and Global Initiative from Wharton um, University of Pennsylvania. So I'll give the stage and the mic to you. Let's enjoy the conversation there. Thank you, there Thank you so on. much. Thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I understand it is the last session before lunch. I hope you can bear with us for 30 minutes, a bit more, uh, Edith. Uh, this topic is very important. While we are going to exchange ideas about innovative curriculum models for global competence in business schools, as we all know, today's society is hugely challenged by the rapid change of the global economy and the unprecedented development of innovative technologies. And it is further complicated by the urgent call for sustainability in all concerning particularly social, environmental, and the business itself. So I must say this panel session is not only timely, but also never, never more critical. Yes, today I'm very pleased to have invited three distinguished speakers to share with us their ideas. They are Ani Karajan from Harvard Business School, Stephen Shi from Hong Kong UST, and Shagur Natishan from Wharton School of UPenn. And today we only have two speakers with us, and yet we have Natishan from the US. Welcome, Natishan. So perhaps I would organize this uh, session in the following manner. First of all, I would like to introduce each of the speakers uh, to share with us, let's say, for no more than 10 minutes because the time is really not sufficient. And then we have kind of uh, questions that we want to answer. So this is very much like free exchange. And uh, I will open up the floor for Q&A at the end. First of all, um, Ani. Ani Kearney is a Senior Portfolio Director, Executive Education of Harvard Business School and a member of Forum for World Education Steering Committee. Ani is a global connector and trusted advisor to business leaders across the globe. He has spent three decades at Harvard Business School working with leading organizations to help them develop their leadership team. Ani has extensive experience working in many countries, Africa, China, India, Latin America, and has focused on expanding the Harvard Business School footprint in all these locations. As a senior portfolio director, Ani works with faculty academic thought leaders to design and oversee executive education programs, which focus on leadership development. She also serves on non-profit boards which focus on advancing women and making education more accessible to all communities. And she's pretty talented in languages. She speaks Armenian, Spanish, and of course, English. So welcome, Ani. Thank you, thank you very much. It's really, really good to be here with you all. It's been nine years and thanks to Dr. Chang Davis, I'm back in China, in Hong Kong. Um, thank you, thank you so much for your kind words. We are at a critical inflection point in the world. We're at a time where, with rapid change, global shifts, unpredictable outcomes in various geopolitical situations and environments, the world needs leaders. The world now, more than ever, needs leaders with their true moral compass, they need people like everyone that's sitting in this room. Your passion for education and enabling your community and 
bringing folks into the conversation of the critical business issues, right? Because leadership is about enabling your team, enabling your resources, guiding them in a wise way. Back in the day when organizations had a strategy and you could plan for multiple years, a really timelines have shortened, technology has enabled all of us to be more connected. But one thing for sure, trust me, we need more true leaders with a moral compass. It's an urgent call. And as we think about it, business schools, just let me give you a little bit of a background in, in Harvard Business School and in executive education. So I sit in the professional education space. We have the MBA program, we have doctoral programs, we have the publishing business that makes the IP from the school uh, available more globally. I think eight million cases are sold to other business schools, and that's important to the organization. So we're one school, one graduate school of 11 at the university. We're totally self-funded, and that is important for you to remember. The school is totally self-funded. We are supporting the research with the publishing business and executive education business and our wonderful alums globally who feel very passionate about giving back. So self-sustained. I work in a space called executive education, which is professional education. We only have the MBA, the doctoral programs. So in the work that I do, and my friend to my right yeah. talked about, is that it's really brought me into companies. What we're doing in the executive education space is creating programs, designing programs at various inflection points in leaders' careers. So back in the day when you went to school and that's all you had to do, you could just pause because you had that degree, you could put it on the wall and you were set. It's no longer the way for the executives of the future to be able to anticipate, to contribute. The key goal here is education now has to be in stages, in professional development stages. It has to be relevant. You have to master, but you also need to totally have empathy. You need to be able to work in a global environment. And we just saw that. You know, We have more technology now, but technology alone does not create the community you need. As a leader, the more senior you become, the more isolated you are. You need trusted collabor collaborative partners. Because at the end of the day, at schools, we're designing content to be relevant in the future. But you do have to step back into the program and you do have to fill in your gaps. Empathy, um, emotional intelligence are all key. We can teach you the core topics in, in any business school, right? Strategy, innovation, uh, leadership. But what really I think is key for leaders is to have more empathy and to enable their teams. So I'm going to stop here. Okay. And in the interest of letting my fellow panelists take over, but the design critical, and we'll talk a little bit more when we get to the next okay. stage. Okay, fantastic, Anne. Thank you very much. Yeah. Perhaps uh, because uh, Stephen is here with us, so I would like to introduce Stephen uh, before you. Um, Stephen Kearney is Associate Dean of Bus Business and Management for the MBA programs and uh, Adjunct Professor of Management at the Hong Kong uh, UST. Prior to joining HKUST, Stephen was a partner at Ban and Company. In addition to serving clients, he led the Asia Pacific Organization practice and was executive vice president of learning and development. Stephen has been interviewed by a, a number of uh, top journals like The Economist, CNBC, The New York Times, South China, South China Morning Post, and Wall Street Journal. And he, he has written for Harvard Business Review China. Stephen is a board member of Junior Achievement China. He has an MBA from UCLA Anderson School of Management and an AB degree in economics from Princeton. So Stephen, could you share with us your ideas about curriculum, globalization, and so forth and so on? Yeah, thank you, Victor, for the introduction. Um, so delighted to be here. And you know, uh, I also used ChatGPT to prepare for this. But I, I took a different approach. You know, my, my theory was that 
chat GPT is all about predicting what the most obvious likely word to extend in these large language models is. So I said, I'm gonna read chat GPT and I'm gonna force myself to say something different. <laughs> something that, you know, at least in the first prompt with chat GPT doesn't come up. So uh, three things I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, one is what are the, you know, what are the critical skills for the future business schools need to be developing in their graduates? We've talked a lot about the changes, the, you know, global changes, um, technology changes, all of that. What are the skills? What's a good case study of developing global competencies in students? Um, and I'll share something that we're doing at HKUST. And then the third is what can business schools do in the future to really lead the way and help prepare graduates uh, for, for making a positive impact, being the moral, ethical leaders that we've been talking about. So number one, um, what is the most critical skill? I think we've talked about things like empathy, EQ, uh, EQ and IQ, all very important in, in the changing world, right? As we say, the future of work is gonna be more human, not less. I think that's fundamentally true, even as AI becomes more and more important. Now, the most critical skill, though, that I, I work with, on, with my students on and that I think business schools need to do even more on is helping students learn how to manage their careers, right? You think about all the changes we talked about. You know, jobs are gonna change, companies will go bankrupt, new companies will start up, global economies, geopolitics, all of that, right? It's very unpredictable now. And the only thing that we as business schools can do is to prepare our students to understand what their personal strengths are and how they can place themselves in the place where they can make a positive impact and a contribution to their, their companies and through their companies to their customers and broader society. Very, very important. Um, it's something that I think has been under-invested by many universities over the years. But in this time of change, in this time of turbulence, in this time of AI, you know, helping people really understand their own careers, how can they make a positive impact, where should they, you know, how do they, we talked about losing jobs. It's certainly a, a worry for many people, but fundamentally, in a market economy, the employee has got to go figure out how are they going to persuade an employer that they can add value. So that's one of the things I work with our MBA students on. Number two, a case study on global curriculum and um, you know, what we can do. So we, we, we believe strongly in a global world in the importance of alliances. Um, our business school is part of the Global Network of Advanced Management. Fascinating concept. I, I give a lot of credit to Professor Ted Snyder at Yale for kicking this off. Uh, 10 years ago, you know, his concept was to get 30 of the business schools around the world, 32 schools now, 32 schools in 29 different countries, and to informally work together, just to talk, to compare notes, to look for opportunities to collaborate, and to bring the best of both globalization, the best of, you know, those, the, the, the transnational insights, but also having a strong sense of local communities based on where all of those business schools are. So a, a few example initiatives that have come out of this, which are really good for our students, um, one would be uh, something called the Global Network Week. And for one week a year, we're able to have students from our university go to any of the other 30 universities we're partnered with, and we also bring their students to our university. So when they come to Hong Kong, we have one of our faculty talk about the past, present, and future of business in Hong Kong. And they're able to provide a very nuanced understanding of what's happening in Hong Kong to students from a variety of different countries. Great learning environment um, for that. Or, you know, one that I'm excited about, I would love to go on, you know, one of our partner universities in Brazil is taking students to the Amazon. And they're gonna spend a week there really looking at sustainability issues, understanding, you know, climate change, not just you know, the science of it, but understanding the, the local um, uh, issues with the, the native population there and all of the nonprofits working there. So these type of you know, global exchanges through a network like Global Network of Advanced Management, I think are, are really valuable for developing those global competencies. Then the, the third point is on the, um, you know, what should business schools be doing in the future, right? What, what can we do to um, make the impact that we need to make? 
Um, and I, I firmly believe that you know, management education should really be viewed as a public good, not necessarily a private good. Um, as we all know, businesses are becoming more important. It's not just about making money, it's about really contributing to society. So the focus that I think about is how do we help students learn how to get things done, right? We talk a lot about things like we need to do the right thing, right? We need to have ethics, we need to have a, you know, people who are concerned about the climate. That's very true. But the reality is, unless our students are savvy enough and sophisticated enough to implement stuff, to get stuff done, to understand the differences in local environments, to understand company politics, to understand what it takes to really lead change, right? We can, we can talk about good intentions, but we're not gonna get stuff done. So it's really about teaching students to be practical, to um, have that uh, desire to, to get things done. So that's um, a few thoughts. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm personally energized in these conversations by the questions from the audience. So looking forward to having a few good questions. Yeah, actually we, we would like to hear more questions from the audience so that we can in more interactive uh, sharing session rather than just one way going forward. Uh, last but not, lot, but not the least, I would like to invite, uh, I would like to introduce Professor Shagu Latisson. Now being in the US, I think in Seattle, right? Um, uh, right, okay. He's currently Senior Vice Dean for Innovation and Global Initiatives, as well as a Bani Professor of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Wharton School, UPenn. He received his bachelor and master's degrees in computer science and electrical engineering from Moscow Institute of Electronic Technology. And after working for a number of years for Motorola and Lucent Technologies, he then received his MSc and PhD in operations management from the US of Rochester in Rochester, New York State. His current research is focused on business model innovation and operational excellence. And he has worked for these topics with numerous government and Fortune 500 organizations, including like Federa Federal Aviation Administration in the US, Government of Singapore, Lockheed Martin, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's, Rolls-Royce, Comcast, Expedia, and the US Air Force. He himself is also an active angel investor and a limited partner in several venture capital funds. He currently works with Amazon.com as Amazon's scholar in the core AI unit, and is also advising Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on digital education strategies. He has been a recipient of several teaching awards for delivering MBA and EMBA, class, EMBA classes at the Warden School and INSEAD. He has authored and co-authored a number of great publications in prominent management journals, including Management Science, Marketing Science, Operations Research, and Harvard Business Review. His latest book now, his latest book is The Risk Driven Business Model. Four questions that would defy your company was published by Harvard Business Press in 2014, and it received 2015 SCM Business Book Award for Business Theory. Remember, buying this book, right? So please, your turn.
Okay, thank you so much. Uh, now, I, after hearing uh, the panelists uh, sharing their experience, I think I would like to focus on two things. Number one is about, I, 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 I like Stephen's comment about business education, management education is not for private good. It's also for public good. I think it's so important because business has money, has power, has everything. If they don't do anything about public, who can? Right? So we can do, but not as much as the business can do. Now, we have been uh, talking about sustainability and uh, equality, diversity, and inclusiveness. Could you, or anyone you could share with us any case studies that you incorporate these so critical elements into your curriculum so that now managers coming out from the business school are ready, are well prepared to tackle the challenge? in the modern world. Um, perhaps, Stephen, you want to start with? Uh, sure, sure. And I'll, I'll go back to some of the examples I described, um, because when we talk about things like sustainability, inclusiveness, there are a lot of, it's complicated now to be an executive, right? Many of you here, we had other CEOs on, on the earlier panels, right? It's, it's more complicated than ever. You've got to deliver the bottom line, you've got to generate economic returns, but then you've also got to meet the expectations on environment, on social diversity, all of this, right? And the, the way that I think about this is we just need to develop more effective executives. So how do we do that? On climate change, it's doing the things like the, the partnership we have with other universities around the world and having our students go to places like Brazil, go to, you know, take an online course from a university in Africa, Ghana, and learn about development economics in Ghana from professors who are there, right? And giving them that appreciation of the complexities, right? Not just at this kind of global level, but really what happens at the local domestic level in different, different um, nations around the world. So that gives them that sophistication and the savvy that they can then go and get stuff done, right? So, you know, I, we, we definitely have more in our curriculum nowadays about ESG and so forth, but just as important is continuing to really help people understand finance, accounting, management, marketing, right? Because that skill set is what gives them the ability to, to go out and get stuff done and really make an impact. Great, thank you. Ani? Yes, our, our students, our MBA students, all of them after the first year have to do a global visit somewhere. Uh, the students that we have in the MBA program 60%, let's say, come from North America. The other 40 are totally global, about 1,000 students. In executive education, it's reverse. So 75% of our executives come from outside of North America and 25 from North America. So it's, I can have a program cohort that has 48 different countries, many different industries. I think the global perspective, understanding Ghana or Brazil and what's happening, really, really key to show and also to place the students in the field, right? Field-based education. Our cases are anchored around a decision point a firm has. We've been trying to accelerate the content around um, DEI diversity and inclusion, around sustainability, yeah. around governance. And, you know, we have over 350 research associates that mm -hmm. work with about 250 faculty. So the content's evolving, but we also bring speakers in and host conferences around key topics. At the end of the day, the business leaders are responsible for the firm bottom line, but also for their community and society and doing good, right? The mission of the school is to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. And we try to align ourselves in every program to that mission. It's core. It's core. All right, OK. Yes, your turn, Professor Natison.
preaching diversity, you have to stop with yourself. You have to have a very, right. very diverse class uh, by country, by gender, by and many other uh, dimensional diversity. So that's uh, that's one initiative. Um, I also want to mention uh, another great initiative that we have, which is actually for high school uh, and an undergraduate program. So uh, some of our uh, some of our prominent alumni came to us uh, from Wall Street banks, and they told us, "Look, we have a problem. We cannot hire um, uh, minority executives or minority employees, and because they just don't exist. Minority uh, minority students in the undergraduate programs that they study, they just don't know about the world of finance. Nobody in their families has ever had a career in finance." Um, and so they don't even know that those finances exist. They have no idea how much money you can be making in those uh, in those careers. So so they came to us and they said, look, let's work together to educate undergraduate students in historically black colleges and universities across the United States about careers in finance. Um, and uh, the uh, what we created together, we call it Out Finance Institute. Uh, it's it's an institute about alternative finance where we, as Wacom, go to historically black colleges and universities and we educate students about careers in alternative finance. We educate them, we give them basics of alternative finance and then Wall Street banks guarantee them internships so that at the end of this internship they have both knowledge and experience in alternative finance and then they go and get jobs. Uh, in Wall Street. So we are kind of trying to solve this problem at the root where you can be looking for these diverse uh, employees, but they just don't exist. So unless you can create them, um, they, will not, uh, they just will not exist. So you have to start very early in this diverse. All right, okay. Now, I also have a second concern about the curriculum. I want to start with you. You mentioned um, Warner School is now doing a lot of work with high schools because you want the young, younger generation to get to know more about finance, accounting, IT, whatsoever, so that they are well prepared to go to the workforce in the future. Yet, conventional wisdom is that those who do not have business experience won't be able to appreciate you know, what uh, finance is about, accounting, and also, and so forth and so on. All other business practice, we've done really working for some years. And I'm sure that some of the top business school, they require at least two or some years of experience before being admitted. It's kind of a conflicting message. Now, I may, <laughs> I may say that I would like to take this opportunity to hear our expert as well as the, as well as the audience so that, you know, we got to know quite clearly how we're going to move forward as far as promoting management education across the board, regardless of the age and the experience. So could you, can I start with you first? Please. I need to fire my equity team 
All right. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Can I share? All right, Stephen. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this resonates, right? Early education on business, I think, makes a big difference. You know, when I was in middle school, um, we had a, a, a guest speaker come in from an organization called Junior Achievement. And that kind of lit my interest in entrepreneurship, business. Um, and as Victor mentioned, I, I'm on the board of Junior Achievement China. And I'm just so excited about the work that they do with schools around China, you know, helping students, you know, take part in competitions, um, bringing in a lot of corporate, um, you know, speakers from different companies to visit schools, hosting students at corporations. It's just yeah. a terrific model. And yeah. the more we can do to help young students understand about this right. and how they can, you know, make an impact, I think it's great. Lovely. Yeah, Ani, I would like you to speak about Harvard Business School. <laughs> Sure, what are we doing at Harvard? A lot. Uh, we have a program, a summer uh, program for high school students to introduce them to the world of business. We also have a program two plus two. If you are interested in the school but will not have any work experience, what will happen is you'll apply to the MBA program, you'll be admitted, and the team at uh, MBA will guide you for the next two years, help you get your first job, coach you. So we are very much focused on underrepresented right. students and mm -hmm. earlier. Now, my dream would be to start at middle school, so I think we have a lot to learn from Wharton, so I'll be Googling after this session. <laughs> but I think early intervention. But the challenge, I think, becomes is if somebody in the family has not gone through the experience, how do you take the first step? Right, to be able to enable communities to thrive. There's always a first in a community, first in a generation. What can we do at our universities to make sure we are more accessible? I remember when I was working in Africa, right before the latest um, global challenges, you know, just getting internet in certain places or in Armenia in certain villages, I think it is important, technology needs to be leveraged, but power is an issue in South Africa today in parts of India, certain hours of a day. So uh, we have huge challenges, yeah. but at schools yeah. we have to make ourselves available. Absolutely. And at a reasonable cost as right. well, right? And we have scholarships, by the way. So when right. somebody says, I wanna to go to Harvard, we don't have money, I say, you know what, you apply, you get in, and Harvard will find a way to Make can sure do. you yeah. can attend. Can yeah. do. Right, can absolutely. Do. Uh, Edith, could I ask you to give us five more minutes? I understand that. All right. So I would like to invite uh, any questions or ideas. Whatever you want to share with us, I welcome. Um, as far, okay, yep. The gentleman at the back. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for wonderful sharing. Uh, I like the idea of um, le leaders uh, who have a very strong moral compass, uh, wanting to do the right things and um, actually making it happen. Um, so I'm wondering what your advice and views would be possible pathways um, that we can um, nurture more of these leaders. Um, and how do we encourage um, more of these leaders, especially across cultures, to come together to address the challenges that we see in the world today? All right, great. Uh, could I start with Stephen? Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, it's I, I, so definitely a huge priority and a huge need for for this. Um, you know, my my belief is that the vast majority of executives want to do the right thing. And it's really about giving them the skills and business and management capabilities so that they can deliver on their economic objectives while also being able to do the right thing. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's definitely an important place for things, you know, discussions about ethics and about, um, you know, what the right goal should be from an ESG perspective. 
Um, but I think it's really important to move from that level and get into the complexities of implementation and the complexities of what does it really take to solve problems. Um, and so I, I, I use a two by two sometimes with students where I think about, you know, types of, types of um, executives, right? You, you've got one dimension which is around, you know, are you focused on um, contributing to society, right? So are you thinking about that in addition to uh, your, own, your own bottom line? But then the other dimension is, do you have the, the, the savvy, the sophistication, the capabilities to get stuff done, right? And so you, if you think about a two by two like that, you wanna be in that box where you're thinking about societal goals, but you've also got the, the savvy and the sophistication to go and implement stuff. And it's really important not to lose sight that it's, it's, it's hard to do that, right? So, like, I mean, I have a lot of empathy for, for you know, executives who are leading companies and facing all these pressures. Because to be able to, you know, meet the standards that, that we all have of them, very, very tough job in the world. And that's why I, I come back to the point about management education as a public good. I, I believe, you know, now that we've sort of come full circle, right, and we've agreed that the purpose of a corporation is not just about shareholder value, that management education itself needs to be funded more and more as a public good. The impact of a leader on their employees, their organization, the impact of a leader on their customers, their stakeholders, right? This management education is a public good that needs to be funded like a public good. All right, good, Ani. Just one comment. When you educate one, you lift more than one, right? You lift more than one. Remember that. At the end of the day, I think at our schools, we can teach the fundamentals, you know, all the core topics around managing a firm and put you in situations where you're going to learn how to show judgment, how to show empathy, how to make sure that you're inclusive. There's a lot of challenges these days. When you, you know, ask senior leaders in firms, what keeps you up at night? I love asking that, right? Edith and I were talking about what keeps you up at night. You know what most of them say to me? We need leaders, leadership pipeline, right? We need leaders with a moral compass because strategy, you can hire a firm, but you need people who can implement that strategy. Absolutely. You can help lift society, mm, yep. but you better have a good public-private yep. partnership. Your firm better have good governance, right? In some of these organizations in certain parts of the world, you say, who's on your board? You learn a lot by who's sitting on someone's board, right? right. Public-private partnership, inner city partnership, all huge. Because again, education is the key. I'm a beneficiary of you know, education in the US, but together, imagine what we can do, yeah. right? All right? It's every opportunity. Fantastic. So I still would like to have Professor Mattison's comment about these uh, questions. Great question from Edward. Accessible for everyone who cannot come to Philadelphia, who cannot afford our 
All right, great. Now, I think uh, we, I think the time is up. Last one, okay, quick. All right. How, oh, sorry, no, no, no. <laughs> tweak my voice a little bit now. Um, I was wondering on the on the demand side, people who are doing the hiring, right? So the hiring these great global citizens that you're churning out and, and you know inculcating with, with great ideals and tools, you know ethics, etc. I wonder how are you working with them in terms of the type of involvement for them to continue to reinforce and perpetuate the great teachings that you're instilling, right, in these uh, MBA students when they go out in the real world. How are they reinforcing working with the, the you know the, the firms the, the the leaders of those firms that they're being hired at is my question. No, sorry. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. Alongside that, I'm so sorry. In terms of report cards, like if we were to really assess, right? So I have principles here that we talk about report cards, right? This is how we evaluate our students. So if there's one extra element you would add to a high school student's report card, say for example, what would that be? Okay, just one minute from me, yeah? <laughs> Steven. <laughs> one minute, okay. Well, what I would add to the report card would be um, something very explicit about listening skills, um, right? Just in, you know, in the complex world, unless you really listen and understand other people, you're not gonna be able to get it. Um, corporate recruiters, I can talk a lot about. I used to lead, I used to recruit a lot of MBAs. Um, and, but the, the short answer there is we work very closely with our alumni after they graduate to kind of continue to engage on, you know, how, how do we all be more effective leaders? I'd add communication because it's so important in every stage in folks' lives. And at the school, we are so grateful for our alumni who continue to stay engaged in all aspects and placement is not an issue. All right, Professor Nathison yeah. from Seattle. From Seattle. Uh, soft skills in general, but leadership skills specifically. Um, and, and this is especially important for children who don't necessarily know what leadership skills are. Uh, and it's hard to explain to them this concept. Uh, but once you put them, for example, in the right situation, in a simulation, for example, you have a great simulation called Saturn Parable, where you fly to Saturn and your, your spaceship explodes and so on, and not going to give you the rest of it. And you have to get out of this situation. So um, it's not about Saturn, it's all about leadership skills, and that's the most important. Right, right. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. I thank uh, thank you very much for all this uh, wonderful discussion thank and you, sharing. Guys. And honestly, I learned a great deal. Two main themes. One is management education is not just for private, but also public. So number one thing, and number two, learning management necessarily to be very high level. It could be a game, right? Management game. You will bring a lot of fun to the high education as well as high school students. So once again, thank you very much, and I hope uh, to see you around for the rest of the day. Thank you. Let's give a round of applause to our moderator and all our panelists for really thought-provoking discussions. Thank you so much. So now we are getting close to our lunch hours, and I just wanted to do a couple of announcements before we break out for lunch. Uh, first of all, uh, lunch will be served on the ground floor promenade, and you need your batch to, to get your lunch. So make sure you don't forget your batch. And also, you, if you have the headphones, uh, kindly return to, to the stand over there and to make sure that uh, we won't have any missing pieces uh, because they do cost some money. And um, we will be reconvening here again for a keynote speech by the Honorable Christine Choi, who is the uh, Secretary of Education at the Hong Kong SAR, back at 2.15 p.m. at this space right here. So let's have uh, good conversation exchanges over lunch, and it's my, my honor to serve you this morning and have a great session. Thank you.
to the simultaneous interpretation machine, please go to the back and you can get to one um, for both English and Mandarin, because in some of the subsequent sessions, there will be Mandarin and English in one session. Thank you. 我们是等一下会有呃同桥翻译的，所以如果你需要一个耳机，请现在到后面去拿一个，谢谢。Welcome back, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed your lunch and have good networking sessions with your subsequent uh, attendees of the conference. This afternoon, we'll continue an exciting conversation on the transformative power of international education for a better world. I am Anita Ma. I am the current president of the Columbia Alumni Association in Hong Kong. I will be your host this afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. To kick off this event this afternoon, we have the honor of welcoming the Hong Kong Secretary for Education, Hong Kong SAR, Dr. Christine Choi, to be our keynote speaker. Dr. Christine Choi has been engaged in the education sector for over 30 years, and she has been involved in a lot of initiatives that is very important to lead social and educational change. She took part in many important initiatives, such as the Hong Kong Teachers Dream Fund. She also served on the Basic Law, uh, Basic Law Promotion Steering Committee, the Fight Crime Committee, as well as the Commission on Youth. Now may I invite Dr. Christine Choi to come on stage. Thank you. Dear honorable guests, good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to join you all at the regional conference of the 2023 Forum for Well Education here in Hong Kong today, exchanging views on how we have learned from the disruption caused by the pandemic and consider longer term challenge and change. The theme of this conference is the transformative power of international education for a better world. And the section this afternoon will focus on linking industry and education. It is indeed a very timely and imminent issue facing every policymaker around the world, including us in Hong Kong. As innovation and technological advancements sweep through the world, the workplace is undergoing rapid transformation. Major jobs will require entire different skill sets or even become non-existent in the not too, far, not too distant future. While many completely lawful jobs will evolve, it is therefore 
of utmost importance that we should rethink our education strategies and take a proactive approach in equipping our young talents with skills that are relevant and applicable in the future in order to enable our younger generations to realize their potentials and showcase their talents, maintain the competitiveness of our city, and continue to create strong impetus for our future development. The Hong Kong SAR government strongly believes that the prospects of individuals, the well-being of families, the qualities of people, and the progress of civilization all hinge on education. Through, pro, through providing quality and diversified education pathways, we cater for the learning needs of students at different stages and help them become lifelong learners who are victorious and able, with knowledge and insights, a sense of responsibility, a global perspective, positive values and attitudes love for the country and the city, as well as being ready for future challenges and opportunities. Among others, we have been according priority to promoting the vocational and professional education and training, the VPAC pathway as a preferred choice, with a view to enabling young people to acquire work skills for the future apply knowledge in innovation and technology, and critical soft skills for career progression in the new digital age, achieving masters of each trade. In fact, VPAC has always been a key driver of manpower development in Hong Kong. For meeting the needs of the ever-changing economy, we have all along been committed to providing quality, flexible, and diversified study pathways with multiple entry and exit points for young people with different aspirations and abilities through VPAT. To strengthen our efforts in promoting VPAT in a more targeted manner, the chief executive announced in his policy address last year that we will step up our efforts through the strategy of fostering industry institution collaboration and diversified development, adopting a multi-pronged approach at different levels to further promote VPAT as a pathway parallel to conventional academic education, encouraging the alignment of classroom education with industry needs, encouraging collaboration between businesses and education institutions, and providing diversified learning and employment opportunities with a view to enhancing the VPAP progression pathway to nurture more high quality talent with applied skills. We recognize the v that the VPAP pathway comprises education opportunities at different levels of the education system from secondary school diploma qualification to undergraduate studies and beyond, in addition to our ongoing efforts, including enabling our students to have early exposure to VPAT through applied learning subjects. We have been bold in embarking a new endeavors to strengthen the VPAT progression pathway, among others, we have launched a pilot project on the development of applied degree programs, which aims to address the concern about the lack of articulation opportunity at degree level in our education system. Through the pilot project, we support and encourage post-secondary institutions in launching degree programs, which should be equivalent to those of conventional academic degrees in standard and level while applied degrees should have an applied focus, blending theory and practice, provide substantial internships and work-based learning experience, and with strong industry involvement and regulation, thereby preparing graduates for a specific trade or industry readily. We are pleased to note that the first phase of the pilot project has received very positive response from the tertiary sector, the industries, as well as other stakeholders. And the four programs which are in disciplines 
with key manpower lists, mainly, namely nursing, testing and certification, horticulture, arboriculture and landscape management, and gerontology have been successfully launched this year, last year, building on the positive experience and to further promote the concept of applied degrees. We are working with a number of post-secondary institutions to launch the second phase of the pilot project. And the second batch of the applied degree programs are expected to be launched in 2024, the earliest. We are confident that the continued development of applied degrees in Hong Kong will further strengthen the positioning of VPAT at degree level and complement our VPAT progression pathway. In addition, the government had also completed the review on the sub-degree education in Hong Kong, which aims to support our policy to develop the VPAT progression pathway in parallel to the traditional academic pathway. We are pleased to note that as demonstrated in the result of our consultation with stakeholders and the Legislative Council, our community unanimously agreed that there should be a sharper differentiation between the two sub-degree qualifications, which are the associate degree that supports students' articulation to academic degrees and the higher diplomas that have a strong emphasis on VPAP. Taking on board the valuable advice we have received, we have also revamped the design and structure of higher diplomas, such as ensuring the close collaboration between program providers and industry partners at different stage of the design and delivery of the program, such that this curriculum should support the needs of industries providing sufficient work-based or project-based learning and placement opportunities to enable students to apply their knowledge in real-world situation and providing clear information about articulation and progression pathways, relevant industry and professional recognitions, etc., to allow students to learn about the graduation destination. Apart from the various new efforts made within the education system, we are also committed to telling the good stories of Hong Kong and VPAT, in particular after we have overcome the challenges of the pandemic. By organizing an array of events and activities, we strive to enhance the public positive understanding of VPAC and promote its professional image. The Future Skill Community event organized by the Vocational Training Council, VTC, with the support of the government last December was a successful case in Porn to showcase the talent of VPAC students and the opportunities that VPAC may bring about. I'm also thrilled that Hong Kong delegation, which comprised VPAC students from the VTC and other VPAC organizations in Hong Kong, put up a marvelous performance in the World Skill Competition 2022 special edition, which is considered the Skills Olympics, bringing home 13 medals, including one gold and 12 medallions for excellence, which was a really exceptional result. The government will continue to support our young talent to realize their unique gifts and talents and rattle the stars through VPAT. The importance of VPAT is beyond doubt. To enable the success of VPAT development, there are also works to do to assist students to identify their interests, strengths, and weakness, and thereby developing <coughs> a clear, clear mind <coughs> and their aspirations and future development pathway. This self-identification process count on the life planning education. Life planning is an on ongoing and lifelong process for personal fulfillment with different foci at different stage of the lifetime. At the schooling age stage, life planning education is one of the key components in promoting whole, personal, whole person development with the objectives of enabling students' self-understanding 
personal planning and goal setting, as well as self-reflection and revision. And equipping students with the knowledge of various study, career and training pathways, work ethics, and the working world. The key learning elements of life, long, life planning education includes self-understanding and development, career exploration, and career planning and management. We always encourage schools to deliver life planning education and career guidance services, service flexibly through various modes, such as life planning related lessons and workshops, career related experiences, learning activities, individualized career guidance program, etc. With the school timetable or outside school hours, since 2014, we have been providing enhanced support to secondary schools in the implementation of life planning education to better prepare students with the knowledge, skills, and attitude to make informed choice in accordance with their interests, abilities, and orientations in face of the available multiple pathways, including VPAT, upon graduating from secondary schools. To this end, we have adopted a series of measures to support schools in implementing life planning education. These measures include the provision of additional manpower to school, enhancement of professional training for teachers through structural training courses, and thematic sem seminars, development of online resources such as life planning information websites to provide students with update information on different industries and multiple pathways, as well as the handy tools for students to undertake career aptitude assessments and create learning portfolio. Encouragement of greater participation of different sectors of the community in our business school partnership program, BSPP, to provide students with various career exploration activities, etc. As what I have just mentioned, career exploration is one of the key elements of life planning education. We have been collaborating with various business op corporations, government departments, and community organizations through the BSPP to provide students with different diversified career exploration activities, such as workplace visits, career talks, workshops, work experience programs, etc. BSPP leads students out of the classroom so that they can learn about different industries and gain the wider perspective of the career world. Up to now, over 8,800 career exploration activities covering more than 30 industries have been co-organized with more than 500 BSPP partners benefiting more than 1.3 million student participants. This school year, to further widen students' exposure and enhance life planning education, we have launched BSPP 2.0 with more business partners covering more industries. We have been actively liaising with major chambers of commerce, professional bodies, as well as small and medium enterprises to encourage more organizations to join the program. As such, a greater number of variety of career exploration and work experience activities are provided to help students gain a better understanding of the workplace. At, as at April this year, we have successfully recruited more than 100 organizations having newly joined the program. Among the organizations, 20 of them are emerging industries, such as artificial intelligence, 3D printing, biotechnology, and testing and certifications. BSPP 2.0 is expected to provide students with more and a wider range of career exploration activities. Among various career exploration activities, work experiences programs have been well received among students we have mobilized different sectors to take part in work experiences programs. A series of holiday work experience programs are being arranged during major school holidays. A series of, of holiday work experience programs, which last for one or five days, 
were arranged during Christmas, Lunar New Year, and Easter holidays from December 2022 to May 2023, offering about 800 porters for students. The summer holiday work experience program will be launched from June to August this year through first-hand experience of the actual operation in the workplace. Senior secondary students can explore their interests and career orientations and know more about the actual operation of different enterprises and day-to-day -day work of different job positions. With concert effort from the business sector, I'm confident that life planning education could help our students map their study and career paths, pathways to an, at an earlier stage and help nurture a pool of talents to contribute to the ongoing development of our city. Looking ahead, the government will continue to spare no effort to provide quality and diversify education on both academic as well as vocational and professional training with a sense of responsibility, visions and love for the country and the city. We stand ready to ride the wind and waves and break through with all the challenges. May I wish everyone here good health and happiness and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Choi, for sharing with us a wealth of programs and our resources that the Hong Kong government is developing and devoting into developing talent of the future. The goal of the conference is to foster dialogue and collaboration among all of us who are passionate and dreamful about the potential of how education can change the world. Our speaker come from a diverse range of backgrounds and experiences, and we encourage all of you to engage in lively conversations and ask questions with people around you. In the next panel, we are going to discuss the important topic of linking industry and education. As we all know, the world of work is rapidly changing, particularly with the acceleration of AI, and it's becoming increasingly important for education and industry leaders to collaborate and ensure that students are equipped with all the skills needed to be ready to work in the modern task force and workforce. This session is moderated by Dr. William Jern. Dr. William Jern received his Doctor of Dental Medicine degree from the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine, USA. He is Emeritus Trustee, University of Pennsylvania, and FWE Steering Committee member. Panelists in this session include Professor Shifu Chang, Mr. Steve Chuang, Professor Kimi Lau, and also Professor Han Yao Shen, as well as Mr. Hao Yu Su. May I now invite the moderator and the panelists to come on stage. Good afternoon to everyone, and thank you for joining us. And uh, this is uh, session four of the Forum for World Education. And the theme of this session is linking industry and education. Uh, I especially appreciate Secretary Choi's uh, very informative speech earlier, uh, especially on a point when, he ad when she addressed uh, how the government is trying to encourage alignment of classroom education with industry needs, because that sets the stage for this very important session here. Uh, we have a panel of five very distinguished speakers, and this is probably the biggest panel among this uh, uh, forum here to, uh, for, the, for the two days. And uh, I will not uh, spend 
time to introduce them because their CVs is at the back uh, on the screen. And if you want a full bio of uh, any one speaker, you can scan the QR code in your program and uh, all the information is there. So um, I will just uh, try to briefly explain how I will conduct this session. And uh, basically, instead of asking each panel member to share for a few minutes, which will take a long time, uh, I will uh, jump right into the few questions I have prepared for them. The questions will guide them to focus on any specific area uh, of this uh, important topic of linking industry with education. And uh, so uh, at the end of the session, we will hopefully have time left for a Q&A session from the audience. So this is how we're going to operate this. Um, I uh, would also reiterate the point that uh, the session will be conducted in English. However, a couple of our uh, panel members will be responding in uh, Putonghua. So if you like to have uh, simultaneous translation, please go ahead to the back and get a he headset, and we have simultaneous translation for you. So uh, without any further delay, I will jump right into the first question. And um, so the first question is, how can education institutions and industry work together to identify specific skills and knowledge that are most in demand in today's economy and society? And what do you think are some of these skills and knowledge? So uh, the, first, this, the first question I would like to ask Mr. Haoyu Xu, who represent the industry, uh, to answer and to respond. Mr. Xu? Hello,这个问题思考了两天 我想这些都是我们教育机构和我们企业最终走上让员工、让学生走向社会以后所必须学习的，因为这个社会发展的这个速度太快，我们如果说不跟上这个节奏，我们就会被时代所淘汰。好，谢谢。谢谢你。so uh, the next person I would like to um, ask to address this question is Mr. Steve Chuang. Uh, he's also representing the in industry sector. Steve. Okay, thank you. So it is my great honor to participate in this discussion because this is a very vital topic be between the cooperation or institution and industries. As we witness the rapid technology change, this cooperation has become very crucial. So a few months ago, we were talking about AR, VR, and metaverse. But right now, people are only focusing on chart GPT. They forgot about metaverse, etc. So you see how quick it's changing of technology. So that we being a member of industries, we also have to catch up very quickly what is going on. But you know, in between the education institution and industries, I think the key is for our industry is to share the insight with the educational organizations. So I think one of the very important points is have the industry led advisory board committee, consultations, surveys, etc., into your organization. And we as a member of industries, so we are ready and we are happy to join. And because we are the user, we want the talents which can meet our needs and with the rapid changing technology advancement. So for example, I'm the chairman of City Youth Industries and Business Leaders Circles. Uh, it's a leader circle. It is an organization which connect university with industries, and also to share what is happening to the university and for students, 
professor also to connect to the industries. So we have many of the activities, like, for example, uh, career talk, uh, you know, orientation workshops, sharing with the student and with professors. Because I always say, say, professor, you have many of the wonderful research, but after the thesis, don't stop there. Because you can pass to industries, we may quickly turn it to a unicorn. So it, that is the great value. And in Hong Kong, typically, as everybody knows, we have the great universities here. We have top, we have five top 100 universities in Hong Kong. And you know, our basic research is fantastic. And we try how to turn it to apply research in the industries. Okay, so actually, you know, uh, this was uh, uh, a few minutes ago, the Secretary Choi really, she emphasized a lot on the, uh, the VPATs, et cetera. I think that's very important. And I think the government has to review and the subsidized local sub-degree sub and degree program. They have to, I think we have to develop the program which meet the industry needs. So, when you design the curriculum, get us involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chua. So the next person I'd like to uh, ask to address this uh, question is Professor Chang, and he represents the academic sector. So let's hear if he has a different perspective. Uh, thank you for inviting me to be on this panel. It's glad to represent academia here. Of course, I have my colleague represent academia also. Also from America, maybe see a different view of a global perspective. Uh, I think industry and academia serve the same goal, right? The society and humanity, right? We, uh, the product of uh, academia is student and knowledge. Uh, recently, we started to also think about what's the purpose of uh, academia, what's the purpose of uh, university. So our president, uh, Lee Bollinger, recently articulated the university purpose has the fourth purpose. So the first three, research education service, these are three. And the fourth is impact, impact on society and humanity. So look at the uh, Columbia Engineering uh, School, the history. Originally founded in 1864, was called School of Mines, Mining. Because at that time was after the Industrial Revolution. If you remember what the Industrial Revolution, the first one is a mass production of a material and use of material. So there's a lot of engineering schools in America were created around the same time because of the need, the demands of a society. Okay, so today we're seeing the second, third, the fourth Industrial Revolution, right? Digital, engine, electricity, and now we're talking about data and AI. So I think the goal of industrial academia is to respond to the need, the demand of humanity and society. Of course, we operate in a different time scale. Right? In industry, look at the one year uh, deliverable, you look at the ownership, look at the customer need. In university, you look at our customer, who is our customer of university? Right? Society and humanity and industry, as uh, mentioned earlier. So how do we do that? I think one way is really have a close collaboration between university and industry, right? We set up a research center, for example, at Columbia, we have IBM center, we have Amazon center. We have a center with many companies in different centers, in different areas. The second one approach is to leverage the freedom and a cross-disciplinary uh, strengths in the university, right? In the university, you have the freedom to extend beyond the boundary between engineering science and law and business and medicine and architecture. For example, we start a uh, recent uh, new center, $25 million by here, to start in the next generation of AI by crossing the boundary between artificial intelligence and brain science, the neuroscience or so-called natural intelligence. How do human brain learn and how do natural intelligence learn, which is very different from machine learning. So that's my second point. By responding to the need that the question mentioned, how do we identify the skill and the topic to advance the economy, I think is to leverage cross-disciplinary -dis opportunity in academia. The third point, I think also we want to advance industry or a society. Don't forget about the foundation role of education is to teach or really this holistic strength of our future leader and which I think beyond the technical foundation, the 
humanity, art, and social science training is also key. And that's why at Columbia, we focus very much on very deep technical foundation as well as very holistic core curriculum in critical critic thinking, art, music, history, global perspective. So the core way of balance between engineering and humanity is also key. So let me stop here and I'll be happy to answer more Thank questions. you very much. So it's not just about engineering or computer science or medicine, but it's an all-rounded education that we have to focus on. Thank you very much uh, for sharing your insight. So um, I'm gonna jump into the second question very quickly. Uh, and the second question is, how can education institutions and industry collaborate on research and development to drive innovation so that we can enhance the competitiveness of industry? And this is particularly an important topic now because uh, technology development is so rapid, uh, as uh, Mr. Steve Chuang shared so uh, earlier, and uh, it's happening so fast that uh, sometimes I feel like I cannot catch up with it. And uh, so with this fast development, uh, how do we um, make sure that the research and the development that we're doing are in line with uh, uh, increasing the competitiveness of industry and prepare our students for those competitiveness? And so advances in technology such as AI, which we have touched on uh, plenty for this morning. So um, with this question, I would like to ask uh, Professor Kemi Lau, She's a research scientist, and what is your perspective on this? Okay, thank you. Um, well, I've been doing this uh, for the past uh, 40 years. I mean, I didn't want to admit that, but that was the truth. <laughs> and uh, I have been working uh, for R&D uh, for many years, and, uh, 20 years in the U.S., and then 20 some years in Hong Kong. I think the Hong Kong government, the, the, um, the, the, the ITC, the set up to encourage us to do uh, R&D projects that is relevant to industry, I think that has been uh, very helpful because uh, even though what they ask us, okay, we, we don't need the industry to like, invest a lot, but we want them to have an endorsement, yes. And uh, we would like this research done and then the government will fund that. And then I think that is a very good approach and that's what I have been teaching my students. It's uh, like the topics that I choose to study, to write a proposal, and this is uh, eventually, okay, of course not everything will get, um, like become a product because uh, we, we don't do products and we still need somebody to carry that through. I mean, uh, like after all these years, uh, finally some of my former students, uh, they are doing this. And uh, on this uh, a very uh, hot topic of um, micro LED, micro display, but it takes uh, many, many years and um, uh, over 10 years. And uh, some of my colleagues, uh, um, they have the same experience. So my advice will be, <laughs> they, uh, everybody have to be patient and, uh, and then it's the vision thing and uh, whoever, uh, like uh, either the professors or the students, the future students who pick the topic, and um, you get to look farther ahead. I mean, not the immediately, okay, what well, is hot now, we do this. I mean, by the time you get something done, it's not hot anymore. So, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's not easy, but yeah, look farther ahead. Well, we all recognize that. Uh, things are developing so rapidly. And uh, so thank you, Professor Lau. Uh, next, I'd like to call upon Professor Han Yao Shen to share uh, his perspective on this question. And uh, because I know that he's involved with a lot of strategic planning of econ economic development in China uh, as a whole. So uh, Professor Shen, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sanghawa 
是非常之重要，是应该可以说，在我看来，可能是未来世界发展的主流的趋势。呃，这个趋势的重点核心就在 R&D research and development， 它的它的导向就是创新 innovation。这个 innovation 这个创新这个词是经济学家熊比特提出来的。他认为这是资本的本质，你就是要创造利润。由于自由的竞争以后，那么利润率都降低，必须要通过创新。创新有各种，其中是技术创新最为重要。那通过这个创新取得垄断地位，那你就有利润，有利润你就资本就有价值，你就是资本，这就推动社会进步。没有创新，没有利润，没有资本，那就没有进步。他是这个观点，所以我认为这个呢，这个非常这个呃重要。所以现在讲创新讲了很多，它的核心是要带来利润的创造是创新。如果不带来利润，创造也很伟大。爱因斯坦理论物理，牛顿，但是他不创造利润，他当然依然不能说他不伟大，而且是非常之伟大。那么就像一星当时做出来的，他。太超前了，它没有带来利润。现在可能新链可能会成功，那就是创新。所以核心带来不带来利润，这个我认为带来利润。现在呢，最主要的是 R&D， research and development。这个呢是标志性的事件，是七十年代，斯坦福大学，他把它商业化了，尤其在他校园和校园的周边，发展了一大批。创新型的企业，所以呢，我认为这是改变人类社会发展历史的重大事件。由此，我们进入到了一个很最伟大的一个时代，可能就是科技革命的时代。在此之前，我们前面呢可能是工业时代、工业革命；在前面是可能商业时代、商业革命；在前面是农业时代。他们讲的是这产业革命只是工业领域的，我讲的是这产业革命。是大的产业革命，第一次的产业革命是农业，所以有农业发达的地方，有水的地方，产生了四大古代文明。这这个第二个时代是商业时代，意大利、西班牙发生了商业革命，有了国际贸易，成为世界第一批的世界级的中心城市。第一次农业是分割的，没有世界中心，那个就是意大利成为商业社会里面的第一个世界中心。后来西班牙超过。再后来，北面的海上马车夫，荷兰超过他们，那么就是他成为了真正的这个世界的商业时代的中心。再后面，那就是工业革命，英国的轻纺工业、蒸汽机革命，这是工业革命。到了后来，这一直发展到计算机革命。但是到了七十年代，发生了人类历史上一个新的产业革命——科技时代。它的主要就是 R&D 成为一个独立的行业。安迪 research and development 原来是大学里面的附属内部机构，或者是工厂企业的内部机构，它是没有独持续的稳定的收入，没有这个成果，没有成果又没有可续可持续性，所以它不能称之为独立的行业。就像农业原来是这个呃采集，有果子就摘下来，有麦子就捡到，那么后来你种了。春春天种，秋天收，稳定的收益成为农业。那么 ，research and development 从硅谷开始成了一个稳定的行业，再加上后来有技术，有这个 Nasdaq 资本市场的支持，那么就是没有大的收入，没有大的收入，依然可以在资本市场支持，它可以持续的投入和持续的产出，产出高于收入，所以形成了一个独立的产业。所以我认为呢，这个呢。未来呢，这个他们正好两个行业，产业界的和这个教育界的，应该是共同向一块走。目标就是利润创新，方式重点就是研发产业，把它产业化，这是一个新的产业。我我我的观点不一定正确啊。谢谢。嗯。So,、uh, Mr. Steve Chuang is an industrial industrialist himself, and he also represents the Federation of Hong Kong Industries. So, do you have any?、Um, Perspective on this question. So,、uh, thank you so much for Professor Lau and Professor Shen's、uh, insight. And I could not agree more with them. And I think innovation 
and the creativity is the core for the today's business. Just give you a small example. My organization, I have 10,000 people 10 years ago. But right now, I only have 1,000 people in my group. But my business turnover is four times or 10 years ago. So today, every of my staff is creating 40 times of value of what my staff did 10 years ago. How can we do that? Very important. It's the creativity, innovation of the product, and very advanced technology in the manufacturing. So we, that's the reason we promote advanced smart manufacturing. We don't need to use a lot of the workers in the production line, but we're using the machine. These machines would never complain to me. They work 24 hours a day. So university, they are wonderful in the basic research. They have great ideas, they are ahead of us from the industries. Our goal is try to commercialize this research. It's very important. We just try to lock it the uh, thesis and the research paper and turn it into the product. That's our job. And I think that's very important. However, we have the market intelligence. We have production manufacturing expertise. So once we combine them, that's very important. I think everybody know that in the so-called good old days, we have the OEM, we produce a product, you know, we use thousands and thousands of people. These days are really awful. But I think today is much better. But for the education, you know, it's not just research and development, but we also need the applied degree, train the student. Actually, actually they can do the applications or technology, or as I, I mentioned, for the smart manufacturing, we also need many of the high-skilled, trained people to operate the machine, right? So for the smart manufacturing, we're using metaverse, AR, VR, but you know, we need very well-trained tradition as well. So in Hong Kong, right now, government has a research academic and industrial sector, one plus program, which is a 10 billion Hong Kong do dollars program. They're trying to turn 100 team of university research into companies. I think that is a great program. And you know, we being a member of so industries, we are really looking forward to. So the second thing I want to point out is industry has to be proactive to set up the standard for technology products, etc. Uh, in, uh, in 2015, Hong Kong government promote STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So in the market, there are so many products. They claim these are the STEM education kits or program. But what is the standard? Are you sure your product is a STEM product? Or you just is, uh, uh, promote this as a gimmick? So Federation of Hong Kong Industries, we work with Poly University to develop a certificate framework. So we did uh, we design, we set up a framework, say, to meet the STEMS product, you need to meet this kind of the criteria requirement. In this case, the user, say school teachers, uh, parents, students, they, when they want to purchase product, they are fully aware, say, this product meet the basic certification framework. And I think that is very important to push forward the advancement of the technology and advancement of products. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chuang. 400 times uh, improvement in productivity is good news for your company, but it's bad news for the labor force, so. <laughs> well, <laughs> we won't it's get not 100% true because uh, uh, in China right now, we have a shortage of worker. So the people actually turn they upgrade themselves, turn it to do other businesses. Well, that's my understanding. Good, good, very good. Thank so uh, we're gonna jump into the third question now. Uh, and the third question is, how can we reimagine instructional design, or maybe I should say curriculum design, 
in order to incorporate internship, apprenticeship, as well as technological applications such as AI, so that we can better prepare our students for industry. So I'd like to call upon uh, Professor Shifu Cheng uh, to respond to this first. Yeah, now this is a very tough question. Being in, uh, I've been in academia for 30 years, and this kind of a disruption of AI, particularly with the large language model, ChatGPT, is really unprecedented, right? The, the progress and advancement so fast, actually even myself, I work on AI for 20 years, and my, myself, my student did not expect the progress of this advancement so fast. So having said that, uh, it's a big challenge for academia, I'm sure for the industry too. <coughs> we have uh, currently at Columbia, uh, we have 1,300 undergraduate students major in computer science. So it's the number one major across the whole undergraduate student at Columbia University. We have about 6,000 or 7,000 undergraduate students and 1,300 students major in computer science. But when ChatGPT or AI uh, advancement come out, a lot of student parents start to ask me, that are we choosing the right major profession right now? Because programming, coding, computing skill is going to be replaced or automated by AI model, right? If you read the news that a large language model today can pass the programming test easily, can pass the business school uh, qualification exam, medical school, law school, you name it. So as an educator, how do we respond? How do we reimagine the instruction? I think that's the question here. So we have a lot of a discussion among the faculty, among the deans, among the trustee, even the trustee start to think about how do we respond as an institution. I think there are three uh, quick points here. In the past, when I learned computer science or AI or routine computing or digital tool, I try to be as fast as proficient as I can. Today, I think we have to teach our students to be a slower practice or slower thinker. So I think machine can do faster than human, but human can do the, should do the job that requires slower analytical skill. So writing should, could be fast, could be done by machine, but reading, analytics, critique, hypothesis forming, and alternative theory verification, these are the slower skill human can possess which cannot be matched by machine yet. So I think number one, we need to teach our student to be a slower thinker, which may not be a good skill by industry standard. <laughs> I don't know whether. The second point is a deep thinker. So we have to teach our student to be deeper in understanding in each vertical domain, no matter you want to be a master skill in medicine, in law, in finance, in business. You have to have a deep understanding of a concept, common sense, reasoning, high-level decision-making skill in each vertical domain. When I talk to my friends in the industry, they say in the past they do horizontal training, now they run the skill of a deep vertical thinking. So that deep vertical skill is key. And number three, I think the third point, the last point, as ma mentioned by Professor Shen also, is a creative thinker. I think that creativity is the something we need to really emphasize in the classroom in our instruction. Now, even if you use the AI model today, don't use the AI just in a routine standard way. Is there a better creative way to fine tune or customize your model in each vertical domain? When you customize the AI model in your domain, you have to collect training data. You have to train your model again. So-called pre-train plus fine tuning. What is the creative way to collect your training data to fine tune your model? so that you can achieve your training process in a cheaper, greener, and less power consumption way. So that creative thinking is the third point I think we have to teach our students. <coughs> Let me stop here. Okay, thank you. Before we move on, I'd like to ask for permission to extend our session a little bit because we started late. Is that okay? You did? Thank you. So I'd like to call upon uh, another uh, person who represents the academic, Professor K. May Lau, to respond to this question. Okay, well, um, I think that one of the important things, it's, um, well, I have to go back in time. It's, uh, it's uh, what Confucius says. It's um, we teach in the individual teaching. So um, because every individual is different, we cannot offer a class of innovation, a class of 100 students is a class of innovation and this is class of creativity, and then you 
end up with uh, 100 students <laughs> being innovator or <laughs> being creative. I mean, a lot of these, uh, it's uh, came from the individual. And some are more creative than others, and, but they need the basic engineering training to become creative in the dream up with a, a better idea. And I mean, it's a very difficult to come up with something that didn't exist. Like the transistor, we have the transistor for 75 years and we are now still working on transistors. I mean, that's, um, but then there are many, many innovation in the past 75 years that allow us to put the transistors together and have a faster circuit and uh, have uh, all this uh, fiber communication and everything. So it's, um, it must uh, go through the students, uh, the, the basic training, plus uh, to motivate them. And then have the individuals, some are uh, faster thinkers and some are more creative. And we as a, um, a professor, in my experience and my colleagues, and we can identify who are these uh, students. And then uh, we motivate them and then we coach them and uh, to, hey, do you want to stop a company? Do you want to pursue these ideas? And uh, some have the, the, um, the motivation to do that. Hey, I got to get this, but some are not. So you cannot force them. So Thank you for your insight. Uh, so we teach them the basics and then we encourage them to take the yes. basics and then go one step further to be innovative and to be creative. Yes. That's a good point. So um, I'd like to call upon Mr. Haru Shu. Do you have any insights on this? Hello. 怎么来应用这里面就是一个培训的问题我们今年请了普华永道给我们做这个人力资源的这个评价体系像他们一组人只有五个人但是我们面临的上万人的这个这个员工那么他们是用五个人来培训我们这个几十组的人力资源的那么在这个上面就可以用到我们的人工智能来进行帮助他们来进行对我们这个集团的人力资源部门的人来进行培训减少了人工这是一个方面在第二个方面就是我们的员工比方说是学生物的学制药的啊细分很多但是真正走向工作岗位不一定他喜欢自己所学的东西那么需要什么又需要去啊学习要学习那我们就训练我们的培训师但是培训师的这个范畴他也是比较狭隘的那么这个现在的人工智能又能起到很好的作用来干嘛来对他们进行进行筛选这些大学生未来走向的工作岗位在实习在代教的时候就能进行对未来的判断喜爱啊进行选择否则就会造成什么造成人力资源的损失造成他
，我觉得教育界有很大的责任，就课程要重新设计，要重新的要要要要精简，要很多原来的知识可能你现在学了，现在都没用了，可能要重新好好的要重新编辑一下这个教材，有用的没用的，还有呢要缩短，否则这个新的知识你接受呢，可能就没有空间。呃，这是一个这个教程，呃，这另外一个一块呢，就是说呢，可能可能那个重，这个这个早上，呃，早上我们那个宾，呃，也是宾大的一个学员就讲到了，他要搞的这个大赛，一个大赛是中学生十万人中学生参加比赛，呃，那个投资的竞赛，就说说是比他自己的专业团队还要好，他说以后可以把他们这个替换掉了。原来想呢，可能这个，呃，这样呢，可能是中学生可能不太适应，所以现在呢，又我又想起了前些年这个邓小平先生讲，计算机要从娃娃做起，小孩子抓起。我从我自己的女儿这边也体会到，可以教育啊，可以的知识可以要迁移，一个知识结构你要重新的。第二呢，可要往往前面还要学一点新的东西。我的小孩呢，他整天问我是。今年十岁，他问我你是干什么的？我说经济学。他经济学是什么东西？就这样呢。我每天睡觉晚上呢，给他讲十几分钟经济学怎么回事，经济学的课程。给他讲了以后呢，他都很感兴趣。呃，他自己哦，这个这个蛮有意思。他首先他说我要干开个商场，把我们客厅里面都弄个角落里，弄了几个小小纸箱在那，开了商场。开商场呢，我要有餐饮店，我要开个餐饮店。餐饮店前面要有要有粮食，要有面粉厂、工厂加工。在我们的阳台上，他又搞了一个农场，又搞了一个植物园，然后呢，他又搞了一个景观，说我要景观，弄了个小板凳，拉着我们到处走，说我是旅游旅游火车，带着你走，走来走去呢。他说，这个我们说我们把把我们的钱呢都拿去了，父亲母亲的。先拿过去，他要开个银行，给我每人开了个账号，然后呢，你用了多少，存了多少，结果把我们钱一回就,就用完了，我们没钱了，他叫我们加钱，我们说不加，他说他这样，我是中央银行，我在贷款给他银行，我在叫他贷款给你，你再付利息给我，结果他把我们钱赚去了，现在我们成都成了他的这个、这个、这个这个，他是我的债主了，后来我就跟他讲，你这个不行，你要有重商主义精神。你自己赚我们自己家的钱，父亲母亲口袋的钱赚到赚到你口袋里去，这个不行。你要赚外面钱，赚外国人的钱，要重商主义，出口大于进口啊！他就结果后来前天吧，啊大前天，结果他们学校老师打电话找到母亲了，说你们家小孩怎么搞的？结果我们好多小孩现在都欠了他的钱，然后呢，这个这个老师弄玩具卖这个东西给我们，就赚了钱。我说你这怎怎么回事？你跑到那去？他说你不睡觉，要重商主义，要赚外面人的钱嘛。<笑>结果他去，我说你怎么赚的？他说这样的，因为你给我讲经济学讲边际效用递减，那些玩具呢，他自己玩了玩了就玩腻了，他对他评价不高，那么我就可以低价买进来。对于不买的没有的人呢，他的边际效用高，那我就高价卖给他。这样几次一卖了以后，他把它倒来倒去。他赚了人家的钱，最后也是让家里啊，他你钱不够，我贷款给你，收多少利息？哇！结果他们老师讲，不准你带玩具来，不准带钱来，不准什么东西。结果把他母亲把他训了一顿。哎，我说你别信，这搞不好是一个经济学家，你不要把他把他消灭在萌芽中间。所以我就讲这个呢，邓小平讲，计算机从娃娃造起。那个时候计算机的时候是高科技。是深奥的，就像现在讲 AI 一样，元宇宙一样，所以呢可以往前移，但是他的脑子就这么多，空间就这么多，所以知识结构呢可能要改改善，改善怎么改善？我像像 STEM 教育，我觉得是一个重要方向。我的总我的感总结讲，第一你要有科学素养，第二要有文化的素质，第三你要有技术或者职业的技能，第四。你要有个健康身体，要有体育。第五，要有美学或者音乐或者舞蹈这种教育，这一个全面的发展。以后都是自动化了，智能化了
，那以后用人越来越少。刚才讲了一万人到一千人，你这也是大家都可能要降人。这个人类活都是让别人大家很少人就可以干了。你现在我们原来百分之八九十都是做农业，现在就百分之几，对不对？所以呢，它腾出巨大的时间，那是干什么呢？那就是要全面的协调发展。我讲了科学的素养、文化的素质，这个。这个职业技能，这个职业技能会越来越少。现在当然要紧密结合，现在还是要发展，但是未来需要的这个这个效率太高，需要的人工会将减少。所以我的建议就是说，这个教育要改革，课程要精简，也要结构要完善，要全面发展。我我是这个意思。好，谢谢沈教授，呃，这个很宝贵的意见。I think there's always room for improvement in our curriculum design. Uh, there's always room for creativity, and there's always room for innovation. So um, I think that concludes the three questions that I have prepared uh, for our panel members. So I'd like to open this time uh, for any audience that may have any questions for our panel members. I'm surprised there's no question. Oh, there is one. Yes. Industry feedback has uh, a, a lifetime, uh, or is there a certain delay? Uh, especially for an uh, industry like AI, which is developing uh, very fast. So do you see the gap in between, or our, is the system already there to bring you and bring, uh, of course, the school, uh, you know, real-time and uh, non-delayed data in terms of your designing uh, of the uh, cl classes over there? Yeah. No, thank you, Adric. Uh, <coughs> I think the question is uh, for industry uh, academia collaboration, what is the scale of the speed? Uh, is it real-time feedback or is it sometimes take a longer time? Yeah, I think it depends on the, in the field, right? In the biomedical or life science, then take a lot of time. Right? You need to do clinical trial, you need to do prototype, you need to get F uh, FDA approval. They usually take five to 10 years, so maybe sometimes in different market may be different. But in the area of uh, AI or data science or digital revolution, it's very true is you can get almost instant feedback, right? So in that part, we have uh, industry uh, really very engaged in the early stage of a translation. When student faculty has idea, they can quickly uh, propose the idea for business plan for so-called lab to market acceleration. And a lot of uh, investor or mentor through alumni or investor, they come on campus to provide the feedback to student business proposal and also coaching or mentoring and even provide seed funding for them to co-develop. And they, of course, there is the IPE uh, licensing mechanism there. And uh, I think I also want to emphasize, I think in terms of industry and academia collaboration, this kind of ecosystem is very key and crucial for the, the new digital revolution, because industry has the computing power, has a data, massive data source, and also has a vertical domain know-how, right? No matter you apply to, uh, say, law or um, finance or business, that instant customer feedback is not something we have in academia. So that feedback is very important. So how do you develop an ecosystem so they have a very close interaction between the industry feedback and uh, the innovation on the campus is very key. And you are very, very true, very correct. How do we bring this uh, convergence to be closer so that innovation can happen in academia as well as the translation to industry? Thank you, Professor Chang. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, we're running short of time. Uh, if there are no further questions, I'd like to conclude this session by First of all, thanking all the members of, uh, there's another question? Okay, we will entertain one more question, otherwise Edith is gonna be angry at me. So go ahead, last question. <laughs> okay, I have the, yeah, I'm from uh, Guangzhou, uh, Huali College. So I have a question for Professor Chang and uh, 
from Columbia, the dean. And uh, you have the, you, you said very good for the, uh, in your university or in your, or in your college or in your school in order to uh, the new, uh, new area. So you said that you have three keywords to teach the students and the slow thinking, okay, deep thinking, and the creative thinking. That's a very, very impressive. So my question is, do you also have this kind of curriculum and uh, for this three things? Thank you. Very good question. So I advocate for three principles, slower thinker, deeper thinker, and creative thinker, right? But we don't have a curriculum for that one yet. <laughs> we actually are faculty and administrator myself, Eden, we are actually adapting to this new kind of a curriculum. How do you teach students to be a slower thinker? That's actually very much contradictory to a lot of a practice in the past. Right, when I learn a pro programming coding, right, Python or C or Java, I try to be as fast as I can. Right, some of you have been learning programming before. When, I, when my uh, colleague teach English or writing, right, you have an assignment to write an essay, then you go home, you want to finish that as soon as possible. And now you have to do it slower. So writing is not as important as reading now because writing can be automated, can be uh, assisted by AI tool, but reading, particularly a comprehension and critiquing is so important. So we actually are training and also adapting as a professor, as an instructor. And this summer we are organizing several workshops uh, with uh, many faculty members uh, across the dif discipline, also not only engineering, but also in humanity and science. So how do we adapt our curriculum to actually train our students to have a new skill. So it's an open challenge for even for faculty members, right? Thank you very much. So I'd like to conclude our session by first of all, thanking uh, all the members of our panel. Uh, thank, thank, thank them for their uh, valuable insight into this topic. Uh, no doubt, um, one of the key mission of education is to train our students, educate our students, and prepare them for their future career. Uh, but it's also important to get feedback from the industry uh, so that we know whether we are training them properly and we are training them practically. And so uh, the key message that I take away from this session is that there has to be constant dialogue between the industry and the education institutions so that together uh, we can hopefully provide better education for our students and that they can apply their education more practically. So thank you very much uh, for your attention, and this concludes session four. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. William Zhe. Big round of applause for this very uh, interesting panel with a lot of um, international representatives to talk about linking industry and education. <laughs> Dr. Zhang rightly pointed out that we need more conversation and dialogue between industry and education, and the FWE is the opportunity to do so. So we do really want to thank the organizer for giving us this opportunity. So next we're going to break uh, for about 20 minutes. So if we can come back here at 3.50 and then we're going to start the next session on building the next generation of entrepreneurs as well as change makers. So please enjoy some tea outside and we'll see you in a bit. Thank you.
We are going to start in one minute. Can you please be seated? Thank you. Testing. Please be seated. We are going to start soon. Okay, we're going to start our next session. Talking about bridging the skill gaps 
it is very important to offer opportunities for the younger generation to practice essential skills. To put this into practice, we have invited a younger generation MC to join me today. May I invite Ryan Tang to join us on stage. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Ryan. I am 11 years old, and I attend Chinese International School. It is my pleasure to be here in such a meaningful conference since this topic is very relevant to my daily life, education. Now, in our next session, we will be exploring the theme of investing to new, the new generations of entrepreneurs. As we look in the future, it is clear that entrepreneurship is going to play a crucial role in driving the economic growth. And also, they could create more opportunities for individuals and communities around the world. Our panelists will share their perspectives on how we can provide the best support and also nurture the next generation of entrepreneurs, from providing access to funding and mentorship, and also giving them more opportunities to encourage them to experiment and risk take. This session is moderated by Mr. Guo Hao Sun, partner, Global Operations EC Transfer. Panelists include Ms. Nisa Leung, Ms. Rachel Lee, Mr. Tony Go, and Mr. Andrew Sung. May I now invite the panelists and also moderator to come on stage. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for um, coming back after the break, and we will uh, start our panel. Um, first of all, thank you uh, to Madam Shi and uh, Dr. Davis uh, for putting together this great um, Hong Kong uh, FWE. Uh, we were also at the last uh, FWE in 2022 in Thailand. Uh, it's always been an amazing forum for amazing conversations, and we're uh, really happy to be uh, back again. Um, so uh, at the start of our session today, we will do a round of introductions with everyone doing a short, about two minute introduction of yourselves, uh, maybe with your uh, education background, your current professional background, and any recent engagements, projects uh, you're working on. Uh, so myself, Guo Hao, I graduated from Johns Hopkins University with a mechanical engineering degree. Uh, now, I, after graduation, I didn't go into engineering. I started uh, entrepreneurship with um, a few of our friends um, at our company, Easy Transfer. Uh, we also co-founded uh, Providence Academy, a nonprofit platform for international student leaders, uh, as well as now I sit on the board of uh, the Western Academy of Beijing and International IB School in Beijing. Yep. And I'll hand over to Tony. Sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Glad to be here and uh, happy to see everyone after the Thailand uh, after the FWE event there. And I'm Tony, uh, the founder of Easy Transfer, and I went to United States when I was 15 years old and studied there and lived there for 12 years, went back to China in 2018, and uh, formed our company Easy Transfer. So in the States, I was uh, like uh, having like a boarding school in Omaha, Nebraska, and then went to USC for undergrad, and Harvard Business School, the two plus two program uh, for my uh, graduate school. And uh, super happy to be here for the business itself, Easy Transfer, uh, with the past of five years. Now each year, we're helping international students better paying their tuitions online. And every year, we help transfer more than 20 billion CMY in transaction volume, which makes us the largest service provider in our uh, sector. And uh, two years ago, when Tencent became our shareholders, it helped us uh, expand our footprint into the whole Asian Pacific region. So now our service supports more than 20, 260 countries. So students from there, they can directly pay to different schools across nine different countries, more than 2,000 institutions. So that's about like what we did, and uh, always happy to come back to FWE and uh, share our latest thought. So pleasure to be here. Thank you. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Nisa. I'm a managing partner of uh, Qiming Ventures. Um, we manage 9.5, we raised 9.5 billion US dollars, um, primarily investing in China and um, you know some rest of the world, US and Southeast Asia and whatnot. Uh, in tech and biotech, um, you know, we're angel investor in companies like Xiaomi, Meituan Dianping, Bilibili, Zihu, you know, um, and so on and so forth, and a lot of um, AI and, um, and biotech companies. So um, I'm also, you know, with a, a group of friends, uh, we started STEM Initiative, um, gosh, seven, eight years ago, to try to introduce STEM into Hong Kong, and, um, and have um, invited a few professors in, um, you know, um, from US to, to Hong Kong uh, to talk about STEM. I'm on the um, Stanford Business School Advisory Council. I'm also a um, lecturer at the Harvard Law School um, and also involved with Un Hong Kong University uh, Science and Technology and Hong Kong University here in Hong Kong. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Rachel Lee, and I'm a student of Chen. I joined the Chen's PCCW program um, in 2005. Then um, I went to UPenn, studied psychology and marketing. Then um, I finished study and applied at Columbia University, studying SIPA. And uh, I um, graduated in 2015, then get back to China, start my own business, um, start with the honey business, then we merged uh, with uh, the Shenzhen Huaman Kezi Youxian Gong Si to do the tea business, uh, which we invested by uh, Zhou Yang Company. And uh, this year, we uh, start a uh, um, new venture capital with my old friends. Uh, so um, that's something about me. Um. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Sohn. Um, I am originally from the US. I went to Columbia University, where I majored in uh, English literature. Um, but then I did what most Columbia students do when they don't know what they want to do. I went to go work in finance um, for a couple of years. Um, but I followed my passion eventually, and in 2009, together uh, with my Columbia classmate, Michael Novielli, I co-founded um, Duest Education. Um, in, and initially, Duest was really founded um, to help kind of uh, address a concern that we had um, in, the, in the Chinese market uh, when it came to uh, the number of students who were looking to study abroad in the US and the UK. And what we felt was a kind of a lack of information for students and for, uh, for their parents to make the right decisions. And unfortunately, that lack of information sometimes led to, I think, less than um, uh, favorable kind of ethical um, issues. So we really focused on providing kind of ethical service to students who were looking to study abroad and to really help them understand um, all of the wonderful opportunities that they had. Um, over the last 14 years, we've grown significantly. We have offices throughout China as well as Singapore and the United States. Um, and we've also grown in our mission. Um, a lot of what we're doing now is also co-developing programming with um, universities in the US and UK um, to help build new curriculum that can be implemented into international schools, um, first throughout Asia and then hopefully throughout the world as well too. So it's been an exciting uh, entrepreneurial experience um, in China and I'm excited to speak a bit more about that on the panel today. I'm also grateful again um, to be here um, for this uh, conference. Actually, I missed the one in Thailand because I was locked down in China, um, but uh, my, uh, my co-founder Michael was there too. So thank you again for having us. Great, thank you. And we have a really diverse set of uh, speakers today. So we'll go into the first question. Um, and as we can see now in a globalized world, um, there are many different complexities, including geopolitical tensions, uh, economic disparities, and environmental challenges. Um, so thinking back to kind of um, at your university time, how do you think um, universities today can better prepare young people to navigate um, such a globalized world with all these you know, different challenges and complexities? And this question, we will start with um, Nisa. Oh, I was hoping that I can uh, wait a little bit. Well, <laughs> um, actually, you know, I forgot to mention, thank you, Edith, for inviting me to this um, uh, event. I think it's uh, it's great to be in you know to to talk about education. I'm usually speaking at biotech events or you know um, banks and whatnot. But I think this is a, a very interesting environment for sure. I mean you know we we're just Susan and I we were just talking about how as a venture capitalist we are constantly looking at the end result of what education universities are generating. Um, I still remember eight nine years ago I'm on the board of uh, Hotchkiss and um, I told Hotchkiss look I mean you know there are all these New England boarding schools you're 
you're, you're teaching a lot of great humanity subjects, but we need to learn so much from the West Coast uh, high school, what, how they're teaching engineers and technologists and, and so forth. So I brought like, um, you know, a group of um, deans over um, to visit with some of the top schools, um, Sacred Heart, you know, Menlo High, and you know, Castellet and so forth, and Stanford, to learn about how they can, and, and since then we've implemented Makerspace, we've implemented quite a few other um, subjects and, um, and so forth. But we also started um, you know, the STEM initiative. But I think what's really interesting, going back to the question that you talk about, I think you know, one of the things, the challenges, there are two things, right, for universities these days, is how to educate kids so that they can think independently and not be um, skewered by social media. Um, I mean, social media in the sense that um, there's so much um, skewing in the social media on how they think and, and how inclusive they are when it comes to the global world. Um, I still remember when we were young, we talk about, you know, my, our parents talk about how we are global citizens and as a Hong Kong person, you know, we, we learn at least two subjects, so, or three, uh, sorry, two or three languages. So we try to, you know, learn, for me, I learned five languages. So we all try to be international citizens, but these days, you know, I was just reading up on a report last night how a venture capitalist in U.S. is saying, you know, it's a sin um, to be investing uh, as a U.S. You know, venture capitalist, it's a sin to be investing in Chinese technology. And I'm like, whoa, this is really out there. So do we really need to be like that? Can we be more inclusive? There's so much that we need to do together, um, you know, globally, um, be it in technology, be it in global health, be it in climate change and so forth. So that mentality, how do, you, how do educators teach the children? Um, and um, so I think that's number one thing. And the second thing is, um, as we're talking about AI and ChatGPT, you know, naturally, you know, one of the things that we're also seeing is Hong Kong and China are not allowed to use OpenAI or ChatGPT. So then it forces um, companies to now look into investing and starting these companies locally. Um, and, um, and so, you know, that inclusivity is, is you know, we're, we're creating a more and more of a divide. And I think this is not right. Um, so individually, we continuously to talk to people about how we can work and collaborate with all the different universities. We've had probably 10 you know, different deans of universities in town the last um, month or so, and even university presidents, and we talk about that. And we talk about how, um, how we can facilitate, continue to facilitate more collaboration between the universities and so forth. But we also understand there are limitations um, from U.S. institutions because of the NIH, um, you know, um, limitations and so forth. But no matter what it is, um, I think it's so important that we continue to do. And another thing, too, is one of the things that we realize is that when it comes to um, the, the students, the content that they learn in universities, um, even the PhDs that we hire who graduate from PhD programs five years ago, uh, they are what they have learned is no longer as relevant because the technology is changing so fast. So say, for example, are we teaching the, the kids how to use AI uh, in collaboration with biotechnology and multidisciplinary? There are not enough programs like that. So, but we're already seeing companies over in companies, um, say AI drug discovery company, AI imaging company, and so on and so forth that are already uh, booming. So, I mean, you know, one of our companies became the first company in the world to have used AI to identify a target, use AI also to develop, uh, to, uh, develop a drug, which is now in clinical trial um, and finishing phase one clinical and going to phase two. And they're doing the same thing in US FDA. So how do we educate the educators and the students in that is something that we'll probably need to think about quite a bit. Great, thank you. Uh, and next we'll go with Andrew. Sure. Um, I think I will focus a bit more on the undergraduate experience and suggestions for that is that's an area that I'm a bit more familiar with. But I think, um, you know, one of the, uh, you know, things that have obviously changed a lot is I was at Columbia when 9-11 happened. So I just think about like how, um, 
impactful that was on my life and how stressful that was um, those, those weeks and months. But then now, I mean, there's just so much more happening um, for students and the world is just changing even more quickly. So I, I think one of the things that we always talk about at West and, and um, emphasize to our students first would be um, interdisciplinary learning, right? I think that's something that uh, many universities are already doing, but something that I think would be incredibly important as student, um, for students of the future. I, I benefited a lot, and sorry to keep talking about Columbia, I know there are a lot of UPenn people here too, but uh, you know, I benefited a lot from um, the core curriculum. Um, I was an English major, but then went into finance and, and was able to take the, the skill set that I learned there to go into uh, another field, and I think a lot of that came from the interdisciplinary um, approach that Columbia offered. Um, I think the other thing um, that, that's really important um, is the ability to just ask really good questions. Um, I think at the undergraduate level particularly, we work a lot with our students um, to you know, help them to start to think about, well, don't take something at face value. How do I ask um, certain questions to really get to the real answer um, and, and, and come up with my own opinions? Um, another thing that's, that's just so important in the future, I know a lot of universities are focused on this. I just got back from a, a board meeting at Columbia too, but mental health um, has been something that I know schools are uh, focusing a lot on, but I think it's something that is critical, right? Um, and the approach to mental health as well. I mean, I think um, a lot of people think about mental health as maybe something that like you deal with that's a problem when it becomes a problem. But frankly speaking, I think that given the technologies, given that everything, um, all the resources that we do have now, being a bit more proactive and helping students to really understand that you know, mental health is, you know, it's like running a marathon. You need to, um, you need the right training, you need the right resources, you need to consistently rethink um, um, how to approach uh, mental health. And I think the last, whatever, three years in this pandemic has obviously helped us um, you know, really think about that as well, too. So I think um, those would be some areas where I think, I, I know that universities are already focused on this, but I think um, even more um, training around that. And, and the last point I would say, and, and this is, um, I think, I, I, I would want to think about a bit more how to implement this, but um, I think communication between undergraduate programs and um, the work for, or I guess, uh, you know, postgraduate work um, would be pretty important. I'll just give you guys a small example um, because it's fresh on my mind. Several students have come up to me, but um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with this, but at the undergraduate level now, um, students are asked to start interviewing for jobs in finance the first summer after their freshman year, right? So when I went to go work in finance, I didn't even know I wanted to go work in finance until my senior year. Now many of our students who want to go work at JP Morgan, who want to even hedge funds, which previously um, did not hire at the undergraduate level are starting to hire and you need to go and get your internship, you need to have your resume built up from freshman year. Um, and I know um, that there are obviously pre-professional schools, um, more pre-professionally focused schools like Wharton that are going to um, help students really think about that early. But I, I think that at the undergraduate level, I'm not suggesting that all students just focus on work, but I think more communication between the undergraduate institutions and employers. Um, my understanding, uh, you know, with that problem specifically is the employers are, are uh, recruiting earlier because they're competing against each other to get good staff, but if the um, undergraduate institutions were to able to collaborate a bit more with the employers, it could maybe even prevent some specialization, which I think specialization is important in the future, but maybe not so much at the undergraduate level as it would be at the graduate level. Great, thank you. And uh, uh, Tony for the third answer. Yeah, sure. So uh, Nisa and Andrew shared uh, what competency and the characteristics uh, the university uh, should like uh, be watching out our attention to for cultivating uh, students. But I, I really want to actually look this issue from another point of view, the cultivation environment. The essence of education is to cultivate mutual understanding. And this is not only brought by courses or programs. Indeed, mutual understanding is brought by the growth and learning environment. So I shared with everyone in Thailand about my high school experience. I was the first Chinese international student in my school's history. And 99% of my classmates are, were all white. And I dare, actually I stay up until 2 a.m. I was hidden in the closet because you know the all boys school have the curfews. So every night we have to be light off by 10 p.m. And so by that time, I was hiding into the closet, trying my best to catch up all my classmates because you know, at like sophomore year, we were, we were reading Shakespeare, and I did not understand, like I understand each word, 
but all plus together, I didn't understand the whole meaning of the page of the book, Macbeth. So I there like I spent tough three years. But you know, like the story like went on, like I was super great at math or like science class, but that won't be able to help me gain the respect from my classmates. That's the first half part of the story. And now today I'm going to tell you the second part of the story. So what was going on later was the school, I was selected to join the academic decathlon team. So academic decathlon is not all about science or math. You have to like uh, compete in biology, in American history, European his history, and literature. But at this field, I have no ability to compete with the local students. So at there, we actually formed the, like, uh, the student team to participate in the state competition. Uh, it, it turns out we broke the state record that lasts for 30 years. And through these events, actually like each of us got the mutual understanding because we win. So I think actually the mutual understanding is building on the winning situation. If you cannot win, or if you cannot see the collaboration can bring you the winning, then like two parties cannot simply working on together. That's the easy answer there. Winning is beautiful, Collab collaboration is even better. But remember the condition is that we must have a chance to win. And how did this opportunity come about? It must come from education. So today there are more than one and a half million international students from China. There are another one and a half million international students more from India. And we're being educated and growing up in the same environment with the US students. And the US students are also living and growing up with us. So I believe the same environment that we grow up in lays the ground for mutual understandings with the international students. So today, my suggestions to all the universities is I really hope that the universities could open the doors to international students, recruit more international students, and recruit international students earlier. If through the education, this generation of students can see the beauty of international collaborations on campus, then in the future, global collaboration in our society must adjust around the corner. And these in international students, I believe, truly in my heart, are the angels of the world peace and the world integrations. I believe this is also very meaningful for FWE to promote in the near future. Thank you. I can see Dr. Davis uh, leading the clapping here, which you know is really the mission of FWE here. Um, and so, yes, thank you all for that, uh, for the great answers. I think I summarized it into a few words. Uh, you know, for NISA, it was uh, building that in inclusive environment, global citizens. Uh, Andrew mentioned interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary education, um, and Tony mentioned a good incubation environment. So there, and they all start with ins and. Um, it's a very good uh, summary to our first question. I think talking about incubation and incubators, um, a lot of the uh, our panelists today are also entrepreneurs themselves. So thinking about designing a university for breeding new and emerging entrepreneurs, uh, what are some of the pillars or aspects you would build into this curriculum? And uh, for this question, we want to start with uh, Rachel sharing some of her, of her experiences. Uh, first of all, I think um, for myself as an entrepreneur, if um, I have to something is like we think, I think we should have more technical skills as an entrepreneur because um, uh, to start a business is now as we think the school taught us how to be success, but now how to be, um, how, how to face the failure. So I think uh, with more technical skill, we can um, make our business more, uh, more, how to say, like more, less, uh, has less opportunity to be failure. And, uh, yep. I think I have more answer for my third question. But the second question is like, it's sort of like combined with my third. And uh, um, yep. 
great. Uh, thank you. Um, and we'll look forward to your sharing in the third question then. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, next, uh, we'll have uh, Andrew and your thoughts. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I, I don't know if uh, my fellow panelists agree, but I think it's probably very difficult to actually teach entrepreneurship. Um, but I do think that um, it is very possible to create an environment that encourages the development of certain habits um, that I think could be very beneficial to future entrepreneurs. Um, I think the first habit, uh, at least for me, that would be really important is I guess, um, self-reflection slashed with uh, self-advocacy. Uh, um, and obviously self-reflection because I think as entrepreneurs, you have to constantly rethink, you know, uh, uh, reevaluate how you're doing and, and wh really what are, what are your core values, right? What, what's most important to you? Um, and I think those do change over time. So constantly having the habit of, uh, of, of reflecting about that and, and, and reflecting on your place even in the world is really important. Self-advocacy, I mean, we, we talk about this a lot at Due West too, but I mean, frankly speaking, that's what you are doing as an entrepreneur. You have an idea, you are advocating for that idea, you're advocating for this, uh, this um, dream that you have. And frankly, that's not something that just happens naturally. It comes from practice. We do a lot of uh, work with our students at Due West on that too, because frankly, I think um, as an Asian American, I don't think the Asian countries are so supportive of that at a young age, right? I mean, um, I'm Korean American. I remember, I grew up in the States. My parents would just say, go to school and listen to what your teacher said. Do not you know, try to push back or uh, advocate for your own idea. So that was something that I actually didn't learn until I got to Columbia, where you had to actually talk to your professors and advocate for your ideas. And then in entrepreneurship, that's really um, a huge part of what you're doing. So one of the pillars would absolutely be um, uh, self-reflection and self-advocacy. Um, I think the second pillar would certainly be resilience. Um, again, I don't think that that's, resilience is something that can be taught, but I think it can be encouraged in, in an environment, in the right environment. Um, but you know, I, I think we can all agree, entrepreneurship is really hard. Um, and as the, the head or the CEO or the founder, all you deal with all day long is problems, right? I mean, if, it was, if it's a problem that no one else can solve, then you have to deal with it, obviously, right? And it takes an incredible amount of resilience. Um, I think for all of us here who are running businesses, no one expected the pandemic to happen, right? And we just had to, you know, get through it, right? And, and, and that's just resilience. Um, I think um, another pillar that's just incredibly important, I think FWE is encouraging this, but um, obviously global, uh, a global mindset. I mean, so many of, uh, of, the, of the next greatest ideas are gonna come from different places all around the world. And if you can have that perspective, if you can have, um, and, and, and really have an open mind, um, about kind of what's happening in the world, what other people are doing in other countries, um, and can I adapt those ideas and bring them to, uh, to my own country or to my own market as well? Um, I think that's huge and so important. Um, so let me just make sure I'm not missing any of the pillars I thought about before. Um, oh, and the last one, I mean, I think this is so important. Um, Collaborative problem solving, and, and I say collaborative problem solving because I think um, a lot of in, in entrepreneur or like in, in the startup world, there's a lot of talk about teamwork um, and, and all that. But sometimes I feel like teamwork is um, somewhat confusing. Some people think about teamwork and it's like, oh, we all get along and we, you know, we, we work really um, hand in hand, which which is obviously part of collaborative problem solving. But I've also worked on some teams, some of the best teams. You don't always have to see eye to eye on everything. In fact, sometimes argument and like really bringing different perspectives and, and maybe even fighting till late at night until you come up with a solution, right? That's, that's not a bad thing, right? Um, and so I think encouraging that as a pillar um, uh, within the community would be incredibly important um, if I was trying to build such a, such a university. Great, thank you. And then we'll go with uh, Tony. So in the past uh, 10 years, I actually like, have met with a lot of amazing uh, founders whose business already became a, like a unicorn worth billions of dollars. And uh, most people like will think these founders have the alpha characteristic or like always super aggressive or want to win. But to my surprise, actually, the result actually turns the totally opposite. Most great founders, they are not that aggressive. So I think the two traits that if I'm building a university I will really look on into two points. The first point is learn how to compromise. Yes, you hear me clearly how to compromise. You have to unite the talents. And it's hard because every talent 
they have their own personality, they have their own thoughts. So every day as for the leader, they should think only one question, as how can you make this group of amazing people produce one or two times the outcome? The upper limits for your compromise is the ceiling of the multiplier. I think this is truly important, because as for a leader, I think they only need to be pay attention to three tasks. First, setting goals. Second, finding useful resources. And third, for the most importantly, uniting the talents. So that's my first point. And second point, for all the leaders and the universities should pay attention to cultivating the leaders. Tell them how to appreciate. We must learn to be grateful. And there are hundreds of reasons for, for failure of every single enterprises. But there is only one reason for it to be successful, which is that the team is mutually grateful and united. If you really value, I mean like the grateful is not only for the team members to be grateful for the enterprise, but also mutually for the founder to be grateful for the team members. If you really value each single member of the team, you will find out that everyone is full of confidence because they can feel the value of being needed, which will inspire them to become like what Mr. Schwartzman said, the 10 point talent. And I truly think for all the 10 point talents, they are not born naturally. They are empowered by all the leaders. So that's the two points I really want to share. Thank you. Great, thank you. And um, I do know like Nisa is also coming in from a investor perspective. So I wanted to kind of cue you on this question as well. So, uh, you know, looking at all these um, projects and companies that uh, you've uh, looked at and considered or invested in, um, you know, uh, coming from an investor's perspective, uh, do you have any thoughts on, you know, what are some of the important pillars or aspects for educating new entrepreneurs? Well, you know, we, we've invested in 530 companies and 65% um, of our companies we invest when they're, uh, we're angel investor in. So when there are only one, two, three people in the team. But now over a hundred of them have grown to be unicorns. So, yeah, I'm just thinking when you're asking this question, what are the traits? I think none of our, none of our CEOs actually went to University of Entrepreneurship. <laughs> Right? They all learn from the job. They're very good in the technical aspects, but they learn from the job. And they have the right work ethics. Um, you know, one of the things you know, I, we, we keep talking about in the last few weeks, the few, few months after COVID, so many young people, they say, you know, they only want to work three days a week at the office. That's not going to be easy to pull off a unicorn, <laughs> you know? So, um, but we don't see a lot of that um, in China, but I, we do see a lot of our offices in US and Western, um, in Europe having that issue. So like Google's and the likes, how do you get the you know, young people back to work so that they can learn, they can communicate and interpersonal skills. Um, so, you know, one of the things that, you know, we, um, we started um, building, teaching entrepreneurship to young people in Hong Kong 25 years ago with the Young Entrepreneurship Development Council, and we set up the first Penn University business plan competition. But our, we realized that we can't start from university, it's too late. We have to start from high school, uh, even middle school, because by the time they're in university, they already have a si set mind that they, they just wanna go to banking, they wanna go to consulting and, and whatnot. And you know, when I was 21, and when I graduated from Cornell, I ask myself, do I want to go and start a company? Uh, and then in five years, if I fail, I'll start another company, but then five years later, I'll be a better entrepreneur, or do I want to go and work for an MNC and get some experience and five years later start a company? And I decided that the first is better because I would fail, and I'll fail a couple of times, and I would be a better entrepreneur. And that's what happens to a lot of our entrepreneurs. They fail. I mean, you know, so, so the thing is that grit, that Tony was talking about, and perseverance is so important. The EQ, I think Stanford Business School has one of the best entrepreneurship program for all the MBAs in US, and one of the best 
class we have at Stanford is the touchy-feely class that everybody talked about. And what is that? That is a class that teaches you EQ. That's a class where you know, you've, you're divided into groups and people basically just talk to each other about very emotional issue and you have to face them and learn how to deal with it. People crying, yelling their heads off. At the end of this class, you can deal with all types of personality. As an entrepreneur, you need to do that. <laughs> so, so I think that is so important um, more than anything else. But you know, work ethics and then also the, the value system is so important. These days at Stanford, I think you know, we talk about ESG. It's very important for um, our generation, a younger generation. And I think there has to be a sense of uh, ownership and a sense of um, you know, sort of um, achievement. So to you know to try to get something, so to get there, and I think that's very important. So it's really hard to teach entrepreneurship. I think they have to experience and learn, and you know hopefully there are mentors around who can teach them, you know what is the right value system along the way. Great, thank you, uh, and that really leads nicely into our uh, final question before we open up to questions. Um, so, uh, looking at thinking about um, anything, any advice we can contribute to educators and policymakers who are seeking to reform the education system to better serve the needs of today's economy. Um, we're really looking for uh, your advices as uh, entrepreneurs here. So, uh, here with this question, we'll start with uh, Rachel. Um, as Nisa said, like um, there are a lot of businesses not set. Um, we all start a business not set for fail, but we set for uh, success. But there are a lot of business like over ninety percent of them like uh, um, don't have a really good result. But I think if I can have um, recommendation for any policymaker, I will have like um, to invite those. Um, uh, not successful companies, entrepreneur come to the school, talk to us, like, what happened? Uh, well, you create your business and uh, uh, which part you did wrong is not like all talking to those successful um, entrepreneurs or like big leaders, like how to have a successful business. I think we can learn more from mistakes than success. That's the first one. And the second one, I think um, we have to, um, as a young um, student in school, I think we have to learn more technical skills to fight in the jungles. Um, um, those skills, we don't have to master, uh, master on everything, but I think we have to have average skill in everything, maybe uh, sort of like um, human resource, legal things, accounting, um, every field. We have to know everything a little about that and uh, to make our uh, business uh, go smooth. And uh, um, I think know everything a little bit can help help you uh, increase the um, percentage to have a successful business, maybe, but uh, um, to prepare for um, the failure. And the third one, I think, um, we grow up in rich uh, resources, protection from parents, and uh, all the resources we can reach. Um, I think um, we don't really learn how to um, face uh, challenges and disappointed in our lives. I think a very big part for entrepreneur because um, it's not so easy every day. You have to deal with uh, a lot of crisis and how to be uh, emotional, stay um, stable. I think it's a very important to, um, uh, to learn if, um, I have a position to give um, anyone or LA, any policymaker that suggestion, I would have these three parts to go. Great, thank you. And uh, we'll uh, conclude with Nisa on this question. Uh -huh. Nisa. Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so any advice for educators or policymakers seeking to reform education for to fit today's uh, economy? Well, I think you know we're talking about it's it's actually harder to educate the educator uh, than students. I mean, you know, I sent um, I actually um, sent a couple of um, um, university Hong Kong University um, education department um, colleagues to Stanford to learn about STEM education and how to teach 
STEM um, probably seven weeks, uh, seven years ago. And there was a one week program and, and I asked her, why don't you come back um, and present to us, um, you know, the sponsors on your, on your findings so that you can teach um, the educators in Hong Kong. And her presentation lasted 10 minutes. It didn't sink in. So then I'm like, okay, we have trouble. We need to teach directly to the students rather than teach the educators. So the question is, how do we provide the contents um, to the students directly so there's no misinterpretation whatsoever? I think that's something with internet we can do, with AI we can do. So, I mean, you know, I challenge um, FWE and other, you know, educators to think about programs we can actually get right there rather than, you know, having the disconnect. So that's, yeah. Great, thank you. And uh, with that, um, we're hoping we'll have some questions from the audience that we can discuss further. Um, so we'll be opening to questions. Oh, we have one here. Hi, thank you so much for such an engaging, enlightening uh, discussion. So I'm uh, a graduate from Teachers College, Columbia University. I also just came back from Boston with a group of 40 uh, secondary school educators. Uh, uh, we've spent a week in, at Harvard Business School learning about cultivating education leadership in Hong Kong. So I want to say that everything that you've said is completely heard and I think agreed upon by so many educators in Hong Kong. Uh, one of the things I really care about, and Nisa, you, you talked about this as well, is teachers. Because if we talk about education reform, teachers play a really important role. And everything you touched upon is so important, but they're also skills that you're supposed to integrate within every lesson, right? It's not like I teach a class on resilience or you know, entrepreneurship, right? So I guess um, it's a big question, but if there's one thing you would like to empower our teachers with, right? This one skill set or like one course, if you would, what would that be? How would you empower our teachers so that they can teach all of this to our students in the next uh, generation? Thank you. Oh, I could add one. I mean, we talk about this a lot with our students too, but obviously I think it, uh, as adults, it's important too, but um, obviously intellectual curiosity, right? I, I, I mean, we work with a lot of teachers. We have a lot of teachers on our staff too, and um, as, as uh, things continue to change, I think it's important even as adults to kind of con constantly revisit and, and, and um, dive into new concepts. One of the things I love about the work that we do is I'm learning new things from our students all the time and they're uh, constantly teaching me new things, but I think it takes a lot of discipline at the end of the day when you're tired to like go look up, how does ChatGPT actually work, <laughs> right? Or how does this, um, and especially, obviously if you're teaching a subject, you're going to put in the time to, to learn more about it, but you know, I, I think it's important to go beyond that as well too. So I, mean, I think it's kind of a simple answer, but one that resonates a lot with me. And uh, Rachel? Um, I guess we're just uh, <laughs> going down the line, sure. Um, okay, Nisa. You know, um, our son is at DBS, and um, it's, it's a great school, and I keep thinking about, I think one of the things that we, they teach well, and they try to teach the boys uh, is, is the grit and the perseverance. Um, but I, I must say that, you know, the best teachers that we've ever had are the ones that really care. And, um, you know, a lot of times I think the student, the teachers are so busy that it's really hard for them to put the, so, you know, how as the university admin, uh, or s school administrators, how can we um, reduce the workload for the teachers so they could really spend more time with the kids? I think that's something that I'm thinking more about rather than the content, thanks. And Tony. Yeah, I still remember like uh, uh, four years ago, like they were, uh, when they were back in Paris, uh, like uh, Jack Ma actually uh, like uh, uh, came to our event and Jack Ma actually had a, like, a super great program that uh, cultivating all the teachers, empowered them, like in uh, Sanya Hainan each year. So each year he's like uh, supporting more than hundreds of teachers flying to Hainan and uh, give them a conference to learn from each other. And that is truly helpful because a lot of teachers, they are in their industry for decades 
they're in their subjects for decades, and it is truly hard for them to meet the colleagues from other industry, other teachers, other professors, from even like other countries. So I think uh, for this part, all the entrepreneurs should be more responsible for helping the teachers, creating a more like useful conference like, like FWE, and inviting all the teachers to join the event. And I think that could truly like help the whole industry to grow. Yep. Thanks. And uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, I don't exactly have a question, but I have some observations to make sitting here throughout the day. Uh, a few um, resonating uh, views from different panelists. Um, education or the choice of a career doesn't start at university. And Nisa just mentioned that. It's not even high school, it's middle school. The secretary of education just said the same thing. And earlier this morning, various panelists said the same thing. So we really should be thinking the next generation of entrepreneurs start. There was a professor, Professor Shen, just said now, uh, his, his daughter was uh, doing business nine years old. So um, we should start young. Number two, um, I have always found the Chinese translation of education very troublesome. It's uh, Gao Xu, teach books. And we should be teaching human beings, Gao Yan. Jiao Ren, bu shi jiao shu. And um, as uh, Andrew said, we, in our daily life, we teach and we learn every moment. If we're there to you know, send our fillers out to, 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 to capture what, what our younger generation is teaching us. And um, one very important point is failure. Nobody wants their children to fail, and they don't want to fail. And our generation and the next generation suffer from not being able to fail and stand up again. And I like your analogy about choosing option one instead of Two, um, I hope you haven't failed many times before you, you got to your fifth year. Um, we have to teach the younger generation how to go through a failure stage and then stand up again. And I'm very sad to hear about teacher education. Uh, and Nisa has decided that the, the teachers are, are not the right conduit. And all of us here are, in one way or another, uh, involved in education, whether we are educators or business people or people in industry. And I think we have to think very hard as to what educators should be doing. I know that Teachers College is starting a new doctorate program about how to teach educators. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm going to volunteer uh, to, to President Tom Bailey to, to take part in structuring the program and hopefully I'll become one of his first students. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shi, for the uh, wrap-up. Uh, oh, do we have another question? Oh, in the back there. Okay, so this will be our last question for this session. Um, thank you very much for a fascinating discussion. Um, the discussion reminds me of an uh, event that we, we organized uh, a couple of years ago. Um, interesting model, um, the founder of Gojet uh, actually joined the Ministry of Education uh, in Indonesia, bringing the spirit of entrepreneurship uh, into education. So I guess I'm interested to hear your views uh, about do you fundamentally believe um, that educators or teachers could be entrepreneurs? And if so, maybe if you imagine you're incubating a group of educators slash entrepreneurs, what advice would you be giving them, knowing that they are in education? 
um, who wants to take a go at it? <laughs> all right. Uh, 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 I mean, first of all, I, I think anyone could be an entrepreneur, right? So I, I don't think you're limited if you're an um, educator. Um, I think maybe one of the things I would encourage, first of all, is I, I think a lot of uh, um, entrepreneurship is not necessarily just limited to technical expertise, right? Um, and I do think it's um, it, it's sometimes easy, maybe um, as an educator, to feel like, well, I you know, I'm not a I'm not a tech person, or I'm not like a, a business person, so I don't have these. Um, skill sets. I mean, I, I don't think that's true, right? I think um, educators, particularly teachers, bring a, a very different um, skill set as well, too. So, um, you know, I, I would encourage, you know, again, um, self-reflection and, and, and really think about which, which skill sets um, to use. But in, in my experience, some of the, the most successful um, entrepreneurs are actually great teachers themselves as well, too, right? Um, and, and excellent at explaining ideas. And then, um, similar to what Tony said, helping your team grow, right? That is what educators do. You help your students and your community grow significantly. And so I would say focus on um, specifically on the skill sets you know that, that that you have as an educator and 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 uh, and, and continue to kind of grow and, and develop those th you know the last thing is as an educator you're always constantly bringing trying to unite different groups of people right whether it's in a classroom whether it's in a school whether it's in a bigger institution um, and, and uh, you know th that's very important right this kind of collection of resources and people working together so uh, yeah I mean I, I think educators are great um, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs in many ways are educators as well too Yeah, I truly think all the entrepreneurs could be like a great professor, but it should be like more like the joint program. So like uh, at Harvard Business School, like uh, every Friday, we invited uh, like a uh, lecturer to come to the class and we read the cases about them, like uh, in the like uh, prayer class. So we do 60 minute discussion and then 20 minutes like a lecture. Uh, and that, that is truly helpful. And uh, I think like uh, all the great business schools globally have the program like this. Uh, Penn has a lot of uh, great lectures, mm -hmm. and uh, most of the like uh, professors uh, at Wharton, they actually have experience managing forms before. So I do think that could be super helpful for students to get a real feeling of how to manage the, the real company in the real world. Yeah. Great. Uh, any last uh, remarks? All good. Great. Uh, thank you all for listening to our panel today. I think it was very, um, uh, very fruitful. And um, at the end of it, we do want to give a great thanks to Anita for helping getting all of us together and setting up this panel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for a very insightful sharing. I, actually, I was one of the uh, candidates who went to Harvard. Yes, I please I can then take to the seat. And actually, one of the learning is that the role of teachers are actually changing from a content deliverer to a moderator and also to a facilitator. So actually, a lot of entrepreneurs should definitely be helping to teach, not only at university, but even at high school to share their experience. OK. Now, all right, so now it's it's been a pretty long day, and I'm pretty sure some of you guys are really tired. So how about I share a joke <laughs> as a refresher? <laughs> All right. So half of the people are going to feel like this is really funny, and half are not. OK. All right. So what is Beethoven's favorite fruit? Fruit. Fruit. Uh, apple? No, it's banana. -na. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's banana, -na, right? That's a banana. Yeah. Okay. All right. But jokes aside, though, and our yes. jokes aside, though, in our next session, we will be all discussing um, the development of change makers, and in such an increasingly interconnected and complex world. It is more important than ever for individuals to think globally and act locally, and for them to apply their talent and skill to make a positive impact on the world around them. Our panelists will share their experiences and insights on how education can empower students to become global change makers, from creating opportunities for cross-cultural exchange and community service to incorporating social and environmental responsibilities into the curriculum. 
So on stage, we actually have the moderator of this session, Dr. Susan Scafani. We have Mr. Hussai Ng, Mr. Samuel Tan, and also Ms. Don Tao as our panelist. Now may I pass the stage to the panel. Thank you. Take it away. Well, thank you. I think that uh, for those of you hardy souls who have stayed through the entire day, you're going to see, as I mentioned in a question earlier, that this is the session that kind of brings this all together in the sense that we've heard throughout the day how critical it is to start early, to enable young people to develop the knowledge and skills and habits of mind that are critical for their future and as entrepreneurs, as individuals in a changing world. And what we're going to talk about today is how do we start this early? I think that Nisa was pointing out to us in her comments that it's very hard to get teachers to change the way that they've been taught, to change the way that they've been encouraged to teach in order to enable young people to see the world differently than their teachers did when they were students. Mm -hmm. And so our panel today is going to talk about how we are able to start with our earliest children in school at ages two, three, four, and prepare them now to become the entrepreneurs, the problem solvers, the critical thinkers that we are going to need for the future. So I'm going to ask our panel, we'll start with Don, to just introduce yourself briefly. Yeah, hi, I'm, uh, hi, I'm Don. Uh, uh, I'm the CEO and founder of uh, ed Education Tech uh, Startup, uh, which is called Shine. Uh, I have Jose in my team, AI. Uh, he's AI lead. But um, I think we're going to introduce a bit about uh, where Shine is about, not just to sell, but to, to show you how businesses can pivot, right? and uh, be designed differently, you know, and not just about profit, you know, but it's about impact, yeah. Okay. Okay. Sir. Hi, I'm Samuel. I'm also from Singapore. Um, <clears throat> I started a movement um, called Leader Crafter, and it's not, it's not for preschoolers, it's for um, undergrads and fresh graduates. Basically, um, finding the intrinsic motivation um, and purpose which will propel them to become change makers. Uh, we have heard a lot about competencies, and, the, and what we discovered in Singapore is that these competencies are sharpened quite rigorously, um, but it takes something more intrinsic for us to use the skills towards doing positive change making. Um, and that is finding an intrinsic um, purpose from within, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. Okay. Yeah, and uh, as introduced, my name is Hosea. I'm actually the head of AI, working, with, working very closely with John in Shine Education Technology. Uh, where my role is more, I, I think today we've heard so much about AI and the affordance, new affordances of you know, technology, ChatGPT, how it's swept the world you know, in just the past few months. Um, I will be sharing a lot more also on um, the work that we have done and, and how technology can really be used to um, transform and reimagine how education um, is done in, in our world today. Yeah. All right, let's go. Okay, really, okay, let's go to the first um, again, I, I, I'm not here selling, but uh, the truth is that uh, we, I had some discussions also with Susan and Dr. Cheng, really to understand the climate of education, you know. And the truth is this, right? Okay, just, just to um, uh, admit something, right? I've never been in education. I was 20 years in banking. My last bank was J.P. Morgan, you know. And, and then I came over to education, and I then I found something, you know, that this is such a a pure-hearted industry, you know, wanting to transform. You know, where I used to come from, I wasn't like that, you know, but uh, what an amazing industry. But then, then I found out something that, hey, perhaps it's time to reimagine. You know, uh, it's a very, very good time, actually, especially after COVID. And so uh, this whole setup was, uh, came about really to uh, uh, really challenge some of the existing uh, quotients, right, and systems that has been existing and uh, just to let you know, we are based in Singapore. And you know, Singapore does have one of the top uh, quality uh, uh, education systems, right? Yeah. In, in Asia as well as the world, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I can go to the next slide. Yeah, just, yeah. Okay, 
uh, again, um, right in the middle, right, is something that we want, I, I do want to talk a bit about. Um, it's on evaluation and assessment. What we want to reimagine is that instead of looking at just uh, evaluating a child, right, purely by assessments, now we are actually pushing the limits and asking ourselves, right, whether we could unearth, right, uh, the, the um, making learning visible. Yeah, this is something that uh, is very prevalent in early childhood and preschool. And uh, what we want to do is actually, right, to give the children, right, an opportunity, right, to express themselves through different forms of interaction. And then, right, we, instead of saying, oh, you're not good in, in this and not good in that, right, what we want to do is to create a visualization, right, of how the child learns. So you see how we can put in technology as well as partnering with research, right, as, um, and education psychologists, uh, the preschool uh, uh, educators, right, all come together to do so. That, that is our goal. Um, I like it because, right, throughout the day, you have been talking about wanting to put things together. We have done that. And I tell you, uh, can anyone guess, has it been an easy task? You think so? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, that's where I think we want to go to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, this is also something quite revolutionary. If uh, when we embark on this installation, we will probably be the first, right, uh, to do so in Singapore. Um, what we want to do is to create an immersive classroom, right, for the children to learn. Yeah. Again, right. I want to hold back, right, from us looking at this whole thing so gimmicky. You know, there there is a heart to to everything, and and that's what we want to emphasize on. Yeah. Next. Yeah. And um. Yeah, I, I just want to, you know, kind of consolidate, right, that so interesting, right, we work with the preschools, which is at the start of education, and I also have a young team that is with me that is the, you know, the so-called end of the education spectrum. And I, I do want to share something here about uh, what we have learned from this tool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I found, we found it very fascinating. When we taught the children, remember, there was uh, uh, information, uh, you know, someone was telling us, oh, you know, you need to teach on sustainability, deforestation, guess what we did? We did to do that, and uh, uh, guess what happened? Uh, we brought them into the Bonio rainforest, right, as an example. Uh, but, you know, uh, the children of Singapore have no clue what is a rainforest. <laughs> we were shocked, you know. The closest they know, right, was a garden and a park. So I, I, I want to put it out here, you know, to, to all of us. Sometimes, right, we think, right, that we can just throw in all the data, throw in all the info, right? But then we realize that, hey, actually, right, the recipients and beneficiaries have no idea what, what we are talking about. And, and um, I think there were some things that we observed. And um, yeah, the next slide, please. Yeah. So remember, we talked about critical thinking here and creative thinking. What we found out when we rolled out to the ground was, the children wanted to ask questions, but they didn't know how. They didn't know what, were they inf what we were inferring to. They didn't even know what's a rainforest. And in the end, right, the questions dwindled into animals, you know, into plants and, and you know, into leaves and all that. And I, I just want to put it out here because, right, sometimes we think we have our ideology, hey, you know, we want to do this, you know. But the implementation does take time. The children need to break, uh, need time to break things down. And I, when I say this, right, for children, actually, I also mean uh, with the young uh, workforce that I work with. You know, um, some of these things are new information. For example, no one taught them in university how to build a mobile app. No one taught them about a metaverse. No one talked about immersive environments. And all these are new information. The question now would be, how do adults, right, or young adults, right, who come from universities, right, then learn new information? And, and I think I, I just want to pause here and pass this off to Susan. This was something that uh, we really discovered about the science of learning. Yeah. Well, I, I think that part of what we're talking about is the, what we were saying earlier and what Nisa was talking about with our teachers. Whether we, oh, I'm sorry. Whether we ought to just bypass our teachers or give them the experiences that they need in order to learn how to draw this out of the students that they teach. And to do that, you have to understand how children learn. And 
maybe they had one course in how children learn in their entire teacher education program. The rest of the time, they were learning information to share. But if the children do not understand the concept, if rainforest doesn't mean anything to them because they've never seen or heard about a rainforest, then there is no way to teach them that unless we start where the children are. And that's really what the science of learning is all about. H learning how children learn in order to be able to change the way we as adults think about what needs to happen in our classrooms to give the children the experiences that they need in order to develop their own understanding. And that's what we're talking about here. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I also do want to share that uh, I know we have many, many ideologies, right, and ideas, you know, and we are so uh, cognizant, you know, of the, the future of technology coming in. But guess what happened? When we went to the ground to roll this out, the biggest resistor were the teachers. Mm -hmm. Although, right, deeply, they knew, right, they could not run away from education or, or with technology, right? But when we confronted them in the kindest way, I mean, I brought cakes, you know, I brought cupcakes, and it wasn't enough. Do you know what was said to my face? They said, how could you bring technology? This is against education. I was like, whoa, wow. I agree, and um, I agree to a certain extent, but let's, let's listen more. And uh, I can tell you, one of the biggest, most interesting part of this whole implementation was really change management. I, 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 okay, I, I'm not walking away to condemn the teachers, I'm not. Because I understand that so many times, right, we all have our ideas of what a, a certain subject matter should be. You know, but when it is hit huge, right, large, right, by a disruption, we can't take it, you know. And uh, I can tell you now, I actually had heads of school tell me this, you know. You know, I am against technology, but I will embrace it in my field. Oh, I was like, wow. Okay, um, and I, I just want to say that if you teach teachers, right, or, or you, uh, you have teachers in your, your uh, you know, your force and all that, do, do prepare them, you know, for even for change management, yeah. If we start with the children's questions, rather than with our answers, we will enable them to start to learn. And that's what technology can do for our teachers. It can give them a new way of approaching what they've been trying to do in the past in, in a way that's not resonant with the children of today. Our children have grown up very differently than we did and the kinds of technologies that they take for granted. I mean, you see the two-year-olds, the, the one-year-olds with their parents' phone. They're already very comfortable with that technology. They're already ready to learn the next steps, but they want to learn what they want to learn. It can't just be our dictating to them that this is the information you need because that's what's in the curriculum. And that is the kind of change that is frightening to many educators because they don't have the hand held out to them yeah. to say, let's do this together. And that's what we're talking yeah. about here. Yeah, Susan, I, I think then, my, then our role shifted as a business, you know. No longer we, were we there, right, just to enforce a change. Cerebrally, we get it. You know, we know. I mean, we are embracing chat GBT and GBTs, you know, uh, right in our face. But when we look at the educators, you know what we had to do? We had to hold their hand. We had to let them cry. I mean, I have seen educators cry. But we need to go through that process, you see. And um, yeah, th in the end, that was what we end up doing. Yeah. No, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, um, um, I think we also want to show you, right, how we have uh, put together research technology, right, needing to come together. So re remember, it wasn't just forcing, right, uh, technology gimmicks. It wasn't doing about that. But really, we want to put research, you know, together with technology, with educators. And I just want to show you something that we have proposed in the change, right? This was an evaluation assessment done by teachers. And if, um, I, I just want you to see, right, how the teachers were writing. And you notice, right, 
all, most of them really write with what they can see. But uh, show the next slide. Yeah. But when we work with researchers uh, focusing on education psychology, right? Wow, actually there's so much insights that uh, can be presented. And that is actually what we want to look at reimagining education. No longer are we looking at results, what the child can do, but how the child learns. And um, our partnership with researchers is so wonderful because right, we, they, they don't just look at the correct answers, they also look at the answers that are incorrectly answered and then analyzed, you know, hey, did the child answer this because he, learned, he or she learns this way? And um, again, you, you notice, right, um, what, a, what, 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 what I'm trying to say is this, you know, um, in the beginning, right, we talked about oh, reimagining all that, but how does it look like on the ground? It takes steps, you see. It takes breaking down steps. And, and I just want to put it out there. Sometimes, right, we, we just want to uh, roll out a program, but actually, right, the beauty really comes from the detailing of the implementation and change. Yeah. Yeah, and um, um, these are some stats that we did. Um, um, I love it because um, this was done post-COVID. Um, we were measuring, right, a child's literacy. And we noticed, right, that actually COVID had a big impact. Yeah. Imagine, you know, the teachers are masked, right? The children are masked too. And when we talk about teaching literacy, right, we talk about pronunciation. Guess what? They can't see, you know, any part of the mouth movement. And the children have to rely on just hearing. And of course, you can't hear the, the, the most sharp. And in the end, right, when we did the measurements, we noticed that there were significant changes, um, you know, and, and drastic, um, you know, uh, decrease, right, of, of literacy um, uh, pronoun in, in, yeah, for both different communities. So, the other community we're looking at um, will be an ethnic group, right, that uh, is within our country. I just want to point this out because, right, guess what happened? When we went to the teachers and we rolled it out, right, um, most of the teachers said, no, it's okay, let the children have fun. Yeah. But when we went down to use technology really to uh, record and to make sure, right, uh, the students are actually, um, are they getting it? Are they, do they need aid, you know, to pronounce, right? Then we found out actually, hey, that this is something that is of alarm. And, um, and I, I think that's the beauty, right, of technology, of analysis, of research, of, of really being conscientious, right? Putting data forward and say, hey, maybe perhaps we, had, we need to do something. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Number two, right, uh, another very big change, right, to the teachers is they have never seen a dashboard before, you know, and uh, I think this was uh, really a big change. They're like, well, what is this, you know, how come, um, you know, we need to uh, look at this and um, uh, uh, put the children, right, in a certain rank. But again, right, I, I just want to highlight um, uh, as much as we can see the benefit uh, the teachers need to be guided, you know, and, and thought, right, about how they can use this tool and not turn it away and, and throw it off. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I, I think I, I just want to highlight this. Um, I think I heard it at, at some of the speakers. Um, the truth is this, right, what is really needed, right, for global change making really is about leadership. Um, it's also about leadership, right, to influence, right, at a global level. Uh, for businesses, right, like us, right, we could easily just do a digitization of work, you know. But then, right, the question is, if we put on our own selves, right, as a global uh, citizen, right, what can we do to impact the world? We can do a lot. And um, I will just put it out here and say that, you know, the businesses cannot do without uh, educators cannot do without universities. I mean, we partner with universities and we want to partner with more universities to do this, you know, and um, with technology, with AI experts, you know, because, right, this is the time no longer should solutions be seen sing singularly, but really in a very holistic manner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Susan, I can pass that to you now. Yeah. Can you go ahead? No, but we don't have yeah, no, the mic. Uh, Jose, you want to? Yeah. Okay. Hi, um, then I'll be going on to share more um, about the importance of innovation and uh, having change in this 
um, world that we're going into, we see so much, so many new technologies sprouting out, you know, back and forth, things like ChatGPT that sometimes even make us question, right, um, whether our, our, our world and our, you know, the, the, the status quo can even be remotely the same afterwards. And I think the same thing, um, the, the, the same impacts of this will, will, will also affect education. And in fact, it rightly should, right? Um, and I'll tell you why. I think I, in this conference, I've heard so much about people all across the world from different um, universities. Um, I've heard University of Columbia, different universities in, in US, in Hong Kong, in China. And, uh, I, I, and I really uh, felt I resonated with that because I myself, I, I know that I, um, you know, I, I gained a lot from having, um, you know, being able to learn and uh, have many different friends in different um, uh, nations all across the world, which impacted even my understanding of innovation. In fact, I think one thing that was so interesting, and later I'll show about some of the innovations that was happening in our company, but I think the interesting thing is um, just by my own mindset or, or, or the, the, the culture, the technical culture that was brought in, it may even have pushed me to think from the beginning that, hey, actually, you know what? A lot of these innovations were impossible, right? Um, but it was actually, I felt, the, the, the power, you know, I've, of, of friends that I had that had, you know, very good experiences in the tech communi uh, communities in, in the U.S., in Israel, who came out and said, hey, you know what? Actually, you know what you mentioned? It's more than possible, right? And in fact, you know what? I want to bring you to the people that, that know how to, um, you know, build a strategy, strategy not to, to build such a thing, right? Such technology that can really revolutionize and help uh, reimagine education. Yeah, so, um, um, and I think, um, bef before I even talk about this, I think that it, we're seeing it today also how there is a huge need for change in the education sphere. Because, you know, even if your university or your country, especially in Singapore, right, we have such a, a so-called right, high, high rates of literacy and, and education, uh, we still see so many gaps in, in, in uh, our nation. We still see so many gaps in the world, right? And if we are really global citizens who understand and internalize all these issues, we have to know that there has to be a, a big change to come in, in education, right? Um, I think what was very exciting to me as well, um, coming to this, um, um, this few years, you know, followed by new technologies. Hey, you know what? New technologies has um, afforded so much more to a person, right? Such that the potential of a person now has has been way multiplied, you know, and uh, exponentially increased in a in a big scale. I, I I when I read some of these examples, it astounded me. Like, um, for example, if I if even just take a simple example of. Um, um, you know, Brittany Wenger, which I put there at 17, developed an AI program diagno diagnosing breast cancer with over 99% accuracy. Wow, that's crazy, you know. I mean, for me, as an AI person, sometimes I think of this, hey, you know what, it's, it's just a matter of, you know, data collection, you know, putting some, some AI models together and training. Um, maybe it's not that hard, right? But, you know, just think about it, 20 years ago, being able, or maybe 50 years ago, being able to diagnose breast cancer Maybe what that really requires is, is a specialist that's been a craft for like, wow, m many years. And guess what? Someone, someone at the age of 17 has managed to do that. That's crazy. I think it just shows us how much this new wave of, of technology has expanded and multiplied, right, the, the potential of each person. And I think that's the impetus for all of us, right, in the education sphere to, to pursue, you know, um, that potential. What if, right, the, the work that we do can, can be so much more and how do we develop systems, education systems, curriculum that, 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 tr uh, that, that build the next generation up to be able to, you know, achieve these heights, right? Um, the, the, the other interesting thing, which I won't go so in detail, is that, you know, generative, we see how generative AI now, right, give so many businesses and individuals the power of an army, right? ChatGPT has, has done so much, you know, um, and, and um, being able to, to facilitate roles like analysis, data, you know, copywriting and everything that, that, so, so now, like someone that wants to, to develop their own business, right, you, you may not need so many um, years, right, learning all these different skills, but rather, it's more of how do you, how, how do we um, utilize, right, and ex um, leverage on these technologies to, 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 yeah, just, just facilitate all these roles. I think, that just shows how much education has to um, um, pivot, right, in this, in this new world. And it's so hard for an educator, 
it really is, right? How, how can they transform and learn and just keep expanding and expanding things that, you know, even CEOs and uh, um, uh, big organizations sometimes struggle to do, right? I think that's the, 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 the goal behind our work, right? It's really to bring accessibility to such knowledge, skill set, capabilities through technology, right? And our goal is really to empower um, every educator with uh, the world-class teaching assistant, right? Um, yeah. So, <coughs> and how that happens is first, right, um, I think in our work in, in, in preschool, wanting to understand the child, it's so much easier, right, to just let our children go through tests and say, you know, you're wrong here, you're, you're, you're correct here, you know, you just, you've got to figure out how to learn and, and maybe try different ways like videos, um, 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 audio, um, kind of things to, to, to teach them and try to motivate them, but actually, I think, I think where we, we are at is wanting to understand, hey, you know what, what if there are deeper ways to visualize and understand what's happening in the child's mind that's perhaps maybe blocking them, right, from understanding or, or even right, how do we unlock, right, this uh, potential that they have. Um, I, as you see here, these are some of the, the key um, um, pillars that we are working actively with researchers to, to, to uncover and, and truly understand. And I think the innovation, where the innovation comes through tech is, is how this can, can be scaled and, and uh, yeah, ac accessed by people all over the world. Um, the, the ones in red, uh, namely, are the ones that we are focusing the most on and are actively developing today. Yeah. But as you can see, there's so much more work to, 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 to happen to really understand the, the mind of the child, right? And these are just some examples of what we do, right? Working with institutions, research institutions in education psychology to understand and, and, and make this digital, right? So it's accessible by people. Um, yeah, and this, is, this one was very interesting because um, it's not just um, MCQs or very simple answers, but it's, it's on higher order learning. I think just now Don mentioned about our platform for higher order learning, creativity, critical thinking. This was one where we, we brought a child into the Borneo rainforest and we were trying to understand, hey, actually, uh, what if the, the, the learning of a child, right, is non-linear, right? Um, and it was so, and, and, and if it is, right, how do we um, properly assess that? How do we visualize that, understand that, and, and cater to the child based on that? I think this one was very interesting because we saw, through this work, we saw how there were even some children, when we brought up the idea of uh, um, the elephant trunk and the bionic arm, uh, they were immediately able to tell us, hey, I've seen that before from amputees in you know, World War II, videos like that. And uh, I've seen it before in uh, people who, who have the, you know, experienced the, the goodness of, of bionic arms, right, through, um, <coughs> um, um, you know, who have injured and everything. And we were surprised because, hey, you know what, that means that um, when we do education now, it, it can no longer just be linear. We, there's so much more potential, yeah, as I've mentioned before. Um, so... Um, yeah, now what we're really doing is utilizing AI. you uh, have heard so much about GPT, but also different things like encoder and decoder networks um, to develop more insights of the child. I think this is the interesting part because um, we are working very closely with research institutions to, to develop understanding on different domains, but we all know that children cannot just simply be s split up into different domains, right? They are whole. And I think, I think the difficult part and wisdom is, is how do we bring all these insights together and intuit and, and, and uh, synthesize the information to form curriculum, form um, learning journeys for the children. Um, I will skip some of this. Um, the final goal is this, right? When we really understand and have a, a solid understanding of the, the child, it's not to, to, to replace the teachers, right? But it's to be able to bring the world-class teaching assistants to the hands of every teacher, right? Uh, we've seen ChatGPT how, how this happened, how they, s how they were able to synthesize so much information, and that's what we're doing, right, wanting to do that. And um, I think that's what really brings the power of, of the, the divergent thinking, different cultures, different understanding, different domains together um, to form a solid curriculum for the, for the children. Yep. Yeah. And uh, finally, not just the teachers, but even parents. I think in our work, we really believe that the role of the, it's so hard on the teacher sometimes, right? It feels that um, if, if the child feels, is it, is it my fault, you know? But I think what we recognize that it takes a village to raise a child, and uh, we want to use this understanding to, to help parents as well. Hey, you know what? You can play your part. Uh, and, and it's more than just, you know, um, 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 the simple ways of maybe trying to motivate them. You can actually play uh, an active role in developing the child. 
Yeah, so... Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Susan, I mean, ju just to w um, round a bit, um, the truth is this, you know, everyone uh, has to play their part now. And it's so exciting. There is no one left behind. Yeah, you know, uh, when we look at uh, teachers and uh, they have spent 40 years, you know, and they look at this new technology and the first thing they, they think about, will this replace me? How could I be replaced by a flat screen, right? I'm like, no one's going to replace you, but you know what we're going to do? We're going to remove all the administration, uh, administrative work that's been bog bogging you down, you know, and then bring it, the magic of teaching back again. Yeah, um, I think I uh, always tell heads of school this, you know, that many times, right, because the world is moving so fast in the capitalism world, right, um, many parents are working. And the teacher, honestly, right, is the best next parent to be. And uh, I think we should embrace them. The role is, uh, is where it is originally designed, you see. Yeah, so um, I think we have been enjoying this journey so much. Uh, we have a lot of uh, resistance from the teachers, but we actually don't speak so much sometimes, and we just let them sink it in, and they realize, hey, you know, I need to embrace it. Mm -hmm. And we are like, guess what? Let's run together. And uh, we need you to come together. Yeah. And we're seeing this kind of assistant notion all the way through the university. So Chris Deedy, who is at Harvard, uh, has worked with uh, Project Zero and has worked to understand how he can create assistance for his class. So he no longer worries about scheduling his students for individual uh, contact and, and uh, opportunities to, to sit down one-on-one -on -one for discussion. The AI does that. He doesn't worry about how he's going to learn what each student has been doing and what they need to do next, because AI can help him do that. So the, the notion is that if we enable our educators to use the technology in new ways, to be able to individualize, and you know, even uh, you know, there's a program in, uh, in the United States that uh, provides uh, lessons for students online. And at first it was just, I thought it was very low level, but now they've incorporated AI so it can do the individual tutoring of a student. It can figure out where the student stopped understanding and start that way in a new route so that they can enable the student to understand what, what was that missing link and move forward with it. And we're seeing this in experimental programs throughout all of our countries, but mm. unless everybody learns that the, about these possibilities, unless our teachers start to see how this can help them with their goal of reaching every child. I mean, nobody goes into teaching because they want to stand up and lecture all day. Yep. They go into it because they want to teach individuals, they want to help young people learn. And if we can give them the tools and show them how they can use those tools in different ways than the way they were personally taught, mm -hmm. then we can enable them to make this kind of a difference. Yes. So you want to give you a chance to, to talk right. about your volunteer program. Yeah, sure. I mean, like, um, what Dawn shared about how teachers can be afraid of technology is actually not just teachers. You know, like, when I'm in undergraduate school, uh, I used to experience, like, s like, students would say, I entered marketing and not finance because I'm scared of numbers. And then all of a sudden, I'm being forced to, t to learn a machine learning course, and that can cause quite a bit of fear. Um, but I, and I, and I also realized that in Singapore, while we have a very robust um, like, um, education, teaching all the competencies that are relevant in our age, it's not necessarily well received. Why? Because a lot of students want to cruise through university. And I think the antidote to this is actually finding a transformative purpose. Because many, I mean, we can force feed students like, okay, you have to learn coding, you have to learn this and that. Then for a student, it's like, why am I going through so much difficulty? So the question then, it, I mean, they can cruise through, you can teach them all the right competencies, but they need, to, they need to find an intrinsic motivation, a mission that they want to pursue so that they will be um, driven to pursue these things on their own. I mean, I probably um, Jose also has pursued some of these learnings on his own because of um, the transformative work in Shine, you know. So, like, I mean, um, I, I run a movement um, that does mentoring, that um, helps people find their transformative purpose. And I discovered that so many of these students actually feel very lost. Even with a career advisor, it's not adequate. 
And I think that um, it's, it's mainly, th it's not just the career talks that um, students actually find um, help. They need more than that. Um, actually, ma for many students, what they want to know is that um, the, the people that are established in the industries have a purpose of their own, and then they adopt it for themselves. And then they discover um, what they have within. And I, I did some reflection as to why students might, um, you know, um, find it so hard to find this motivation. I think um, um, a lot of times in education, our, ed our classes and our levels are already planned, pre-planned for us. And it only, be only begins to diverge um, in university where, where we have so many options. And then there's the, the world is our oyster. But that also means that it comes with a lot of fear because there's a lot of unknowns. Um, I find that in preschool, we tend to celebrate a child's creativity, we tend to celebrate a child's individuality. But when a child enters primary school or um, um, middle school, high school, um, in Asian context, it tends to be a lot of divestiture, where it's a lot about responsibility to um, society, it's a lot about um, disciplines. And then we emphasize less on the child's individuality and intrinsic motivations. So when we enter university again, what happens is that students need to rediscover this part of themselves that will motivate them for the rest of life. And this is a missing component which I believe would augment the competencies that we desire to teach. So um, it's not just the career talks that help. The, in the, the industry experts need to share what is their innate passion. What drives them? What keeps them up at night? And why do they bother to keep up at night to, hit, to keep bashing at a problem that they're trying to solve? And that is something that I believe is, some, is needed to be augmented into our curriculums, into our own schools. And um, another paradigm shift that needs to happen, personally happened for me and quite a number of the mentees that I've observed and talked with, um, is that much of education focuses around facts and critique. Um, mathematics is facts, um, science is facts, um, geography is critique, history is critique, literature is critique, but we hardly talk about building. Um, it's often relegated to um, things like art, maybe some um, cooking classes, which are secondary in most cases, especially in, in societies that value STEM subjects. But when it comes to wanting to be a change maker, we're actually talking about building, a sep uh, building an alternative idea, building an alternative company, building an alternative movement that requires a different set of skills. The being a change maker requires possibilities thinking, while being a critique requires retro retrospective thinking, and it uses a different brain. So to be a builder, in a sense, you need to know us. You have a strong locus of control within. You have to rely a lot on gut feel when there's a lack of facts. I mean, in sciences, we rely a lot on facts. Um, they rely, rely, requires a lot of community building, sense making, interconnectedness across disciplines, which we call um, um, interdisciplinary. Yeah, I mean, these are the things that, I mean, while helping entrepreneurs as well, it's required to build the career, to build the life that we and the change that we desire to see. And that is something that I think uh, many young people come into my movement precisely to look for this. Yeah, um, well, because the facts is very rigor rigorously taught in school, but this is the heart um, substance that needs to be also augmented. Yeah, um, and something, I, I wrote this very audaciously, seeking to be the dumbest in the room. I think in, um, in my context, in my experience, I always had to appear the smartest in the room, to get the, the best grades, to offer the best class participation, to the point that it sometimes feels as though I have to prove myself, and I don't dare to look dumb. So um, in context, even like in this conference, I'm, okay, you're the youngest, but <laughs> I'm considered quite young, so I, I have to force myself to be the dumbest in the room, to be among mentors, to ask questions that would otherwise in, uh, in other contexts would make me feel like a fool, right? And it, it requires psychological safety, and sometimes classrooms are not the best cases because um, we receive the judgment of friends, of profs, you know? So um, that's where mentoring one-to-one -one helps. So in this, um, when, when I pair um, undergraduates with established industry leaders, I facilitate questions like, what is something you changed your mind about? When you observe me as a mentee, how do you think I, f what challenge do you think I'll face? You know, so these are the things that expose the vulnerabilities of the mentor and the mentee. And it creates opportunities to learn what is outside of career talks because it's often a PR talk. But whereas these kind of questions result in intimate discussions that reveal what a, a student really needs to learn, that is to build the hard substance. And I think that um, like, 
while, while we teach a lot of competencies and while they are needed, a child needs to learn why. Why is my, my why for even pursuing these this hard subjects, which can feel so odious and laborious, knowing that I have an end goal in mind, a problem in this world I want to solve, a mission that I want to accomplish, a change I want to make in this society. And if we can give students the space and the, um, and the, yeah, the runway as well as the, the tools to, to dig deep within, mm. then we have a better chance of students utilizing the competencies that we all endeavor to teach them. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So what we have heard are some examples of programs that they're trying through Shine Tech that enable teachers to learn different ways to approach their students, to learn about what their students know and don't know. It's what Professor Chang was talking about earlier, about slowing down the thinking, slowing down the problem solving so that people are able to figure out what, where they need to start so that they can consider all of the information and not just jump to a conclusion because they're used to giving the right answer. And instead, we're talking about how do we help teachers learn how to analyze the thinking of individual children? How do we use the technology as a tool to help them do that so that they can move forward? How do we help young people who are looking for what is their passion to meet with adults with that passion to ask them about how they developed it? How did they do it? What are they thinking about? What are the problems that they are trying to solve? So it, in a sense, that's why I said this kind of draws together what we've heard all day. And how do we rethink education for an AI world where giving children information is not sufficient? And it is not the way it, to prepare them for the future. So we talk in the United States some about unschooling. And in fact, many during the pandemic, many parents took their children out of school let them learn on their own. And you see young people pursuing, whether it's working with a veterinary scientist because that's what they think they want to do with their life, or it's creating a new program to solve a problem that they saw. And it's an opportunity to say the information is there. It's in our phones, it's in our computers. So we don't have to fill their heads with information. We have to fill their heads with ideas and how to solve problems. Those are the key skills for the future. And this is just an example of how to do that, whether we're talking about the youngest children or we're talking about uh, young adolescents who are looking for their passion. But identifying their passion is the key to their future. And to do that, we, we need to rethink what we're doing in our schools. And that's why I was saying earlier to the entrepreneurs that were up here, the scientists, you need to talk to our educators so that they understand that this different world requires different approaches to education and that they're there to help them see how to do that, to learn from what they're doing, to know how to change education and not just become defensive about, oh, you're telling me that I'm doing the wrong thing. That's not the point. The point is how do we help them learn new strategies in the same way that we're asking every other industry to rethink the way in which it's doing uh, its work because the technologies have given us whole new strategies, yeah. whole new avenues to pursue. Yeah, Susan, I, I just want to just echo you. Um, um, I know we have heard so much about the appeal of education being a, a, a economic enabler, and you know, but the truth is this, it's the young people. The young people, I must say, are quite edgy, you know, uh, they, they are not like the past, right, where jobs are meant to fill the bank account to pay the bills. Th this young group of people are looking for purpose, for vision, and I love it, you know. I wish I was in that generation in a way. I still am, you know, but I'm like, wow. And, and this is what's going to happen. If they do not find the purpose, right, and, and, and don't understand why they need to learn their competencies, guess what they will do? They will end up being in a gig economy. They will do your grab driving, your taxis. Why? Because they want freedom. They want, they know that life is not, not long, you know. And, and guess which, what uh, did the awakening? COVID. 
COVID did awakening. I have ex-bankers calling me, hey, Don, I want purpose in life. I think you have purpose in life. Can we be like you? And I, and I recognize, hey, everyone's awakening, you know. And I, I think it's a very exciting time. Um, so um, the young people do need help, you know. Uh, they are searching for a purpose and meaning of life. And when they don't, right, um, they enter into something called mental wellness. And actually, so many of us do that too. But, um, yeah, I, I think this is an exciting time, you know, for us to just journey to get together. No one is left behind. Mm -hmm. I think that's the fun part, yeah. And as we heard from the entrepreneurs in the previous panel, there is a whole world out there to solve problems in. If we enable and encourage our young people to develop the skills to be able to say, you know, I had a great difficulty trying to pay for my education when I'm in China and the school is in the United States. How do I solve that problem? Mm. And that's what we want. We want problem solvers. And to do that, we need to change our education systems. So thank you so much. It's been a long day, uh, but a very exciting one. And I hope you're all going out with as much passion about what you're doing here today. And tomorrow we're going to talk even more about education and K-12 education to say how can we make a difference for our young people. So thank you so much. Enjoy your evening. And <laughs> see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. I, I myself are... I'm also really inspired to be, well, a change maker when I'm older, to make Earth a more sustainable place. <laughs> All right, so this concludes day one of the Forum of World Education, and I hope you have a great day ahead of you, and some of you are staying for dinner, and you might bring s home some insights and ideas. Yes, so for tomorrow, we have a very important program, so please come back as we have OECD's latest research on global competency, the global competency gap debate, as well as STEAM education, which is re very relevant to the rapid development of AI, and also the journey from scholars to change makers. So uh, we look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. A few more um, housekeeping items. Yeah, so first of all, um, before you leave, if anyone has those F SI translators, uh, please put them back. And secondly, we found a scarf and some AirPods uh, lying here in this room. So if those are yours, please go to the reception to get them. Last but not least, um, please keep your badge because tomorrow we're not going to give you another one. So please bring it tomorrow and then we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.